My grandfather owned a cabin close to a lake, but essentially in the middle of nowhere. A bit of a walk to a town, and the cell reception was nearly non-existent. He took a bad fall and broke his hip near the start of the summer. The entire small town nearby heard about it. Everyone was aware he would be in the hospital for a while, and he didn't want the teenagers getting any ideas about breaking into his place or using his land as somewhere to party while he was gone. Somehow, I was the most trustworthy out of all his grandchildren. The cabin didn't have the best internet connection, but I still took up on his offer to house sit until he literally got back on his feet. I've never been the type for camping or any outdoor activities. The cabin nearly changed my mind on that. The air was clean and it was quiet. I never knew how much background noise I'd adjusted to while living in the city until it was gone. I spent the first day cleaning and taking a trip into town to keep my food stocked up. My grandfather seems to be falling behind with chores before he went to the hospital. It was clear he may need to live at an assisted living home soon. He would hate it, but I didn't want him to die alone in this cabin. Maybe I would stay here longer with him when he came back, if he would have me. I was between jobs and had spare time. By the end of the day, I was exhausted from washing every surface of the thick layers of dust. I even washed all the blankets, fearing what kind of insects decided to overtake them while my grandfather neglected the washing. Because I was so tired, I only barely woke up when I thought I heard something coming from the woods. Sounds of cars driving down the dirt road that led to hiking trails further into the woods. The road was near the cabin, but so few cars passed by it wasn't an issue. I chalked it up to phantom noises. I was used to hearing cars at night, so my brain filled in the blanks, and didn't even question the fact that night I heard more cars going down that road than I've gone down it in months. The next morning, I ate a small breakfast of toast and headed out for a short walk. A friend of mine was an artist of some sort. Before I left, he begged me to take as many photos of the woods as possible for reference photos he could use for an upcoming project. If I didn't get on it right away, I would forget. Yawning, I stayed within sight of the cabin not to get lost. When I came across the dirt road, I paused, staring at all the tracks in the dusty road. My mind went back to all those cars I heard that night. I looked up and down the road trying to think of any reason why so many cars would pass through. A lost person, maybe. I was about to dismiss them as old tracks, and my mind was playing tricks on me, when I saw an SUV somewhat hidden down the road. It was parked off to the side, a car that looked like those FBI SUVs I saw on TV. I couldn't help myself. I started walking towards the SUV, curious. Someone might have gotten a flat or ran out of gas. I wasn't snooping. I was helping. Getting closer, I started to feel off about the entire thing. The SUV was clean as a whistle. It looked so out of place being in the woods. I raised my camera to get a shot of it when I was a few feet away. The license plate had no hint of what state the SUV came from, only the numbers 202. This was totally weird. I snagged a quick photo, feeling a little bit guilty for some reason. This would make a great story when my grandfather came back. The idea came to me. If this was a government-issued vehicle or part of law enforcement, then maybe all those cars last night were cop cars. What if they were hot on the case of bodies scattered around the woods? I've listened to enough true crime podcasts to figure this sort of thing happened. This would make a very great story when my grandfather came back. I wanted to explore a little bit more, but I knew I would get lost if I went too far into the woods. Spotting a trail near where the SUV parked, I looked up and down the road, as if I was committing a crime. I followed the path, camera at the ready, in case I discovered something. I found out two things very quickly. I was not made for hiking, and the woods were creepy as hell. A sea of trees just expanded forward as sweat dripped down my face. I didn't even walk very far, but the trail was on an incline, so it made walking a bit difficult. I heard some birds chirping, but I could have sworn while I started on the path, I heard something else. A rustling 
almost clicking sound that I thought was leaves in the wind. I started towards the sound, trying to figure out what it was. It sounded just off enough for me to know it wasn't a natural forest sound. When the sweat started to sting my eyes too much, I stopped to catch my breath and take a break. And I realized I was lost. Looking down, I was no longer on a real trail, at just relatively clear ground one could mistake for a trail. In a panic, I looked around trying to see where I went wrong. The wind blew, cooling me off just a little, as the clicking sound got closer and closer, as if something that was making it was moving towards me. My heart was about to beat out of my chest when I felt something on my shoulder. I let out a shrill scream and jumped, only to be held down by a large hand on my shoulder. Heart still pounding and throat dry, I looked up at the person who grabbed me. I was staring directly at a pair of sunglasses. I slowly looked over at the new person trying to calm down. He was a head taller than me and wearing a suit. A suit in the forest. He looked like he'd belonged with that SUV I'd seen earlier. His expression was neutral, but I could tell he wasn't pleased by me being in the woods. I, uh, uh, I'm lost, I admitted, weakly. Without saying a word, he started to guide me, along with his hand still clasped on my shoulder. I was freaking out while trying to at least look calm. This guy reeked of a secret government agent. He had the sunglasses and just needed an earpiece radio to complete the setup. My guess about people looking for bodies in the woods might be right, but why would he be wearing a suit? Surely they were allowed to change their clothing while on different tasks out in the field. I suddenly got the case of the giggles because of the stress, and also because my last name was Anderson. I was being forced along by my very own Agent Smith. Sorry, I just... I, I was thinking about the Matrix, uh, the Mr. Anderson line. If your name was Smith and you said that to me, it would be perfect, uh, because it's my last name. I was nervous, rambling, saying the first thing that came to my mind. But you're not Smith. You must be Agent 202. Hearing that, he froze. His grip tightened almost to the point it hurt. I had never been so scared in my life before. Lost in the woods with a strange agents that could do anything to me, and no one would ever find out. I looked up at him, his emotionless face now creased in stress and eyes hidden behind his glasses. How did you know my name? He asked, and I was taken aback by how calm and soft his voice was. I was expecting some gruff military type. Your car, I sputtered not being able to finish my thought. It was really just a guess his code name would match what the SUV was labeled. His face eased up, and I felt his grip on my shoulder relax. In fact, he almost looked embarrassed. Stay out of the woods for a few days. He warned, trying his best to sound stern. We didn't talk the rest of the way back. When he got back on the path, he still kept a hand on my shoulder, as if I was a child ready to bolt at any second. He might just want to be very sure I was not going to get lost again. When we got out of the woods and on the road, he finally released me from his grip. My heart was pounding the entire time. I felt a mixture of fear and embarrassment, even though I'd done nothing wrong. I was about to make a run for it, when he held out his hand. It took me a few moments to figure out what he wanted. I looked down at my very camera and back towards him, bringing it closer towards myself for protection. I didn't want to give it to him. I just want to delete the photos of the SUV you took, he told me, hands still out. How do you know I took one? Were you watching me the entire time? I asked, eyeing him. No, you just admitted it. Please let me delete the photo, and you can have your camera back. Reluctantly, I relented. It was mostly because he asked so nicely. And I also didn't want to be arrested and tossed into some prison without a trial for messing in government affairs. True to his word, he flipped through the photos and deleted the one of his SUV. 
Oddly enough, he deleted one more of the trees I took before I realized I was lost. My fingers slept, he said. When he noticed me watching, he was deleting one extra photo. It was a clear lie, and I didn't have the guts to call him out. So, what's going on? Tracking down some bodies? Looking for a killer? Aliens? I asked, carefully. He did not look like he enjoyed my sense of humor. Aliens. He said it in such a straightforward tone, I almost believed him. I finally smiled, feeling the stress of getting lost and bumping into him slightly. Turning away from me, he started back towards his parked SUV and gave me a small wave without looking back. Stay out of the woods for a few days, he warned again. I watched as he got into his car, then left me on the dirt road full of questions. My mind buzzing, I went back to the cabin to see I was only lost for a few hours and it wasn't even noon yet. Sitting down, I found it impossible to focus on anything but trying to solve the mystery of what was going on. The internet at the cabin was slower than molasses, so I went into town to use the library computer and maybe grill the locals if they notice anything strange lately. I spent most of the afternoon looking things up to find no local legends or strange events. I dropped by the diners for supper, and not a soul had seen any black SUVs around or any men in black prowling in the woods. Aside from finding out the diners served the world's best meatloaf, my day turned up nothing. I might have let the entire thing drop if something didn't get inside the cabin that night. I was exhausted for the second night in a row. Fear does that to you. I still felt a little bit jittery, but passed out into a deep sleep shortly after settling in. In the dead of night, I felt myself coming out of a dream confused on what woke me up. I sat up, still half asleep trying to focus. It was pitch black, and I fumbled around for the lamp beside the bed. Listening, I thought I heard some noise coming from the downstairs. It was hard to hear over the beating of my own thumping heart. Grabbing the flashlight from the dresser beside the bed, I gathered up my courage to go down and check it out. I prayed it was just a raccoon that somehow got inside to get to the Twinkies I bought earlier. More clattering coming from the kitchen made me freeze up. I clutched the flashlight against my chest as if it could protect me. Creeping down the stairs, I was aware of the noise my own clothing was making and every creak of the wood. It felt like it took me hours to finally get to the bottom of the steps. Tiptoeing, I kept going towards the kitchen. There was no door, and I kept the flashlight down as to not alert whatever was inside the kitchen. Pots and pans came clattering down, and it nearly made me run for it. It sounded much bigger than a hungry raccoon. My hands were shaking as I raised the light, trying to see what was rooting around in the cupboards. Raising the flashlight, I pointed it into the dark room, not seeing anything at first. A flurry of motion came from the top cupboard. A dark shape came crashing down, knocking over chairs and tipping the table. I couldn't match the silhouette of any animal I was aware of. Scratches were left behind in the hardwood floor, and the creature rushed out, nearly knocking out the back door from its frame. I was not going to chase after it. I almost wet myself. After all, I was a city person. Wild animals breaking into my place in the middle of the night was not what I normally dealt with. Not knowing what to do, I called the cops, begging them to come over and look over the damage. Two officers came by over an hour later. I turned on all the lights, but didn't dare go into the kitchen. They both looked a bit annoyed having to come over in the dead of night, but I could also tell the trip was slightly better than a boring night shift. They humored me by looking over my invaded kitchen area. Can you describe this animal? One of the officers asked while carefully stepping over a fallen pan. It was really dark, I said, being very unhelpful. Big, small, flying around? Uh, Big-ish? Uh, like a, bigger than a house cat? I don't know about anything that would make marks like that. 
We all looked at the deep scratch marks left in the hardwood flooring and countertops. Long four gouges scarred the wood, along with some long single cuts into the wood. I looked over my food, and the only thing I was missing was a box of table salt. I wasn't aware the cabin already had an open box of salt before I bought some more. The open box was knocked over, spilling over the countertop. The stolen box was punctured by whatever took it and left a trail of salt behind. Aside from minor damage, it didn't look all that serious. I almost felt embarrassed calling them. Almost. How do you think it got inside? I asked, looking at the still open back door. Raccoons have hands, the younger cop commented. We all stood in silence for a while, until all three of us burst out laughing. The mental image of a raccoon breaking in and opening the back door was just too much for us. At least the cops weren't angry with the city guy calling them down in the middle of the night for nothing. You must have just forgotten to lock your back door. These raccoons are smart out here. You should be thankful you don't need a rabies shot right now. I agreed with him. We continued the back door the best we could for the moment. One of them gave me a number of their brothers who could swing by and repair my door the next afternoon. We all decided a raccoon was the culprit, but none of us wanted to talk about how a raccoon could do so much damage to the door. I thanked them again for the help and sent them on their way. But I still didn't turn the lights off to sleep that night. I was pretty worn out from the exciting night. I took a nap before I called for the back door to be repaired. It didn't take very long, considering. The repairman let me pay him in two six-packs, which was very fair. With my only chore of the day accomplished, I could not help myself. I followed the tracks of whatever animal left behind in the night to the tree line. I debated on what to do. I would easily get lost if I kept following the tracks inside the woods. The warning the agent gave still rang through my mind. A thought came to me. Maybe he was still around. Yes, I did want to believe that a raccoon broke in to steal my salt, but on the off chance it wasn't the raccoon, I wanted to see if he would spill the beans on what exactly was going on in these woods. I didn't have any way of finding him, though. Making up my mind, I figured just walking down the road wouldn't do any harm. I might be lucky and spot his SUV parked somewhere again, and I couldn't get lost on a road going one way. By pure chance, my crazy plan worked. I started walking down the dirt road, the summer sun nearly roasting me alive. Aside from that, the walk wasn't too bad. I could hear the splashing of families playing in the lake hidden by the trees. Birds chirped away, and when the wind blew, it cooled me down enough to keep walking. I was about to turn around and head back when I heard a car start coming up the road. Turning my head, I saw a large SUV in the distance. I started to feel excited. Something was going on, and I might be able to get some answers. Three SUVs drove past me, each stopping half a mile from my position. I picked up my pace to walk over and see what was going on. Black figures came out from the cars and into the woods. By the time I reached the parked cars, everyone was so far gone on the trail, I no longer could see them. No one remained by the cars, and I didn't get a good look at who even just walked into the woods, let alone how many of them there were. At least, I thought, no one stayed behind. Coming down the trail was the agents that guided me out of the woods. He saw me, and it was hard to decipher his expression behind his sunglasses and at a distance. I raised my hands to give him a wave. He also raised his hands to make a shooting motion towards me. As he walked closer, he scowled at me. I- I'm just taking a walk. I'm staying out of the woods. I told him in a bit too much of a smart-ass tone than I should. Don't press your luck. He hissed the moment he was close enough for me to hear him. Ignoring me, he walked over to one of the SUVs and opened the back door. He lifted a solid black box made from some sort of metal out. His hands full, I did him a favor and closed the door for him. He glared down, eyes hidden. Can I help you carry anything? I offered, not thinking he would take me up on it. 
If you can lift this, I'll let you carry it to the meeting area. Setting the box down, he waited. Rolling up my imaginary sleeves, I bent over, confident in my noodle arms. I couldn't even budget or even get any kind of grip on the damn thing. My struggle was in vain. The agent put me out of my mercy and picked up the heavy box from the ground with ease. I felt as if he was teasing me. I felt like being able to tease someone was something he rarely was able to do, so I let it go. I was just warming up, I said, sweat dripping from my face. He stared at me silently, most likely thinking how I survived being as dumb as I was. Stay out of the woods. It's for your own good. Repeating his warning again, he turned to leave me behind, as I completely forgot to ask about my little break-in. I could tell he wasn't going to tell me anything even if I did. I felt like it was because he arrived with people. If he was alone, he might be more forgiving with his hints. Something was going on, and I still didn't know a damn thing. I swore the moment I cooled off, I was going to go down that trail and see what they were up to. So far, it didn't look like they were hurting anyone, but I just couldn't deal with not knowing. Walking back to the cabin wore me out so much I nearly collapsed. The summer heat was no joke. I took a quick, cool shower to try and not get a heat stroke, and by accident slept away the afternoon. How on earth did anyone wear a suit in this weather? When I woke up, I sat up, confused at what time it was. Orange light was streaming in. I drew back the curtains to look outside of the trees swaying in the wind. The cabin life wasn't all that bad, aside from strange animals breaking into my place. It was far too late in the day to walk down to the path and investigate. Instead, I did something I've wanted to do since I arrived. I grabbed some beers and walked down the trail to the lake. If I could find the fishing poles, maybe I would spend a few days just drinking and fishing. But only after I figured out the mystery of who Agent 202 was and what organization he worked for. When I came to the end of the short trail heading down to the lake, I stood, staring in shock at the strange coincidence before me. This man really was everywhere in these woods. He was ankles deep on the lake, his shiny shoes on the shore. Suit pant legs rolled up, trying to keep them dry, but failing. He was filling up two watering cans with lake water. Because he was bent over, he didn't see me walk up. When he did, he raised his head. It looked like he rolled his eyes behind his sunglasses. Don't look at me like that. I'm staying at my grandfather's cabin. You're the one invading my lakefront. He started towards me, his black hair slightly disheveled from his work. It was the only spot I could pull up the truck. Looking over, I spotted a brand new truck pulled up as close to the dock as possible without getting stuck on the downward slope towards the lake shore. In the truck bed was a half-filled water tank. Was he trying to fill that huge tank with just those two little watering cans? As if reading my mind, he walked past, carrying his full pails towards the truck. The pump is broken, and we ran out of water. I am not needed until later tonight, so this is busy work, he explained. I had nothing else to do. I shoved the beers halfway into the sand and silently stood in front of him, my hand out to take a pail. He gave me a raised eyebrow, but still handed me one so I could help. I kicked off my sandals. We silently figured out a system of me refilling the pails by the time he came back from dumping one into an opening on the tank. We worked until the sun set, but there was still enough light left to see by. My back is killing me. Let's take a break. I'd barely done any work, but I still felt like I earned my beer. Getting out of the ankle-deep water, I sat down regretting walking through the sand with wet feet. I'll never get the sand off. The beer was still a bit cool. I offered it to the agent still working away, filling the pails. He looked at me, then at the lake, considering my offer. 
When I shook the beer, trying to entice him, he finally gave in and walked over. Sitting down next to me, it appeared he didn't care in the slightest if his suit got covered in sand. He grimaced at the first swig of his drink as if he didn't drink often. We didn't speak for a while, just stared out on the peaceful water and the woods beyond it. He took off his sunglasses because it was now too dark to see with them. I cast a quick glance over at his face, trying not to be suspicious. I hadn't seen his full face yet. He caught my eyes with his, catching me staring. His eyes were blue. Not a normal blue I've seen before. No. They looked like the eyes of a dead man. I quickly looked away, suddenly frightened of him. I considered his eyes may look so dull because he had some sort of condition that affected his sight, although he didn't seem to have any issue getting around. If he did, I felt a little ashamed of my reaction. What's your name? He asked me, dragging me from my thoughts. We never introduced ourselves when we first met. Uh, Adam, I replied. I thought I saw a shadow of a smile on his face. Adam Anderson. Uh, my parents named me after my grandfather. Uh, they're not very original. Do you have a name? It was meant as an innocent question anyone should be able to answer. He did not look over at me. Staring forward with his dead eyes on the lake, he took a sip of his beer, considering the question. The hesitation made me nervous. It meant he might really not have a name besides Agent 202. That was some really deep government-level stuff. Being raised without a name to only do one job. A feeling started to creep up my spine, as if I shouldn't know the very small amount of information I already did. From across the lake, lights started to flash in the woods. Bright ones as if someone was testing out spotlights somewhere from inside the trees. Is something bad going to happen? I asked, quietly. No. Sacrifices are going to be made to keep the peace. I felt sweat starting to form at the base of my neck. That one statement carried so much weight. I knew if I asked him to stay any more, he would refuse. I already knew far too much. A crackling static sound made him move his intense gaze from me and towards the truck. He walked over to it, and I forced myself to calm down a little. Reaching inside the open window, he pulled out a radio receiver to answer the call. I eavesdropped, not knowing what was best for me. 202 here. A language I didn't know came through the static. The agent could understand what was being said, and scowled. Damn it. Of course he arrived early. Hans is such an ass. Alright, I'll be there. Keep him busy. With a small growl, he placed the radio back inside the truck, and went around to get inside. I stood up, collecting his half-finished beer along with my own. I had enough state of mind not to litter the lakefront. Adam. Hearing him say my name was a little strange. Leaning towards the truck, I gave him my attention. I keep saying this, but stay out of the woods. His odd eyes bore into mine until I could no longer hold his gaze. I looked away, but nodded, showing I understood. I just wished I knew what was going on. That's all. It's human nature to be curious, but what is happening is not meant for you to know. So please. He didn't need to repeat himself. Whatever was happening was well beyond me. He was looking out for me by making sure I was going to stay away from the truth. And I fully planned on letting it drop. As far as I could tell at that moment, there was nothing I could do. I watched as he pulled the truck out and away down the road, feeling a little bitter. I might not ever fully know what he was warning me away from. Looking over, I saw more lights flickering in the woods and sounds of music drifting along the lake. 
bugs were making my exposed skin into a meal, so I headed back to the cabin, head swimming with questions. The next day, I found myself bored and pacing in the cabin. I'd seen more cars traveling down the dirt road and through the trees the entire morning. I was going stir-crazy. Unless I'd left, I would go charging into those woods trying to see what was going on. I went into town instead, unsure of how long I was going to be around for. I decided on signing up for a library cart. Taking out books and movies should keep away my boredom long enough to keep me out of trouble. I went through the process and was looking through their meager movie selection when I heard a voice call my name. Adam? Is that you? I turned towards the voice to see a man around my grandfather's age. He looked confused for a moment before his face cleared. You must be his grandson. Christ, you look just like him when he was your age. I thought I was losing my marbles. I smiled at him, realizing he was a friend of my grandfather's. I abandoned the movie search and went over to him to introduce myself, even though it wasn't needed. I'd always known I was named after my grandfather, but I'd never once heard someone call him Adam before. He went by his middle name of John, and that was what I knew him by. We shook hands, and I followed the man to a sitting area. My grandfather broke his hip, so I'm cabin-sitting. I get pretty bored up there, I explained. It does get boring there. Not much happening in this town at all. I suppose that's why some people like living here so much. Well, I started debating on if I wanted to bring up the topic of the strangers in the woods. I've been seeing men in suits around. Is there like a FBI training camp around or something? A dark emotion flickered over the older man's face. I started to think I might have stepped on a landmine. He shook his head, trying to clear his thoughts and decide on his words. You and your grandfather are a lot alike. Years ago, he talked about the same thing. Men in the woods around his cabin. And? I leaned forward, heart beating, waiting for the man to finish. I was excited I might get some answers and wondered why my grandfather never mentioned any of this before. He did the smart thing. He settled down with your grandmother and stopped looking into it. I couldn't help but let out a long sigh and lean back in the oversized plush armchair. I was disappointed and the older man chuckled at me. There was another reason why he stopped talking about it and carried on with your grandmother. Madam, your grandfather was the uptight suit-wearing kind of man. He came here from somewhere, and the town thought he showed up looking for something. Mostly, everyone thought he was a government man doing a land survey or something along those lines. What made him settle down here if he was an office type and not an outdoor kind of guy? Was it love at first sight when he saw my grandmother? I mused. Love at first sight? Maybe, but not with your grandmother. He kept questioning the locals about men in suits appearing in the woods. He chased the leads around, and we first thought he was a bit off his rocker until a stranger came into town a few times. He wore a suit, but the odd thing was, he bought all the live fishing bait and a massive amount of meals to go at the diner. We all assumed Adam, your grandfather, was chasing after answers. But after a set of campers caught him and a man wearing the suit in a uh, compromising position in the woods, we started to think otherwise. The man gave me a look over his glasses, and I knew what he was implying. I felt my face flush a little, and I knew why my grandfather didn't want to talk about the men in the woods. My family most likely didn't know anything about this. It almost felt like I was invading my grandfather's privacy in some way. If he was... I... Uh, like that, why would he get with my grandmother? He married her because he also loved her. Anyone could see that. I'm sure he was happy with her. However, his eyes still look towards the woods in such a longing sort of way, it always hurts to see. I'm scared you're gonna go down the same path. Ignore whatever's going on in the woods. 
It nearly ruined your grandfather, and the few locals that are aware of it pretends not to be. You'll promise me you'll stay out of it, right? I've seen one of those men wearing suits, but only once. Anyone with eyes like that isn't natural. He stopped speaking, drifting off deep in thought about a distant memory that still haunted him. I nodded once again, being warned off for my own good. All those warnings might keep me from going inside the woods, but I still wanted to go around asking questions. Now, hearing that the locals tend to pretend as if nothing was going on, I doubted I would get any answers. Still, it might be worth a shot to start sleuthing a little. What else did I have to do all day? My grandfather's friends didn't look convinced that I would behave. He did his duty and couldn't do much more if I decided to keep meddling. I kept telling myself I would drop the matter, then little bits of information came up, luring me back in. We spoke for a little bit longer before he needed to excuse himself and be on his way. I picked out some books I deep down knew I wasn't going to read. I tried speaking to the librarian while I was checking out the books about any strange events, but she couldn't think of any. She was kind enough to direct me towards the grocery store, saying they deal with all the residents in the small town and may know more than her. I really should have dropped the entire thing, but I now knew men in suits have been around since my grandfather's time. How often did they appear? Only once since then. Was this every other year's event? I should have called my grandfather, but he was still in the hospital. I didn't want to disturb his rest any more than I needed to. And I doubted he would tell me anything when I did call. He may be ashamed of what he got up to before he met my grandmother. If I couldn't figure out anything from the locals, I might go and see him as a last resort. The gas station and the grocery store were so close together they may as well be in the same building. When I went inside, I grabbed something little to snack on. The cashiers weren't busy at all. While walking past the meat section, I saw it was nearly empty. That wasn't too strange in itself. They might just have their delivery truck running behind. The teenage girl working at the cash register was close enough to the meat section to watch me look over the empty shelves, confused. Are you new to the area? She called out to me, startling me. I nodded and walked up to her. What gave it away? Around this time of year, we have issues with meat and egg delivery. Because the locals know it, they buy what they need beforehand. What we have normally gets bought up for, like, this barbecue happening somewhere in the camping areas. She already rang up my single item, and I paused with my card in my hand about to pay. A uh, barbecue? What do you mean? I asked, feeling as if I was getting somewhere. Well, what else could it be? It's gotta be like a company retreat or something. Business guys show up and buy all our meat and stuff. It takes like two weeks to get stocked back up after. Business guys? Like men in suits? I said carefully. She nodded, but didn't seem too interested in her answer. I paid, and she handed me my item. Not wanting to waste a bag, I just took it from her. Gotta be a big company to buy so much food for people. Weirdly enough, like, this has happened since I was young, but I've never even seen where they go. The camping sites aren't taken over, and there aren't any traces of a party. Maybe our prices are cheaper, so they buy stuff here and go somewhere else. She offered. I nodded. Her theory was sound. If I hadn't seen the strange things the past two days, I might have agreed with her. On my way out, I noticed a box set up for people to donate food items. I placed my box of oatmeal bars inside of it on my way out. I got some information from the trip so it was worth it. Next, I headed over to the bait shop. If I ever wanted to go fishing, I would need some new baits after I found where my grandfather hid away the poles. Everything was within walking distance on the main street. I didn't see many people out as I walked down the street. So far, the locals either didn't notice the strange men about, or didn't see them as anything threatening. I considered I was taking all of this out of context, and everything that was going on might have an innocent explanation. Hell, Agent 202 could be messing with me for all I knew. I was the one thinking what was going on was weird. 
he could be making it all appear more sinister just for fun, or to keep me off track of the real answers. Inside the bait shop was empty, aside from an older man sitting behind the counter reading a magazine. He did a double take when I walked in. Setting aside his magazine, he looked as if he wanted to speak with me. Is your last name Anderson? He asked me. Uh, yes, I'm John's grandson, I told him while stopping in front of the counter. He looked a bit younger than my grandfather, but he might still know him. He looked me over again, a small smile forming on his face when he recognized my features. You look like him. He was a bit older when we first met, but I would guess he looked like he did when he was your age. How's he doing? I looked at his name tag to see the man's name was Derry. I scanned my memories to see if my grandfather mentioned him before, then again, we never spoke much before, and when we did, he likes to listen more than speak. His hip's broken, but as far as I know, he's doing all right. I've been meaning to call him. I might when I get back to the house. As I spoke, I looked around the shop. A small fridge was empty of live bait near the counter. It was just as my other grandfather's friends mentioned. For some reason, the men in suits came around and bought out bait, meat, and meals without the locals finding it strange. I, something got inside my place the other night. I'm a city guy, so I'm not sure what it could have been. Do you know about any critters that could open doors? I wasn't sure what kind of questions I should ask, and this felt like a normal enough thing to inquire about. Um, raccoons, most likely. If it was anything else, you would know. Bears tend to be noticeable, and you wouldn't normally walk away from one barging inside your place. Your grandpa always had issues with animals getting inside. He was never angry about it. He just replaced doors pretty often. So this was a reoccurring event, and my grandfather never told me about it. Did he just hope that I wouldn't find out about these strange events until he got back? He would have told me something if he wanted me to look into it or he could think I was smart enough not to poke my nose around like I currently was. Did you come in for bait? I'm out of the fresh bait, but I could recommend some packaged ones. I snapped out of my train of thoughts and nodded. I let him guide me to the bait section and told me all sorts of information about different ones and what they were best for. It was all lost on me, but it seemed like he enjoyed talking to someone, so I listened. I picked out a package he recommended. When I did start fishing, I would have to come back here for lessons. How does one run out of live bait? I asked while paying. Around this time every year, we figure there's a big business getaway. And some guys in suits come in and buy up everything we got. It must be a big company that needs so much. And it has to be one that's been in the family for years. I paused and watched his expression. The last statement was innocent enough, but the reasoning for it made Derry look a little embarrassed over thinking about it. I waited for him to keep going. When he noticed, he looked away. I lived my entire life here. I was younger when your grandfather showed up, but I remember something happening back then. A boy got lost in the woods, and he was never found. Thing was, one of the business guys doing the retreat helped us look. You see, the other day, the weird thing was I could have sworn I saw the same guy. He hadn't aged a day. Must be a grandson. I mean, you look like your grandfather, so whatever company's buying the bait every year must be a big one to afford it, and pass it down to their kids for the same-looking guy to show up. I smiled at him, hoping I didn't look tense. This was well worth the cost of the bait I just bought. I didn't know what I was going to do with this new information, but it was another piece to the puzzle I was slowly putting together. I think you're totally right on that, I said, trying to act normal. I heard a car driving slowly down the street, and I thought it was a black one. I got distracted and wanted to chase after it, but didn't want to be rude to Derry. When John comes back, tell him we need to go fishing again. I still owe him for what he did for me, after all. Derry was smiling, and I looked back at him. Black car, forgotten. What did he help you out with? He didn't tell you? 
he asked, looking a bit shocked. When I shook my head, he kept talking. I have a son, a bit older than yourself. He's never dated and rumors started to spread. It's a small town and some people have backwards ideas. When some local guy found out he was dating a man, they jumped him and nearly put him in the hospital. They went to the bar after bragging about it. I didn't even know what happened, but somehow John found out. He walked right into the bar, rifle in hand. Without saying a word, he shot the ringleader in the foot and just beat the shit out of the other three. I stood, speechless. I'd never heard anything about that. Aside from strange events in the woods, my grandfather kept a lot more secrets. With a town this small, I didn't understand how this wasn't the first thing I heard about when I introduced myself. How was he not arrested? I asked, dumbfounded. Because my son was dating the sheriff. I felt a smile come to my face. Sometimes small town cops looking the other way worked out for the better. Those guys should be thankful it was good old Grandpa John kicking their asses and not the sheriff taking revenge for what happened. He did have his guns taken away, so I doubt you have any still in the cabin, Derry explained. I hadn't checked the cabin for guns yet. That was a little embarrassing considering something already broke into the place. I was raised without them in my life and even forgot in some places they were common. I honestly didn't even think about looking for some, but I'm glad to know that it would be a wasted effort to try and find them if I did. How's your son doing now? Oh, he's fine. He recovered, but the guys who beat him up all have lumps that haven't healed yet. Him and the sheriff got married shortly after it happened because everyone already found out about him. Two years and they're going strong. Two years. So this happened recently. Considering how old my grandfather was, it was impressive that he could still take out full-grown men at his age. I would really need to call him later and ask him about this. We spoke a little bit more before I promised to drop by again when I found the fishing poles. I gave Derry a wave out and started back down the main road, my stomach rumbling. Since I enjoyed the meal at the diner the last time, I thought having dinner there would be a good idea. Dark storm clouds were rolling in, threatening a storm. I might get caught up in it, depending on how long my meal was. I found a seat and ordered the meatloaf again. You're lucky we just made a fresh batch. A guy in a suit ordered nearly everything we had to be taken out and delivered somewhere. Gabby, my waitress, commented as she collected my menu. Where is it all going? I asked, hoping for any more scraps of information I could get. Huh. N not sure. He picked it up and loaded it all into his big car. Strange enough, he ordered fried eggs on almost everything. I guess it would work with meatloaf or some rice dishes, but on sandwiches? It was weird. I nodded. At least I knew the agents liked fried eggs. The massive amount of food and cars going into the woods felt like a gathering of people was happening. But who and what did they arrive for? It was not a business retreat, that was for sure. You know, that didn't sound too bad. Would it be too much trouble adding a fried egg on the side of my meatloaf? Gabby gave me a look, but nodded her head with a small smile. It might be gross in the end, but I did like meatloaf and eggs, so it might be gross in the end, but I did like meatloaf and eggs, so it might not turn out too bad. And it wasn't. In fact, I enjoyed it. I might just try tossing an egg on top of everything within reason. Getting up after my meal, I went to the fronts to pay. As Gabby was giving me my change, I heard a rumbling outside. The sky had gotten darker. Rain could come down at any minute. I wondered if I should make a run for it, or maybe wait it out there for a bit. Just then, the sheriff came in. I'd never met him, but I could tell who he was based on his uniform. I, uh, Gabby, has Sally Ann come by recently? He asked, his voice sounding somewhat strained. I come to think about it, she hasn't. She normally comes by to collect our bottles. What's up? 
Gabby started to look a little worried. I got out of their way, but still listened in. I, her mother hadn't seen her for a few hours. She's a little worried, and I've been checking around. So far, we haven't found anything. She's missing? Gabby said, suddenly, pale and nervous. I, no, I wouldn't go that far just yet. Maybe she just took a nap somewhere, or just forgot to tell her mother where she was going. You know how she can be. But if she doesn't turn up soon, I'll get a group together to start looking. I felt stress start to build up in my gut. The agent's words came back to my mind about how sacrifices need to be made. If I brought that up now, I might be labeled as a nut. Aside from them being in town to buy baits and food, no one had seen the agents in the woods. Not only that, but a boy went missing before my grandfather first arrived. This all didn't feel like a coincidence. I debated on what to do. After all, I had no proof that they were responsible for the missing girl. She may have just wandered off and forgot to call home. A dark feeling was creeping in my thoughts, and I was unable to believe she was somewhere safe. Rain started to come down outside as more thunder rumbled. We all looked out the window, worried about the missing girl, praying she was just somewhere safe. I offered my services to the sheriff if he needed someone to go looking for him. He thanked me, telling me he would keep that in mind, and hurried off to the next spot to check. The rain was starting to come down. Not hard, but I was soaked by the time I got back to the cabin. I got changed into dry clothing. My stomach is twisting from the stress. Looking outside, I saw the sky was getting darker by the second. I worried about the missing girl. If she was out there... She would be in a bad spot when the rain came down. And what if those agents did take her for something? 202 didn't seem like the type, but I couldn't vouch for the others. I wanted to talk to my grandfather about everything I learned. Since he was staying so far away, I called the hospital. I didn't want to leave for an entire day trip while a girl was missing. I found out that I couldn't reach him. He tried to get out of bed too soon after his hip surgery and was rushed back in to get the damage fixed. That was a few hours ago. My father was the emergency contact. The hospital would have no reason to call me, and I assumed my father didn't want to stress me out until he knew what was going on. With speaking to my grandfather no longer being a current option, I decided there was only one thing left to do. I was going into the woods. The sun hadn't set, but it was dark and overcast by the time I was ready to leave again. I found an oversized raincoat and a flashlight. I didn't own any rain boots, so my feet would get wet on this trip. Double-checking, I made sure I had my cell phone and braved the storm outside. Walking down the dirt road, I kept slipping on the mud and watching for any cars. There weren't any tracks due to the rain, and I didn't see any parked SUVs like before. The path was so hidden without the SUV marking it, I nearly walked right by it. Gathering up my courage, I walked along, being careful not to trip. The forest felt like a living creature that didn't want me being near it. The trees felt as if they were closing in on me out of the corners of my eyes. Each lightning flash brought more fear and stress. I thought I was seeing shadows darting between the trees. An unnaturally cold wind blew, and my teeth chattered from fear. I didn't know what this girl looked like. I assumed I would just run into Agent 202 again. He might answer my questions if it was about a missing girl. I felt like he was a decent man, just stuck with a menacing job. I was only in the woods for a short while, but I was already fairly lost. Hearing rustling behind me, I looked over, trying to see the cause of the noise. At first, I didn't notice it. Then, movement, barely within my eyesight, made me look up. On a tree branch, over nine feet in the air, was what looked like a wet sleeping bag. I looked at it, confused on how it got up there, and why anyone would put it there. And then, I realized, it looked full, not like an empty sleeping bag draped on a tree branch. The moments that realization hit me, the upper part of the bag turned towards me. 
A pure white face looked down at me, nearly all of it being taken up by a twisted smile. I nearly dropped my flashlight when I bolted. I didn't even scream. I just ran as fast as I could away from whatever I'd just seen. While I ran in a mad panic, I saw more of those shapes in the trees and jumped over a few in the bushes. They looked like they were wrapped in fabric, but almost had a caterpillar body. Nubs, acting like feet, started to move when I ran past. I didn't look behind me. I just ran for my life. Aside from their faces, they didn't look any more frightening. I didn't know if they were a joke or some sort of forest creature, and I was not sticking around to find out. As I ran, I started to hear the voices, small voices carried in the wind, nearly drowned out by the pattering of the rain on my jacket hood. Stay. Offering. Wait. Wait. The raspy voices begged me not to leave them behind, and I was not going to listen to them. I tripped over a root and smashed into the ground. My knee shot pain through my entire body, and my elbow got that fuzzy feeling from hitting my funny bone. I couldn't breathe, so I curled up against a tree trying to recover. I sat, wheezing, sore and cold, and scared out of my mind. The rain was a drizzle, but thunder rumbled. I could hear them, the sound of their bodies moving in the woods. The same rustling sound I thought was wind through the trees when I first ran into 202. These things had been in the woods the entire time. I didn't know if one had broken into my kitchen or if it was something else. Gulping down air, I was ready to run again when I saw a pale face peek out from the bushes and smiling at me a few feet away. What the hell was happening in these woods? I never ran so much and so hard in my life. The lack of oxygen to my brain made me dizzy. I could have been going in circles for all I knew. I flew into a clearing, tripping over my own feet, falling hard onto the ground. I stayed, panting, while rain started to drizzle down harder. The sky was so gray, it was as if the sun had already set. I looked up, sweat and rain dripping from my face, my throat raw from running. Beyond the clearing, I saw a shape, and my heart nearly stopped. I breathed a sigh of relief when the head raised up, so I could tell it was just a harmless deer. It looked at me, wary. Because I didn't move, or get closer, it regarded me as harmless. The thing waiting above the deer, however, was not. A blur of motion came from the tree, and the thump of it landing on the deer's back made my skin crawl. For some reason, the deer didn't run. It let out a horrible sound of distress and collapsed, so I could no longer see the deer or the creature that landed on top of it. I waited, my entire body tense. A ripping sound drifted between the sound of rain and the deer stayed silent. Finally, after hearing hints of something terrible happening, more tearing sounds came as a new creature stood up. It looked a little like a deer. It had a human face and legs. So many legs along a body covered in fabric. I gasped and it looked at me. Smile so wide its eyes were scrunched up. Again, I did not stay to see what the hell was going on. I scrambled back to my feet and started running. My chest burning, but the creatures in the woods was a very good motivation to keep going. I heard the new, deer-like creature start after me. The bushes and tree branches were knocked aside as it moved. More of the creatures fell out of the trees, landing on the ground with wet-sounding thuds. Some behind me, some in front. I kept moving while those thuds came from behind. After each sound of impact, small feet started after me. I was being chased by these creatures, and I didn't have any way of ditching them. In such a situation, you can understand why I did something so desperate as to run towards the first artificial lights I saw. Though the trees on my left was a blinding light, I changed course to run towards it, nearly tripping over one of these caterpillar-shaped creatures on the way. I heard their little footsteps getting closer and closer. I wasn't going to make it. 
I even felt the breath of a larger one on my neck as I ran. With one final push, I launched myself into the light, rolling along cut, wet grass, panting, scared out of my wits. I sat up, mouth open to beg for help, and froze. My entire body shut down at what I saw. It was a circle completely cleared of trees and trimmed grass. Spotlights were set up to surround the area and shone directly into the middle of the clearing. Men in suits stood an equal distance from each other. I'd just run in the middle two of them, making them stare at me in utter confusion. All of them had black hair and looked very similar to the agent I'd met. An agent at the far side started to run towards me the moment I sat up. It was my guess he was Agent 202, running to get me the hell out of what I had just stumbled into. The two in the middle of the clearing were so unnatural, my brain just stopped working. I sat, staring in shock at a creature at least twelve feet tall. It looked a little like the creatures in the woods I was running from. It had dark, shining fabric covering its long body, making it look as if it was covered in oil. It curled around itself, a human-like face looking towards me, giving that same unsettling smile the other monsters did. Instead of the stubby arms, this monster's body was lined with human arms down the side. Far too many for me to count. The smile grew even wider the longer it looked in my direction, to the point where it looked as if it was going to take up its entire face. The man in black beside the creature was so surprised at my sudden arrival, he dropped a black metal box he was about to hand to the monster. The box tipped over, spilling out gore and blood into the wet grass. Gore kept spilling out, spreading beyond them. It was as if it was never going to stop pouring from such a small space. Oh, what a creep. The creature got down and flew towards me, moving quickly, using its countless hands, tearing up clots of dirt and grass. I was unable to move or save myself. Right before a large mouth tore into my body, I was pushed aside. The monster grabbed my savior. It kept going now with the man wearing a suit locked in its jaws. They both slammed against a tree, causing the rest of the men wearing suits to scatter, looking confused on what to do. I felt sick. Without a doubt, my life was just saved by 202. He just sacrificed himself after he warned me again and again to stay out of the woods. He was still alive, pinned against the tree, as the monster tore into his shoulder, blood staining the ground. He was trying in vain to get the jaws away from him. Face twisted in pain, he looked over in my direction, silently begging me to run. My legs were unstable. Powerful arms grabbed me and lifted me painfully off the ground. One of the men in suits was now facing me, face twisted in so much rage he might as well be foaming at the mouth. You, do you have any idea what you've just done? Hans, drop that trash and come over to eat this one. He snapped. The monster looked over in our direction, the agent still dangling from its mouth. No. Bring the newcomer over here. A voice came, and it made everyone stop moving. They all looked as scared as I felt. The man who was flushed in rage a second ago was now pale. I looked over to see whose voice it was. Past where the blood and gore that was still pooling from the box was a white shape. It was so white my eyes hadn't seen it when they were adjusting to the glaring spotlights. It looked like a layer of nearly transparent sheets piled on top of each other, being held up by one point underneath. The voice was so pleasant and the fabric looked inviting but the thought of going near it scared me far more than anything I'd seen so far. The men recovered and started to drag me along. I finally regained some senses to resist them, but they were too strong. I was dragged along, getting blood soaked through my shoes when we went through it. I felt sick. I prayed that the missing girl wasn't a part of that gore pile. We stopped 
and the layer of fabric opened up just enough for me to see a pair of feet. Clawed, segmented feet, as pale as the glossy sheets they hid behind. What a troublesome family you are. The voice was soft, but it made my body react in the same way nails on a chalkboard would. My lord, should you really be... One of the men who held me on my feet started to ask. Are you questioning me, child? That soft voice called me. I felt his hands shake as he kept holding on to my upper arm. Uh, oh, uh, what the hell are you? I asked, voice trembling so hard I barely got the words out. That is none of your concern. The voice answered me. It is. I turned my head to see Agent 202 still hanging from the monster's mouth. His body turned to face us, and blood had dripped off his black suit. As of an hour ago, this man is the landowner. We need his permission to... The creature tightened its jaw shut. I heard bones cracking as the agent fell limp, no longer able to speak. I nearly got sick seeing such a thing. I shook, but out of rage from someone I was starting to consider a friend being killed in front of me. My grandfather owned land around the cabin, and I never knew just how much was his. If I was now the owner, then my grandfather passed away. But how would they know about his death before me? I needed answers. Feeling a bit braver because of my anger, I turned back towards the hidden figure. I demand to know what you're talking about. And why that creature just killed him. I wanted to sound intimidating, but the tears in my eyes ruined it. Oh no. 202 is not dead. It takes more to kill one of my children. But I suppose I do need to explain a few things to make this meeting valid. Lifting the veil-like fabric, I saw more of the one who was speaking with me. They had a slim body dressed in glimmering white layers. A pair of thin legs peeked from the cuts of their dress-like outfit. The pale legs looked as if they should belong to a ball-jointed doll with claws for feet. Their face was still hidden, and chest somewhat flat made it impossible to really tell a gender. We require permission from the owner of the land so we can do our yearly meetings. In exchange, I shall give the landowner anything they wish for. The creature whispered towards me. He reached a hand out and touched under my chin with just the tip of a clawed finger. A warm feeling spread through my body like I just sank into the most relaxing bath ever. My eyes closed and my head dropped. If I wasn't being held up, I would have fallen asleep from that slight touch. In the back of my mind, I wondered what it would be like if this creature placed its entire hand on my shoulder. I shook the cotton from my head when the fingertip was drawn away. That agent, if he's still alive, get him medical attention. I mumbled, pulling myself out of that warm feeling and back into the coldness of the real world. Oh. That's it, the voice asked, sounding less graceful than before. I kept shaking my head, trying to think. It did say I could ask for anything. That might mean more than one thing. I could try and save 202 because he saved my life. If he lived through this, though, he would go back into this creature's clutches. His lonely, dead eyes haunted my thoughts, and I knew I couldn't leave him behind. I want you to give Agent 202 his freedom. Let him leave and do whatever he wants with his life, I said sternly, finally finding my strength. I heard an intake of air from inside the small tent. The creature sounded angry, its entire body froze, and I felt my chest tighten in fear. I felt as if I just did something very, very wrong. You just asked for one of my children. 
How dare you ask a parent to give up a child? Its voice rose with each word until the air itself around us shook. The fabric flared out behind it, giving it an appearance of wings flapping in the wind still covering its face. When I thought I couldn't take it anymore, the thing waved a pale hand. Done. I have hundreds more. Anything else, small-minded child? My head was swimming. I was about to say no, because I really didn't want anything from these damned monsters, when the reason why I entered the woods came to my mind. If Sally Ann is still alive, please spare her, and don't harm anyone from town. We do not harvest in the area we meet. That is a given. It appears the owner before you told you nothing. No, I do not have any more time to waste. Be gone from my sight. Another wave of its hand, and I was being dragged back from the men in suits. As I was being dragged, I felt a small, sharp pain in my arm, causing me to look over. One of them just jabbed me with a needle. I looked at him, offended. Pretend this entire thing was a dream, and stay the hell away from now on. He hissed, his voice barely above a whisper. When he finished speaking, whatever he jabbed me with took over. My body fell limp, and I dropped into a long, dark sleep. When I awoke again, my entire body was stiff. I felt like I slept for days, and I learned I had. Outside was a ruin of downed tree branches and dead trees. My phone line was dead, and my cell phone wasn't charged. When I got it working again, I gathered up whatever information and listened to my hundreds of missed messages from my family. A huge storm rolled in cutting out the phone lines and power in the area the day I went into the woods. So, no one was surprised when I didn't return their calls. Because of the damage, none of my family members could drive over to the cabin and see me. I already knew my grandfather passed away, and he left the cabin to me. Hearing it was still a shock. I made arrangements to get everything settled. I walked into town to get something to eat, and found out Sally Ann was perfectly fine. She hitched a ride down to the town over to get a special birthday present for her mother. Her phone died, and she didn't remember her mother's cell number to borrow a friend's phone to call. She felt so bad about everyone worrying about her that she was still apologizing for it. When I got back to the cabin after going on a brief trip into town, I saw a familiar SUV waiting for me. I was only drugged and sleeping for three days, but the agent I asked to be saved already was recovered from injuries that should have killed him. He leaned against his car, watching me walk up, eyes hidden behind his glasses. He looked fine, dressed in a new suit, aside from a set of new scars on his face. A line ran up from the corner of his mouth, up under his glasses, and cut through his eyebrow on both sides of his face. Another line started under the bottom corner of his mouth, giving it a segmented look. When he, uh, it, stopped a few steps from me, he silently stared, the air tense between us. He then stood up, hands in his pockets. Without a word, he gave my foot a kick with the side of his polished dress shoes with a scowl on his face. You're just like your grandfather. Can't leave well enough alone. Gotta go chasing after nonsense. I could tell he was angry from him sidekicking me, and I took it. I could have died because I didn't listen to him. Hearing him mention my grandfather made me wonder how old 202 really was. When he finished kicking me, he turned his back on me. I thought he was just going to leave, but he spoke again. Is he really gone? He asked, finally. Yes, I'm sorry, I replied, and I meant it. This man might have known my grandfather better than I ever did. 
If he was as old as I thought, he made the hard choice of leaving someone he cared about behind as he started a family, and the agent kept doing his mysterious job with unnatural creatures. So, uh, that big monster thing that nearly ate me was Hans, huh? He really is an ass. His back was still turned, and he gave me a snicker. It eased some tension. What are you going to do now? Keep the cabin, or do the wise thing and sell it? He asked, looking over his shoulder at me. I don't think I can do that to someone. You guys are stuck with me for a while, I guess. I shrugged. You should do what your grandfather did. Raise a family and keep his nose out of things that are none of his business. You're my friends. You are my business. It was a little embarrassing to say, but even more so to hear. The agent stared at me, mouth slightly open as color started to come to his ears. Trying to hide his reaction, he started his side kicking again, harder this time. I couldn't help but to laugh as I stepped away, trying to dodge his pitiful attacks. Go get married, he yelled, raising a finger at me, and then stomping over to his SUV. Yanking open the door, he started the car, but didn't drive just yet. After a few seconds, the window came down, and he leaned out a little. Am I going to see you next year? I... Uh, you can drop by whenever you want, I offered. Uh, oh, uh, hey, do you have a real name? Like, uh, 202 is a mouthful. He sat, thinking about how to answer. My parents have a lot of children. They ran out of names after 30 of us, so... No. But you can give me a nickname. The offer was so sudden, I wasn't able to think of one on the spot. I searched through my mind, trying to come up with anything. The seconds dragged on, and I pitched the first thing I could think of. Uh, Thule. I mean, uh, it's a real surname, and it sounds like two... Sort of. I felt embarrassed by my horrible naming skills. You're just as bad as naming as my parents. Hans is called that because it sounds like hands. That's so stupid, I said, knowing I wasn't much better. Tully it is, I guess. Wait, now I changed my mind. Give me a second, I can think of something better. Nope. Need to go. See you later. I stood, helpless, as he drove away, leaving me in the dust. I could die of embarrassment. I was only alive because of this man, and I gave him the world's worst nickname in exchange. Until I saw him again, I would think of a better one. After all, whatever that was in those woods would be coming again. I was fully content in never seeing anything strange or supernatural for another year when my new agent friend came back. However, I was still researching as much as possible in the past few months to figure out what happened in the woods only to come across nothing. No mention about strange agents or odd sleeping bag caterpillar monsters. At least, nothing about strange agents that fit the description of the ones I met. The local librarian probably thought I was a nut checking out all the occult-related books looking for answers. The research was to keep my mind off one issue that came from my grandfather's death. After he passed away, he left the cabin and land to me. The land itself was worth a fortune if I ever sold it. I knew if I did, the forest would be cleared for lakeside condos or cabins... I couldn't do that. I was a city person, but I grew to love these woods and the small town. My grandfather also left me a pretty sizable cash inheritance to ensure I would never have to worry about working if I lived on a budget. That is what caused the issue. My father was so offended about my grandfather leaving so much to me and so little to him. We had a huge fight over it. 
What Grandpa John left the rest of my family wasn't nothing, but it wasn't the same amounts I received. I refused to sell the land, and when he got so angry about it, I pushed back. I would have gladly given him a great deal of the money that I now owned because I felt guilty over it. All of those ideas were tossed aside after how he acted when I refused the land sale. We still hadn't made up. No one in my family was talking to me aside from my sister, who was quirky in her own way I just couldn't describe. She didn't look affected by the split in our family. She just waved her fake nails and dismissed the worries in her false New York accent. I have no idea why she spoke like that when she's never been to New York. But her odd way of speaking comforted me. As the months passed, the summer turned into fall. I made friends with the locals, and Derry, the man who owned the bait shop, taught me a lot about fishing. On occasion, we went out onto the dock, and he told me stories about my grandfather I would never have known otherwise. When I was alone fishing on the dock, I ran through what happened in the summer through my head looking for answers. I met a white creature that offered me any wish in order for it to use the land for meetings. I used it to save Agent 202, or Thule, as I nicknamed him, and to give him freedom from that creature. He went off shortly after and promised we would meet again. I never asked him if he was still working for the creature, and if he was, why? That creature may let him go free, but I was under the impression all the agents are Thule's brothers. Was he staying for them? I might have asked one day, but it was a hard topic to bring up. I didn't want him to feel as if he owed me, it just felt like the only thing I could ask for at the time. I also wondered what my grandfather's wish had been. Money would make sense, because he left so much of it when he passed, but I didn't feel as if that was very likely, because I believed him and Thule were involved back then. I never confirmed it, but there was a rumor of good old Grandpa John being caught with an agent all those years ago, from how Thule couldn't even face me when he wanted to confirm that my grandfather really passed away, cemented the idea in my head that it was him who cared for the landowner so long ago. I was going out of my head from not working and not having any answers. I simply had too much time on my hands and didn't want to wait until next year for Thule to come back so I could wrestle some information out of him. I almost accepted my frustrating year when something happened. I forgot to lock the door, and a creature got into my cabin. Again. This time I could not blame it on a hungry raccoon. I heard the noises in the middle of the night and regretted the fact I hadn't bought a gun. It just felt like a lot of work filling out the forms, and I just never got around to doing it. Pans clattered to the ground in the kitchen, and I suppressed a yelp of fear. I did buy a baseball bat, so I grabbed it and a flashlight to go down the stairs. I was a little braver this time, and shone my light directly into the kitchen with my bat in hand. I still nearly fainted when I saw a white face smiling back at me in the beam of the light. It was one of those caterpillar creatures I'd seen in the woods months ago. I hadn't seen any since then, and prayed they were gone. This thing smiling in my cabin proved me wrong. It was plump with nubby legs. A dark, black fabric-like texture covered its body, making it look like a sleeping bag. A white, almost mask-like face looked over at me. Its eyes scrunched up from a wide smile with needle teeth showing. The bastard had a box of table salt between its nubby legs. Mine. The thing spoke. I backed up as my heart leapt into my throat. I might have a weapon, but not enough courage to use it. It turned and scuttled out of the open back door, somehow carrying the box of salt in its nubs. Once it was outside, I slammed the door shut and locked it. I did not sleep that night, over wondering just how many more of them could be out in those woods. The experience of seeing the creature gave me a paranoia of making sure all my doors and windows were locked, but it also gave me an idea, a stupid idea, that might put myself in danger, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Those creatures could talk, 
that means I might be able to ask some questions. When the sun set, I'd already put my plan into action. I placed some raw meat, cupcakes, and carrots on plates and left them outside the back door. I could see the back porch from the kitchen window, and I waited. I didn't know what the creatures ate besides salt, and put out a few things to pick from. I expected to wait long, but the creature must have smelled the food, and came up to the back porch after an hour. It slowly came up to the steps, being well aware someone was watching it. I didn't even have time to react. The moment it reached the plates, it inhaled all the food and was practically flying off the back steps. I would need a lot more food to keep it still for longer. I considered buying a live trap, but thought it might be too smart for one of those. It could open up doors, after all. I didn't have much else to do, so I went with the slow and steady approach. I could easily feed it to the point where it couldn't move or get it comfortable with me. The teenaged cashier, Linda, saw me buy extra food, but she didn't mention it. I thought small town folk were all nosy and into gossip. People had tended to keep their own business, which was good. I really couldn't explain what I was doing. I ran into the sheriff while I was heading back from buying food for my newfound creature, and he stopped me for some small talk. Have you heard anything strange up near your cabin lately? He asked. The question felt loaded to me. He was smiling as he spoke, so I doubted he was referring to any kind of supernatural creature. No, uh, nothing. Why? I replied, hoping I sounded normal. Well, some people renting out the cabins near you came across a sick-looking raccoon. We're looking into trapping it. Hey, just be careful, all right? They want you to need some rabies shots. I nearly sighed in relief. Just a raccoon. So far, no one ever mentioned those sleeping bag creatures. Either no one had ever seen them, or didn't want to talk about them. I was glad that some of the townsfolk were friendly enough towards me to warn me about a rabid raccoon in the area. Since my huge fight with my family, I was feeling a bit lonely up in the cabin. Someone showing they cared was nice. I should have taken this warning a bit more seriously. Putting food out when there was a hungry and messed up raccoon around was not a good idea. But I didn't even have any second thoughts as I put out some very salted raw steaks on the back porch because those appeared to be my monster's favorite. Some nights I didn't stay by the back door to watch it eat. That night I was doing dishes and facing away from the window. Just as the sun was setting... Some of the most horrible noises I've ever heard came from the back of the cabin. I rushed to the door, hands still wet, to see what was going on. Outside, the creature I'd been feeding was in a bad tussle with a very fat raccoon. I felt my heart drop. Hey! I shouted at the two of them. I grabbed my baseball bat from the back door. I smartly stayed on the back porch, knowing getting in the middle of the fight would only result in a rabies shot. I watched helplessly as the creature fought and had some nubby legs torn off. Blood and fur flew from both of them. The fight only lasted a few minutes, and when it did, the raccoon started to chase the monster off into the woods. I made the foolish choice to grab my jackets and my flashlight to go after them. If that creature died, I would lose any answers it held. Once again, I thought what I was doing was stupid and dangerous. There could be more of those caterpillar creatures out in the woods. I'd seen one kill a deer before and changed into something else. If I came across a bigger one of those things, it could easily eat me, even though the smaller one couldn't win against a raccoon. I kept following the trail of footprints in the dirt. My flashlight guided me along into the woods. I should have brought a better weapon with me than an old baseball bat I'd bought for a dollar at a yard sale. While walking, I thought I heard twigs snapping off in the distance. I looked off into the dark trees, trying to see anything out of the ordinary. If I didn't find the creature soon, I would need to turn back. I would regret not being able to help it, though. They were creepy as hell but I gotten slightly attached to my new stray, even if it would eat me if given the chance. 
As I moved further into the woods, I started to lose track of the little footprints until finally they disappeared. I scanned the tree branches with my light, wondering if it climbed a tree, and that's why the trail went cold. Nothing but leaves, and no sign of the monster I was looking for. While lowering my flashlight, the beam caught something. A flash of white. My heart capped as I hoped it was the unnerving white face of the creature. It was not. Instead, it was a white sheet of fabric wrapped around something dark. Too dark for me to make out the shape. A simple eye symbol was crudely painted on the fabric with red paint. I stood, puzzled over why something like that would be in the woods. Then, what the fabric was wrapped around stood up. My throat closed up, making it impossible for me to make a sound. The thing that was now standing a few feet from me was nothing like the sleeping bag creature I'd seen before. It looked almost human, a body covered in pitch black fur with massive clawed hands at its side. The fabric was wrapped around the top part of the creature's face, leaving a wolf snout visible. When it took a step towards me, I ran. I only took a few steps while that thing gained on me at a frightening speed. I tripped on a root, slamming into the ground and dropping my flashlight. Even if I didn't trip, I never would have gotten away from this monster. By the time I rolled over, the thing was on top of me. Claws slammed down into the dirt beside my head, and the wolf face inches from my own. I let out a small squeak of a scream, but no other noise came. It opened its huge mouth as countless teeth shone in the moonlight, ready to take my head off. I didn't know what made me act the way I did, but it saved my life. Before it closed its jaws around my tender flesh, I reached over and pulled off the fabric covering the beast's eyes. It was an ungraceful moment, and I slammed my elbow against the hard ground while pulling it away from the monster. It froze the moment its eyes were exposed. Snapping those jaws shut, we both looked at each other, frozen in shock. I would have never expected to see such a pair of eyes on a creature so frightening. Instead of glowing red or orange ones, I was staring into a pair of glittering pearls. They shone so brightly, even the small amount of moonlight was reflected off the trees, causing light-flickering reflections of light to surround us. The thing let out a strangled, choking sound from its throat, and just disappeared in thin air. It was just... gone. I remained on the ground, sweating, and my heart beating like a racehorse. I did not understand what it was, or what even happened. The only proof it was real was the piece of fabric still in my hand. I stood up on shaking legs to look around, trying to spot signs of where the creature went. Instead, I saw someone who made my jaw drop open. What are you doing here? The newcomer and I spoke in unison. Tuli was walking towards me looking completely furious. I almost didn't recognize him out of his suit. Instead, he wore a black bomber-styled jacket with a black shirt under it. He still had sharp dress pants and polished shoes in the woods. I haven't seen any traces of him in the last few months and doubted I would see him until next year. He stopped in front of me, jaw clenched, and it looked like he was gritting his teeth in rage. If he was here that it meant something was going on. His blue eyes darted to the fabric in my hand, and he snatched it away. What are you doing with this? Did you come across Val? Did you come across something? He held out the white fabric, accusing me of snooping again. I felt my head swim a little from not only seeing him again, but also from what just happened. I stood, shocked, and didn't try to pick up my flashlight. I... I, I just... I think I saw a werewolf, I stammered, not believing the words that came out of my own mouth. What I saw seconds ago did look like a werewolf, but that couldn't be it. Werewolves aren't real, right? I could accept whatever I'd seen in those woods a few months ago, but I drew the line at werewolves. Tully looked me over, his anger fading, 
Placing a hand on my shoulder, he forced me to step forward. I'll get you back home. My old warning still stands. Stay out of these woods, at least for a few days. When I started to move, I felt a heat coming from his hand and through my jacket. My head suddenly flashed, and I looked at him, confused at the odd change. You're hot, I commented, looking at the hand that was on my shoulder. Excuse me, he asked, eyebrow raised and after a bit of a pause. In those few seconds it took him to answer back, I felt a wave of nausea hit me. My head started to pound and my entire body felt feverish. Unable to control myself, I bent over and unloaded my dinner on the ground in front of us. Tears streamed down my face as bile came through my nose because of the angle. It was not pleasant. I stayed like that for what felt like forever, even after my stomach was empty. Something was wrong for me to suddenly become so ill. This was not due to shock or anything along those lines. Thule stayed by me until I was well enough to move. Slowly, he started to guide me along to a small clearing. I felt like I might get sick again at any moment, and I took small steps. When he found a decent spot, he helped me down and got my jacket off. He folded it so I could rest my head. He shrugged off his own jacket to fold it and place it over my eyes. Somehow, the small amount of moonlight being blocked out minimized the dizziness. I folded my hands on my chest, trying to focus on not getting sick again. Why do I feel so terrible? My voice was hoarse from getting sick. My mouth tasted awful, and I wished I had some water. Valak hit you with a spell. Normally you can walk it off, but I didn't notice fast enough. Stay down and take a break, and don't move too much, or else. Or else what? I'll puke my stomach out? Actually, yes, along with other organs. I glanced from under his jacket, and there was enough moonlight to see him leaning against a tree, arms folded. His tone was very serious, and I tried my very best to stay as still as possible. My brain went back to the fact a spell was what was making me so ill. I'd seen creatures, and yet I never even considered magic was real. I just saw the creatures as something natural with logical rules I just didn't understand. A magic werewolf. Talking made me feel slightly better despite my sore throat. I had a lot of questions, and for once, Thule was answering them. Valak is part of a nomad tribe that are genius spellcasters. They're not werewolves, but you wouldn't know that. They only have a wolf form and a bipedal one, not a human one. Sorry, I'm still stuck on the magic thing. And why would he put a spell on me? He could have easily killed me. Valak is shy. You saw his face. That answer threw me off more than the idea of magic. That monster could bite me in half, and yet he was... shy. It did explain the behavior after the hood was removed. I wished that monster didn't have that trait. I'd almost rather be torn apart than feeling this sick. Why are you even inside of these woods in the first place? After what you saw last time, I expected you to stay away. Thule was finally scalding me for coming into the woods at night. He was right, and I didn't really have a good reason. I, um, I was trying to find one of those caterpillar creatures. I, I, I thought that maybe they could speak and answer some questions I have. I explained, and braced myself for more verbal abuse from my dumb idea. I heard the agent sigh and peeked over at him to catch him shaking his head at my answer. There shouldn't be any of them still in these woods after our meeting. It's my job to collect them. However, I was injured. I left the task for my younger agents. I suppose they did a poor job of it. I started to wonder just how many of these creatures that were left behind. I saw one, but who knows how many were missed. Aside from them, there was something else going on inside these woods. Thule wouldn't be here otherwise. So, um, why are you here? I thought you came by once a year. It's not as if I'm not happy to see you. 
Are you hunting that werewolf that attacked me? He looked at me for a long time, as if carefully choosing his words. I knew his kind met once every year, but I wasn't aware of his job. I did ask for his freedom in the summer, and he was unsure if he would ever return for the yearly meeting. But I also considered he might just not know what else to do besides remaining with his mysterious family. It was a hard topic to bring up. It was his life, after all. If he wanted to keep working until he found something else he enjoyed, it wasn't my place to stop him. No, I'm working with him, he said, finally. So he was on the job. His answers about his work were scarce. In fact, I think this was the longest conversation we had, and yet I still pressed for more answers. So, you're a government agent working with a werewolf? That sounds like a trashy romance novel plot. I heard him make a sound of annoyance. He didn't want to give out answers, but he also didn't want to give me the wrong idea. I'm not a government agent, more of a contractor. My brothers and I, the agents, offer our services to whoever that will pay. Sometimes it's for the government to deal with supernatural trouble. This time, a tribe related to Valak asked me here. I was still in the area, and it's always good to have spellcasters like them owe us favors. So, a government contractor working for a pack of werewolves. Got you. I was feeling a little bit better and almost ready to sit up. Until Thule said I should, I thought it was best not to risk it. They're not. He started to correct me, wondering if it was worth it. Around me, you can call them werewolves. But please try not to say it around Valak. You've already traumatized him by seeing his eyes. Um, what should I call them? I asked. I thought back to the eyes I saw for a few seconds. I wondered why the beast was so embarrassed about them. Surely anyone with such nice eyes would want to show them off. There. Again, he paused. Looking from under the jacket towards him, I saw he had his hand over his eyes, looking a little in pain. I can't say it. It's too stupid. He admitted now I need to know. He shook his head, refusing to answer my question. I started to sit up, and he lowered his hands, looking a little worried that movement would make me sick again. Then he realized I was using myself as a hostage until he spilled what he was hiding. They named themselves Wolf Wolves. His voice sounded strained and a little embarrassed. They may be genius spellcasters, but not that bright when it comes to other things. I held back my laughter from his discomforts and from the poor name choice. I wasn't much better, considering the nickname I gave my agent friend. He silently decided it was time to get me back home. He lifted me back onto my feet and collected our coats. I didn't feel as bad as expected, but he still needed to support my weight as we walked along through the dark woods back to the cabin. So, if these wolf things are real, how about vampires? I asked, trying to focus on anything but my ill stomach. Yup, Tully answered with no hesitation. Uh, Bigfoot? Nessie? Yeah. Are you... are you just agreeing with everything to mess with me? I glanced up at him while he kept his eyes forward. After a small pause, he answered again. Yeah. I might have gotten some answers tonight, but I wondered how many were the truth. It was hard to tell if Thule just had a bad sense of humor or was trying to throw me off. I was glad to know that the wolf creature was working with him, but I was never told what they were doing in these woods. Something was going down, and I was in no state to force the answers from him. More questions needed to wait until I rested for a while. As we walked up to the cabin, I saw a familiar shape near the porch steps. As we got closer, I could make out what it was. It looked like one of those caterpillar creatures, but with odd hands along its body instead of the nubby ones. When it heard us coming, it stood up on all of those legs that were not long enough to support its plump body. From behind, a large raccoon tail stood up. So, those hands were raccoon hands. Slowly, it waddled over. A smile plastered on its white face looked as disturbing as ever. 
Since I could manage on my own, Thule walked away to scoop the creature into his arms. It wriggled, trying to get free, and its teeth were ripping at his jacket. He didn't even seem to notice how hard the thing was struggling. I don't understand how he's so fat. He shouldn't be like this unless he got into garbage or junk food. I felt sweat start at the base of my neck as I thought about all the table scraps and junk I fed one of those creatures trying to catch it for answers. Surely this wasn't the same one. I remembered the deer and how one of those monsters changed from eating it. There was a chance the one I was feeding caught the raccoon and changed. I... I may have... I started and didn't need to finish the sentence. My strange friend turned his head towards me, understanding immediately. His cold eyes locked onto mine, and he tightens the grip on the squishy creature that almost squirmed away. Inside the cabin, now. He hissed through gritted teeth. I understood and walked past him as fast as my body would let me. If he found out I was feeding that creature before I got sick, he might have lied to me about it. I did something stupid and didn't need him telling me so. I hurried up the front steps, my stomach churning, but I didn't let it slow me down. I only paused when I got to the door and looked over my shoulder to see Thule still angrily staring at me. In that moment, I was more scared of him compared to anything else I'd come across. I changed my clothing and brushed my teeth, which was greatly needed. Still feeling terrible, I went right to sleep, to deal with all the strange events and new information for when I woke up. I found out that Thule was in the area doing a job with a werewolf, so that was a start. When I walked inside the cabin to take a trip into town, I heard rustling under the front porch. Peering under, I expected an animal. Instead, I saw the fat raccoon hybrid staring back at me. It threw me off for a second. I thought the agent would have taken it away by now. Why did he leave it here? As it came closer to me, I guessed at the answer. Squirming along and dragging its fat body towards me, I became still, watching. It got close enough to touch, but I didn't dare move. I let it dart up and steal the granola bar I had peeking out of my jeans pocket. It darted back under the porch and into the darkness. Instead of seeing me as food, it saw me as the one who fed it. I might have ruined this poor thing. I would need to ask about it. I drove my car into town instead of walking. I rarely needed my old junker, but kept it around just in case. I could have bought a newer one. Due to how little I used this one, I saw no point. Today, I wanted to drive around looking for signs of Thule or his werewolf companion, and I certainly did see some signs. As I got into the nearly empty main road, I drove past a strange symbol drawn on the road. I noticed it late, and when I looked back, it was gone. While cruising through town, I saw flickers of more symbols that only lasted a second. I followed them until I reached the end of the main street and spotted Thule leaning up against a rented car, his arms crossed. I parked and walked over to him. He didn't even turn his head towards me. I looked in the same direction to spot nothing. I copied him and leaned against his car next to him. Nice jacket. Makes you look tough. I teased. With the sunglasses and his black outfit, it made him look like some bad boy extra from a 60s musical. He shoved my shoulder with his, still not looking over. My arm slipped. I sensed he was still angry at me for going into the woods last night. I didn't let that stop me from sticking around to bother him. Uh, so, what's up with all those weird symbols around town? Are you with your werewolf buddy? Uh, what's his name? Valak? Are you two setting up some sort of magical protection or something? Thule stiffened beside me. He looked down, his eyebrow raised at my question. Are you just guessing, or is it someone telling you this? Is there someone who can tell me what's going on? Because I can just go and ask them. I made a move to leave, and he waved me back. My constant harassment paid off. Yes, that's what we're doing. We already covered the surrounding cabins and were coming back from the ones across the lake when you ran into us last night. 
It's easier to cut through the woods to reach them than to stay on the roads. Normally, supernatural creatures really don't bother humans, but in this case, we can't take chances. I followed his gaze again and thought I saw a strange reflection coming off one of the shop windows. Half a symbol flickered into sight, being drawn as I watched it disappear. It made me think about how Valak was just gone last night. If he could use magic, could he turn himself invisible? An invisible werewolf sounded silly, but at this point, nearly anything was possible. Is Valak over there and I just can't see him? I asked, pointing in front of us. Tuli nodded, confirming my theory. I gave the creature a wave, unsure if he could see me or even cared if I arrived. I was given a look by my friend over being so calm about a monster being nearby. Aren't you a little freaked out by him? He did try to eat you last night, Tuli commented. I'm not mad at him. You probably saw me first and told him to scare me because I was in the woods alone again. It was a thought that was confirmed when Tuli looked everywhere but in my direction. Honestly, if I didn't pull off the mask Valak wore, I would have been scared enough to stay out of the woods until their job was done. I was so close to being unaware Tuli was in the area. After Valak disappeared, he came over to check on me, making a scene pretending he wasn't the mastermind behind the werewolf scare because he wanted to make sure Valak didn't curse me, which he did. I didn't hold any grudge against the wolf. Tuli looking embarrassed over being caught was enough payback. Uh, are you too hungry? I can buy you lunch from the diner. I offered. I'm fine, but Valak can always eat. I risked leaving them for a bit, hoping that feeding Valak would make up for traumatizing him. He did scare me first, but I felt as if I did more mental damage to him. Dogs couldn't eat onions, so I avoided those and bought a few sandwiches off the lunch menu to bring over. Tuli hadn't moved from his spot, and I saw a glimmering painted circle with odd writing now on the road. It faded like the others. I placed the takeout containers on the hood of the car for Valak to grab. I couldn't see him, so I wasn't sure where the wolf was. Can everyone see those? I pointed in the direction of the now very faintly visible circle in the road. No. Because you've come across supernatural things, your eyes are adjusting to them. But as you are able to see unnatural things, they are able to see you. I cannot protect you from everything, so stop sticking your nose in this business. But I want to know. I'm bored. I might have sounded like a child then, but it was the truth. I'd improved the internet at the cabin, but why watch shows about the supernatural when you had strange agents going on adventures where you lived? He shook his head towards me, and oddly enough, didn't dismiss me right. I'll tell you some of what we're doing so you don't go looking and getting hurt. We, uh, Balak, don't eat styrofoam. Our conversation was derailed for a moment because the wolf decided to try and eat what I brought, containers and all. At least he listened and spat them back out. As I was saying, we're here because of the Harvest Moon coming up. There is a tribe of uh, Valak's species that go feral during this time. The elder of the tribe isn't affected, and they get the rest back to their senses after the night ends. For some reason, two of the members disappeared and were seen around here. If they don't get treated by the elder, they'll succumb to Harvest Moon fever and will need to kill them before they harm anyone. First caterpillar monsters, and now feral werewolves. My life had become strange since coming to the cabin. Not that I minded too much, besides the nightmares. I'm surprised you're telling me this much, and not putting the whole, uh, this is top secret government business, if I told you I'd have to kill you. I don't care about giving away government secrets. What are they going to do? Fire me? It's my family I can't talk about. He brought up a good point. After seeing him living through being locked inside a monster's jaws, I don't think anything the government could throw at him would do any harm. I understand his position because of the huge fight with my father. I knew how painful it was to talk about family if you didn't want to. 
The reason behind his secretive nature could be emotional. Uh, oh, uh, that reminds me. Why'd you leave the raccoon creature behind? He's yours now. If I brought him back, he would be torn to pieces by my other brothers. The way he phrased that made me pause. I could have assumed he meant other agents would kill the raccoon creature, but it sounded like he meant the other sleeping bag monsters would do it. And that implies he was brothers with not only the human agents, but also those caterpillar monsters. Hans included. Wait, you're all brothers? All of you? Hans and those things? Not just the agents? Are you trying to judge us based on human standards? Thule commented back in an easy tone. I honestly could not tell if he had the driest of humor and was teasing me. I understood he wasn't human, but it was hard to believe him, and what was now living under my porch came from the same parent. If I asked him to explain it, he wouldn't. I just needed to accept facts, no matter how it bothered me. I... I don't know how I feel about having your brother as a pet. You shouldn't have fed him, then. I walked into that one. I've walked into a lot of his comebacks. I looked over to see if Valak was done eating and if I needed to clean up the containers. The wolf did it himself. While we spoke, he had finished off the pile of food and placed the empty takeout containers in a garbage bin nearby. Actually, there is something you can do for me. Truly set, and he drew my attention back to him. I ordered something to help deal with the pharaoh wolves if we come across them. But the one delivering them hasn't shown up yet. He lives around here, so that's why I asked him to get the supplies. I... would I know him? Maybe. He goes by Sven. I know he's often in the library. I don't want to go into town, because someone may recognize me as one of the agents that showed up in the summer. Uh, that's right. Uh, Derry thought you were the grandson of one of the agents he saw when my grandfather first came here. People may not think you guys are weird, but they do notice things. Thule paused, thinking, trying to place the name. It wasn't a big town, so even if he came by once a year, it was easy to remember all the familiar faces. I pretty much knew everyone, and I'd only been around for a few months. I hadn't outright asked Thule how old he was. If he agreed with what I just said, then I would know he's older than Derry. Derry. Right. He took over the bait shop from his father. He must have a good memory if he knew my face from back then. I volunteered to look for a lost boy, and I've tried to stay out of town since. I worried one of the older residents might remember me and ask questions. I didn't know if Thule was aware he'd just given me some information I wondered about for months, or if he didn't care. I also wondered about the missing boy from back then, and found nothing. Some news articles without any resolution. I... Uh, what happened to him? The boy, I mean. Your family didn't have anything to do with it, right? Adam, it's a little rude to assume we did. He told me, a little annoyed, but went on. What happened back then was a bit of a complicated story. That boy, Tom, I think his name was, was abducted and killed by a man the town thought to be a saint. When his crimes came to light, well, the townspeople didn't bother with law enforcement. They took justice into their own hands because his crimes were against children. Because of the attention Tom's disappearance received, they could not reveal the child was dead without their brand of justice being discovered. His mother and the parents of the other victimized children all agreed to stay silent. I stood, completely shocked at what I was hearing. I never would have guessed this town held such a dark past. I felt a strange, dark emotion in the pit of my stomach when I thought of how many people who lived in the town may still be alive when it happened and how many of them I talked to without knowing they held a secret. I didn't think the younger generation knew about it. Or Derry. He was too young when it happened. Was my grandfather a part of it? Did he also help give out small-town justice? Did Thule? Did my grandfather... I couldn't even finish the question. 
What kind of man do you see him as? And do you think it's worth changing his image he tried so hard to portray by digging up a past that would only cause emotional harm? Anyway, I really need that package, so if you could drop by the library for me, that would be great. The different tones between his two statements gave me whiplash. I couldn't even respond for a few seconds. I wanted to ask more questions about the past, but he just made it very clear we needed to focus on the future. Oddly enough, that was feral werewolves, and I needed to return some books anyway. I agreed, with too many thoughts cluttering my head. I was thinking about so many other things, I didn't even guess at who I was meeting. He must have been expecting me. I returned my books and started to look around when I heard my name. When I looked, I recognized the man as the one who knew my grandfather and spoke to me a few months ago. I hadn't seen him since, or gotten his name. I walked over and shook his hand, thanking him for speaking with me for the last time. It was then I noticed a bundle under his arm wrapped in brown paper. Is our mutual friend still staying out of town? The older man asked with a knowing look. It still took me a couple of seconds to put everything into place. You know two, uh, Agent 202? I asked, keeping my voice down, feeling as if this just turned into a secret meeting. He noticed how I was darting my eyes around and guided me to the chairs we spoke in last time. No one besides the librarian was in the building that I could see. It still felt strange talking about the agents in the open after no one else knew about their true nature. Did this man... Or was he just friends with Thule? The man handed me the package, and it felt like a few objects were wrapped together. Unfortunately, I couldn't find what you asked for, but these are useful enough, Sven told me. What is it? Maybe I can... No. It's bad enough you're this involved. No need to go chasing more trouble. Although I could be blamed for telling you some information back then, I do stand by it. I felt like you should have known some of it, and it was your choice to keep going. This man was the one who told me my grandfather had been caught with an agent in his youth and before he met my grandmother. It was never outright said, but I was certain Thule was the agent he spoke about. I did want to know, but at the same time the question felt wrong to ask. I wanted Thule to be the one to say it, and not find out by going behind his back. So, you know that, uh, 202 is, well, different, right? I hinted, not knowing how to put it. Oh, I am well aware of what he is, Adam. I wanted to tell you things to warn you away from those agents, to warn you away from that forest during that time of the year. But I couldn't until you seen things. If I had said any of this before, you would have thought me crazy. My hands tightened around the packages as I felt my heart quicken. Sven's tone was serious. I was about to hear something Thule didn't want me to know. Some small bits of information about his family. You yeah, have seen those small creatures, correct? He asked, and I nodded, thinking of the caterpillar creatures. Yeah, those agents are, uh, related to those monsters. They're the result of one of them being placed into a deceased human body. The creature and the human bodies fused and formed something else. Under his human face is something no human can bear to witness. I sat, listening, and had to steady my hands. I thought back to all the kind gestures Thule had shown so far and wanted to doubt what I was being told. Then, I thought about the new scars on his face, the ones under his chin, and how it seemed as if his face could open up from those scars. I didn't respond, and Sven went on. Now, think of what would happen if they used someone still alive. That is what I was. Out of a thousand experiments, I was the one failure, and the only one left alive. A thousand. Thule's parents experimented and killed a thousand people. I didn't understand how they got away with so many. It, surely someone would have noticed a thousand people missing. It only made sense if they took people slowly over the years and from different locations. Still, a thousand felt an impossible number. The other ones that didn't make it, they killed a thousand people for something that 
didn't work? I asked, slowly, not wanting to believe it. How is 202 been acting towards you? Sven asked, with a hard-to-read expression. The question made me pause. It wasn't what I expected, and I needed to gather my thoughts. Uh, it, he was a bit cold at first, but he's been pretty kind to me lately. Out of all those agents, he's always been the one able to show kindness. That creature inside my body did not take well, and died. But it lasted a few days, and I felt what it would be like if it remained. The pain was beyond anything I could ever describe and it took over all my movements. I was aware it would use my body to commit such terrible acts and could do nothing about it. 202 knew of it and are suffering. So, he killed all the agents created in that way. I know he shall always pick the kindest option, no matter how cruel it may make him appear. A heavy air came between us as we remained silent for a long time. The only noise was of a ticking clock somewhere in the library. I found that I could believe my friend was capable of killing so many in order to free them. And accepting that fact, I knew he was the one who loved my grandfather so many years ago. If it was to save him, he would have done anything. Whatever dangers they faced back then, Thule had been the one making the hardest decisions. And just how far would he go to protect me if I kept chasing after answers? The package I came for felt almost as heavy as the information I just received. Was that a bit too much for you? Sven asked with a small chuckle to lighten the mood. Maybe a little, I admit it with a small nod. If you keep hanging around supernatural creatures, you're going to learn sooner or later that there are things worse than death. I wanted you to find out in a safe environment, the older man said as he started to get out of his chair. He gave my shoulder a comforting squeeze as he passed by. Take care of yourself. That's the only thing we ask for. It's up to you to decide what that means for you. I watched him walk away, leaving me with so much to think about. I wanted to know so much, but didn't know how to handle it when I did find them out. I couldn't wait for too long. I needed to go back to Thule and get the package in his hands. I passed the empty front desk, glad that no one overheard our conversation. When I found Thule, he clearly had finished his task and was just waiting for me to get back. He sensed I was feeling off, but I couldn't bring myself to tell him what I heard. He wasn't disappointed in the fact Sven delivered different items than asked. My friend was even nice enough to wait to see if I had any questions for him. I didn't entirely feel like asking him anything at the moment. I was left behind with the same warning I heard so many times before. Stay out of the woods. Stay out of trouble. When I arrived home that day, someone was waiting for me at the cabin. I blocked his number, so he resorted to seeing me in person. My father arrived, trying to talk me into selling the land around the cabin. He phrased it as talking some sense into me. I was in no mood to speak with him. That did not excuse how I acted. I don't remember how our conversation went before it turned into a yelling match. He accused me of being stupid and selfish. I would admit sometimes I was one of those things. I did not try and de-escalate the situation. I refused to sell the lands to be ruined by ugly buildings and the small town overrun with rich vacationers that didn't care about how they treated the forest around them. Our fight was so explosive, he did something I never thought he could. He hit me. The silence around the impact was so intense due to how loud we've been a split second before. The slap wasn't even that hard and didn't leave a mark on my cheek for very long. The fact he would raise his hand hurt more than any physical damage he could inflict. Neither of us spoke. He turned on his heels, either still angry or ashamed of what just happened. Without any doubt, he blamed me for the fight. The rest of the day, I didn't think about supernatural creatures or looking for answers. I didn't think about it much. I just tossed the food under the porch piece by piece 
watching the raccoon creature I needed to name vacuum the bits up. I woke up feeling sorry for myself, and my mood did not improve throughout the day. Some missed calls from my mother, but no message from my father. My uncle sent a message through the only social media account of mine he knew about, basically blaming the entire blowout on me. I didn't know what my father told everyone when he arrived back home. I blocked everyone's number but my mother's and my sister's. I wasn't ready to listen to my mother, but didn't feel right cutting her out. My sister, she was in her own little world with nothing to do with what was going on around her. I wished she could give me some lessons on that skill of hers. I wasn't hungry that morning, but my fat new pet was. Taking some freezer-burned meat out, I looked for him. I didn't even know if he would eat it, but until I get back from town, it was what I had left. Some scraps of paper fluttered on the porch after I opened the door. I followed the small trail, trying to piece the note together. The scraps disappeared under the porch, and I only had a fraction of the paper. My only assumption was Thule left a note on the door, and my creature tore it to pieces, thinking it was food. The fat little thing came out to steal the meat I put down, packages and all. I gave up on the note, unable to decipher the message. Because I was buying extra food, I took my car again. I noticed some faint symbols around town. They didn't show up when I took a photo of them with my phone. People walked by without glancing at them. I was the only one who could see them, besides the two who put them there. I made a quick grocery trip, then went around town looking for my agent friend. I came up empty-handed. I looked everywhere. All through town, by the lake and down the dirt roads, I even asked Gabby if anyone odd came into the diner that day. She didn't, and the librarian didn't know where Sven lived or his number for me to call on him for questions. My mind went back to that note. It might have been information on where to meet him that day. It most likely was his old warning about staying out of the woods. I looked up on my phone when the harvest moon would be. Tomorrow night was when two feral werewolves, or whatever they wanted to be called, would be in the forest. At least residents would be protected. The nights were cold, so there wasn't anyone camping so late in the season. No one should be in those woods besides two monsters and the two cents to deal with them. I spent the rest of the day cleaning and pacing, unable to think of anything better to do. I couldn't find Thule, and even if I did, I wasn't of any help to him. I just wanted to hang out with my friend. After cutting out nearly my entire family, I needed someone to talk with besides the fat raccoon creature who only stayed around for food. I could have gone into town and talked with the locals, but it wasn't the same. We were friendly, but I couldn't tell them what was going on in my life. I didn't even want to unload my troubles onto the strange agent. His job was so interesting it made me forget about what I was dealing with. A day passed by of nothing interesting. When night came, I repeated my previous mistake. I went into the woods, chasing after that raccoon creature. In my defense, I now was very emotionally attached to it, despite not giving it a name yet. It was late, and I was about to turn into bed when I heard desperate scratching at the front door. I'd locked it, but not the back one in case the raccoon wanted to come into the cold. If he kept stealing things from the fridge, I would need to think of a better system. I opened the door, and it rushed inside, frantic. He started to do tight circles, small hands clicking against the hard wood. I was aware he could talk, but hearing him do it was still pretty frightening. As it went in circles, it just kept repeating the same word over and over again. Danger. Outside, it was dark, but I didn't see any threats. No figures in the woods, and no odd sounds. Yet, something freaked out this creature enough to come and get me. I... Help. He stopped going in circles and ran outside. For having short arms, he sure could go fast. My heart sank as I couldn't do anything to make him stop. Still in my sleepwear, I grabbed my jacket and threw it on. The baseball bat was missing. Being so sick, I couldn't remember when I dropped it. 
I also lost my flashlight, but made the wise choice to buy a few backups. Grabbing the extra flashlight off the table by the front door, I went after the creature, calling for it to come back. The plan was to only take a few steps inside the woods, looking for it, and then turning back. In my frantic worry, I took more than a few steps. I could no longer see the cabin and got hopelessly lost. Clutching my jacket closed, I strained my ears, trying to find the creature. Uh, hey, uh, little guy, uh, where are you? Uh, let's go back. I shouted for him, unable to stay calm. If Thule and the friendly werewolf were in these woods, they may hear me. Instead of staying still, I kept pushing on, looking. I never should have gone after him a second time. But I wasn't looking for answers. I was looking for Thule's brother. He trusted me to take care of him. I wasn't about to let him get hurt. Considering what choices I make, it's a miracle I lived for so long. I walked for an unknown amount of time, calling out at random. Hearing twigs snap behind me, I turned around while walking backwards. It didn't take a werewolf to nearly kill me. I did that all on my own. My foot slipped, taking my body down a sharp slope I didn't see in the dark. I stumbled down, too shocked to even yell out. My ankle got caught on a root and twisted painfully. Something at the bottom of the incline was hard and met my head in a very rude manner. I literally saw stars and got knocked out for a short while. When I came to, my head pounded and my ankle throbbed. I was freezing cold because where I ended up was in a small puddle. The pain kept me down for a while. My flashlight shining in my face made my headache much worse, but I couldn't bring myself to move my hands to push it away. While I stayed there, I heard a voice I knew. The raccoon creature was nearby. This time, he was repeating hurts in a small, panicked voice. I started to sit up and regretted it. Then, I very faintly heard Thule's voice speaking with someone, but only the end of what he was saying. Fine. He's so small and beneath anyone's notice, he can be in the woods. Are you sure your barrier worked? I asked him to get me if Adam needs help. I groaned and finally sat up. It would be nice to know beforehand that a little guy could be in the woods without being in any danger. If a certain person told me that, I would not be in the position I was in now. A powerful beam of light came over me, and I raised a hand to block it out. Valak, get him, please. In the next few seconds, a massive wolf came down the slope. It had the white fabric covering its eyes, and I assumed this was Valak, but in his other form. Transforming back was as simple as standing up. He was there to help, but... I still felt a little bit of fear from having a massive monster towering above me. I was lifted up in a large clawed hand and on top of the slope in another second. I was placed in front of Thule, who lowered the flashlight. My face felt hot from shame. I was thankful they found me, but after everything, I was not ready to accept his disappointment in my actions. How many times do I need to tell you to stay out of these woods? You could have been killed. Thule snapped, and I found myself becoming defensive. So what? It's not as if anyone would care if I did. I regretted the words the moments they came out. The idea was stuck inside my mind for a while, but until it got spoken out loud, I heard how false those words were. Valak was on all fours, looking like a dog, stressed because his owners were fighting. You do... My only close friend had looked furious over my lack of self-preservation. He turned away, unable to meet my eyes as he added in a lower tone. You do have someone. We stood in the dark woods, unable to speak to each other. Guilt was eating away at my stomach. I... I wanted to say something, but the words wouldn't come naturally. I saw the raccoon come into the woods. I was worried about him. The little guy watched the scene for a bit, satisfied that everyone was alive. He turns tail to head back home. 
I don't know how to deal with you humans. Tuli sat, mostly to himself. Valak, please do me a favor and get Adam home. The beast hesitated. I started to limp off and was stopped by Valak cutting off my path. He nodded his large head and Tuli wordlessly helped lift me onto the wolf's back. His dark fur was long enough for me to hold on to if I lost my balance. I looked down at my friends, not knowing what to say to him. He didn't return my gaze, and simply started to walk further into the woods to continue his job, and Valak started to carry me back home. The wolf knew the way, which was good because I had no clue where I ended up. I silently sat on his back, swaying with his steps, and the trees passed us by. After a few minutes, I started to feel myself get a little angry about how Thule treated me. Reasonably, I shouldn't. My head was cleared up, but I was still sore and wanted to be angry at someone. He didn't need to snap at me, you know. It's his fault I'm even out there. How was I supposed to know that little raccoon was safe in the woods if he barely told me anything? It's not as if that's a question I can think to ask the little guy. The wolf stayed silent as he navigated us through the trees and bushes. I wasn't expecting him to answer. He could understand what I was saying, that much was for sure. I just wanted to vent and didn't have anyone in my life who I could do so with. It's not as if I didn't try and make friends or attempt to listen to Thule's go-get-married advice. The town was so small there was just not a single unmarried woman my age. The only single girls around were in high school. I was not the type of person to date someone so much younger that just thinking about it made my skin crawl. I'd be happy with the, oh, don't worry, Adam, just fighting some bad werewolves, be done this week, how about we hang out after and talk? But no, nothing. In a few short minutes, I was rambling, and Valak found his way back into the trail. We were almost out of the woods and back to the main road. To get back to the cabin, we needed to cut through town. No one would be awake, and I really couldn't explain riding a wolf if someone did spot me. Sighing, I forced myself to let go of my frustration. Sorry, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. I know some of this is unreasonable on my part, and even if you did agree with me, it's not as if you're going to give me advice. What are you going to do? Give me a support, Arf? I sighed again, and looked up at the sky counting stars glittering against the dark backdrop. Being so far away from light pollution made it so the night sky shone clearer and brighter than I'd ever seen it. Valak turned his head slightly. His hidden eyes looked over towards me. Arf. I looked down, my skin prickling. Did... did the werewolf just talk back to me? I was meant to sound supportive. Valak answered in somewhat perfect English. He had some sort of accent that was hard to place. It may be due to how hard it was to speak with rows of sharp teeth in the way. My mouth dropped open a little bit when I heard him. I don't know why I never thought he could reply back. I'd never heard him speak and just assumed he couldn't. Why haven't you ever talked before? I asked, dumbfounded. I am shy, he admitted, turning his head back towards the road. We continued in an awkward silence as I heard his clawed feet make their way down the dirt road and towards town. I wondered if I should apologize for my wrong assumptions when he spoke again. I understand your frustrations. You are only human, after all, he told me and it was very strange hearing words coming from the mouth of a beast. What does that have to do with anything? I asked, a little bit of my bitterness coming back. Please, listen to me for a short while. Valak asked politely, and I settled in for whatever he had to say. That agent may look human, but he is not. He was born and raised in a world different from your own. Us creatures of the night use favors as our currency. Due to this, nothing is free. Our time, our words, and our names all have a price. Not only is he trying to understand how freely you give things to him, 
He is trying to understand the concept of the word friend. We do not have friends. After all, a friend is a person you love and give to freely, is it not? I nodded, agreeing on his definition of a friend, but I didn't understand what he meant by giving Thule things. As far as I could remember, I hadn't really given anything. Half a beer at one point, but nothing more than that. I don't remember giving him a thing, though. Not really. Maybe a nickname, and that's about it. Alec paused, his head turned. I wonder how he saw with his eyes always hidden. A smile crossed his face. It was a little unnerving to be able to see all of his teeth as he spoke. A name. You were the one who gave him a name. How very special. The wolf made a small sound, almost like a laugh, and started to walk again. We started to head down the main street. Passing by the store windows, I saw my reflection in the glass, feeling a bit surreal over being on the back of a massive wolf. With each step, Valak's claws dragged across the sidewalk. I know you're both not human, but how could a nickname really mean that much? What was his name beforehand? 202, was it not? This man, this agent, was a number. Just a creature of many brothers created to do a single job. He does not own anything. His life was gifted to him by his parents. His time was devoted to another. Receiving a name means becoming someone else. He is no longer 202, but rather what you have called him. Having a name and having a friend is an adjustment. I felt my face flush a little and blamed it on the sudden cold breeze. I never would have thought the simple act of giving someone a nickname would be so important. I never wanted to force Thule to change, only to have a more normal life. I was seeing it all from a human angle without considering that he wasn't. Still, he could at least tell me what's going on, I said, still trying to defend my paper-thin defense over getting angry with him. Answers are not free. Not in our world. Information is the second most powerful thing to us. He has not told you anything, in fear that will cost you very dearly. I found myself nodding and understanding. I was being unreasonable, and a werewolf was calling me out on it. What's the most powerful thing, if you don't mind me asking? We were making a good pace back to the cabin because of his long strides. We would be back soon, and I would no longer have someone answering some of my questions and needed to use my time wisely. But this one just slipped out. Love. I was not expecting that answer. I looked down at Valak, never thinking that monsters would even know about the concept, let alone hold it in such high respect. Love? That's a bit surprising. I mean, just based on what sort of creatures I've seen, I wouldn't think they would care about that sort of thing. Love is easy for us, and that is what makes it dangerous. It makes us want to do favors for others because we love them. It makes us easy to be taken advantage of. It destroys the system that works so well for us. For example, I'm taking you home right now instead of doing my other tasks for the night. Again, I was taken aback and felt color coming to my face. I had to be hearing this wrong. There was no way a creature I've barely spoken with was so open about its feelings towards me. I... um... you mean... You can't be. We barely spoke, and I'd never done anything for you. We finally made it back to my dark cabin. I wasn't able to get down on my own, so Valak lined himself up against the wooden porch so I could slide off his back and into the top step with minor pain in my ankle. When I was standing on my feet again, he rose up, no longer in his wolf form, but rather on two legs, looking down at me. Even after his friendly tone and giving me a ride back home, Valak was a bit frightening. Yes, small human. I do love you. 
for the simple fact you did not shun me after you saw my eyes. I looked at him, confused. Why would I? You are human and would not understand. Regardless, they are shameful. He was right. I didn't understand. My ankle was starting to bother me, but I could easily ignore the pain for a while. You're right. I, I don't get it. It's a long, dreadful story. I have time. After everything that happens that night, I did just want to go to bed. But the urge to know more about the monster before me was greater than the need to get washed up and sleep. Valak smiled at my answer, showing off his countless teeth again. It has been said that the father of all our tribes married the sixteen original beasts of this world. We are the descendants of their children. He loved all of his children so dearly and wanted to give them the best of this world. In that age, the night sky shone with so many stars it was almost as if you could not see the blackness of the night. Our first father coveted those lights. He stole them from the sky and placed them in the eyes of his children. However, we became ashamed of the act instead of thankful. When we died, the beauty of our eyes died as well. It is a sin to make such gems able to perish. I listened to his tale patiently, wondering if such a thing was true or not. It sounded like an old fairy tale and pretty far-fetched, but monsters were real. So, who knows? Maybe this story was too. Did that really happen? Or is this a legend that's been passed down? I asked, amused. It is what my family has always told me. Due to that, it became my truth. We have always hidden our eyes, feeling they were a burden of a past sin. This is related to what I am getting at with the agent. His family's truths are his own. You must forgive him for keeping things hidden. It is simply his nature. I thought about all the things I'd learned so far, and how irrational I've been acting because of emotional stress. I would need to apologize to Thule when I saw him next. I was really just butting into his job and covering it up by saying I was worried about him getting hurt. Which I was, but it didn't excuse my actions. Valak let me think and started to dig through a small pouch he attached to one leg. Besides his hood, he didn't wear anything else. It was black and blended into his fur, so I didn't notice it at first. We should have gotten you to a doctor, but I believe your injuries are slight. Here, take this. It can heal you. He placed a small piece of folded paper inside my hands. I looked it over and was about to start opening it when he stopped me. There is a powder inside. Put in some water and drink it when you get into bed. You shall sleep right away, and for at least nine hours, but all your wounds can be healed. My tribe is known for making medicines such as this, and it can be used on humans as well. It can heal injuries, but not illness. He explained. I really shouldn't be taking mystery magic powder from a werewolf, but it was that, or risk going to sleep with a concussion. Valak was my friend, so I could trust him. Any other magic werewolf I would need to be wary of. Thank you for this. I'll uh, try not to cause any more trouble, I said, letting my face drop. Oh, you shall be causing more trouble. It is who you are, I can tell. But we are fine with that. We like who you are. Valak gave me another smile filled with teeth that didn't scare me as much as before. Oh, uh, did you guys leave a note on the door earlier? One asking me to meet you somewhere, maybe? I asked because it was bugging me all day. A note? Oh no. The agent wanted to avoid you until the threat had passed. It was a charm to keep creatures out of your house in case something got through the first barrier. Since it is no longer on your door, I assumed your little creature removed it. He is a hybrid of natural and unnatural. 
He could have entered, but it may have given him a slight shock. It is possible the little creature disliked it and destroyed the charm. That made sense. Thule had a talent for ghosting me for perfectly good reasons, and he would also want the cabin to have extra protection. If the little creature didn't come back to save me, I would be angry at it. And the little guy said there was danger in the woods and rushed off. Did you guys come across something? At this question, Valak looked a little embarrassed. Ah, uh, yes. Well, no. We have not seen any wolves yet, but that does not mean they're not out there. I set up traps. One that hooks around the ankle and hangs the victim from a tree. It makes a loud sound only supernatural creatures can hear, so we know when the trap has been sprung, and we do not wake up the ones in the cabins. The issue was, I set it to only activate when a member of my species stepped on them. I forgot to exclude myself. That is the problem with spells. If you are able to think about the wording, then they become useless. I wanted to laugh, but kept it in. After all my own mistakes, I really couldn't make fun of Valak. I could have drowned in a shallow puddle, and Valak got caught in his own trap. No wonder why Tulia was so frustrated tonight. I let Valak go after taking up far too much of his time. I changed out of my dirty clothing and took what my new friend gave me. A few seconds passed, and I wondered how long it would take for me to get sleepy. Then, I was asleep for the next ten hours. When I woke up, I found my ankle wasn't as sore as I thought it would be. Stiff for oversleeping, but my head was fine and my ankle healed up. I didn't eat much the previous day, so I wanted to make a big breakfast. Opening the fridge, I saw it was yet again vandalized. All the eggs were stolen as I slept. I didn't feel like cooking that much anyway. I could just go into town and get something to eat at the diner. However, when I opened my door, I was greeted by Thule on the other side, hand raised as if he was just about to knock. He took a step back when the door opened, suddenly at a loss for words. How long has he been standing outside my door trying to work up the courage to knock? I'm sorry for snapping at you last night. I should have made sure you got home instead of Valak, he explained, being unable to look in my direction even with sunglasses on. I deserved it, and Valak is pretty nice if he can get past all the teeth. You want to come in? I started to move out of the way to let him inside, but he backed up as if he just came across a dangerous wild animal. Just being able to see inside the cabin was a bit too much for him. No. I'm fine out here. He looked unsure of what to do with his hands. It was the most flustered I'd ever seen him before. Adam, listen. Are you going to keep going into the woods to try and figure out what's going on? No. I lied. I could tell his eyes narrowed at me from behind his glasses. I didn't mean to lie. I honestly wanted to be good and stay out of trouble. But we both knew I just couldn't stay away if a friend was at a risk. Plus, it was so frustrating being in the dark all the time. This is a very important question, one you need to consider very carefully. To add to his serious tone, he removed his sunglasses to stare me down with his dead eyes. I felt a weight start pressing down on my shoulders from the stress of the sudden tense air. Do you want to help? I was taken so back from his question, I didn't answer for a few seconds. What do you mean? As in, help you with your job? I asked, slowly, and he nodded, confirming it. I suddenly started to feel excited. Yes, it would mean risking my life, but I may finally get the answers I was looking for without blindly grasping at straws. Listen. I do not want to put you in danger, but I know you're going to go into the woods anyway, and I would rather be around supervising you if that's the case. I cannot tell you that much of what is going on because it's not your place to know. However, I'll tell you what I'm able to do. 
I was ready the moment he offered, and quickly closed the door behind me. He raised both hands, stopping me from rushing down the stairs. Don't be in such a rush to get into trouble. It worries me. I won't need you until later this evening, so I'll come by again before the sun starts setting. Another reason why I'm asking you for help is because I was lent an item for this job, but I cannot touch it. Humans have no issue, though. I looked at him, puzzled, and wondered what such an object could be. I expected a weapon of some sort. Instead, he pulled out a small wooden box from his jacket pocket. He paused before removing the lid. What was inside made him turn his head away from being unable to keep his eyes on it. It was a simple roll of stiff, stained ribbon, so dark red it almost looked brown. I didn't know why it would make him react the way he was. I only got a few seconds to look. He snapped the lid closed, acting as if the thing was cursed. For all I knew, it could be. That doesn't look too important, I said, holding my hand out to take it from him. Instead, he placed it back into his pocket. It can blind any creature. Touching it hurts like hell, so it should be good defense for you. Valak said he was making you a charm and would be done by nightfall. Because the ribbon is so... vile, I don't want you holding on to it until it's needed. Judging by his reaction, that was true. I wanted to know what made the ribbon so special, but at the same time, if it was something that even made him turn away, the answer may be too much for me. So, what's the plan? Track down some werewolves and send them home? I asked, trying to figure out what exactly the job was. By the time night falls, it will be too late. They need treatments before and after tonight. If they don't, we must kill them. They'll always remain feral and in a state of harvest moon fever. I don't like the idea of being forced to kill them, but for their honor and the sake of saving others they may harm, it must be done. Tracking down and possibly killing two feral werewolves. That part of the job hadn't changed since I asked last, but something was bothering me. Why are they here? Did you ever find out? I assume they're aware of what happens if they're too far from home tonight, so why here? What's worth risking their lives over? Tuli paused and thought over my question. It was something he considered, and yet didn't have an answer for yet. I've been thinking about that this entire time. I haven't been able to find any reason why those two would be here. The whole thing is strange, to say the least. They have no links to this area. I thought back to the hundreds of hours watching crime shows and started to go through the list of questions they normally asked. I'm sure Tuli already had gone through all these questions in his head, but I asked anyway. Who saw them last? That maybe one of their tribe members knows? I offered. Tuli shook his head, trying to stop the line of questioning before it got too far. I don't know who it was that saw them last. I was told they were missing and were spotted here. I haven't spoken with the tribes directly. I took the job and headed over here. Since then, we've found signs and are certain they're still in the area, but haven't been able to track them down. It's easy to stay hidden with magic. Valak is trying his best, but there are two of them, and I'm not good at magic. I use the basic stuff, but I'm mostly called in to do physical damage. Well, uh, Valak did say information's pretty powerful. Is there time to ask about their last known whereabouts? Maybe they told someone they would be here and then be back before nightfall today. This could have been just a huge misunderstanding. I'm not going to dismiss your ideas, but this one is sort of... Valak walked into his own trap. Do you think these two just forget to leave a note before going away for a bit? Tuli stopped, slowly nodding. He realized it was possible that these two wolves just went off and forgot what kind of commotion it would cause. I'll ask Valak to send a note, asking around for any information. I almost felt as if I helped out a little. I really wanted this to be some mistake, and we really didn't have to track down and kill those two. If they were anything like Valak, it felt like a waste. 
On cue, the large wolf appeared from the thin air. Tuli walked off the front step to go over towards him, but I stayed on the porch. He asked Valak if he could send a message out, getting any information about the two missing wolves. He was told it was possible, but the message may not come back until later due to there being some sort of long feast between the tribes set up by the Tribe of Many Tales. Turns out Valak's father was the one who was meant to be the one on this job, but ducked out because of the party. His son was weaker, but good enough. When Thule confirmed that I would be coming along to help, I swore I saw Valak wag his tail a little. Because you'll be the only human in the woods tonight, you'll be a big help. If we don't find them before they go feral, they'll go right for their main food source, which will be humans. The rest are being protected, so they should head straight for us. Valak explained, and it did not make me feel all that great. So, I'm live bait. Thanks for that, I commented back. You're welcome, Valak said, not aware of my sarcasm. Thule did not look very happy about the idea, but it really was the best plan we had. So far, they had no luck tracking down the wolves. I would gladly risk my life if that meant this job went quicker and before anyone else could be hurt. They were about to leave, but Thule stopped himself. He faced me in case I had anything else to add. We'll pick you up later if you don't find them today. Until then, get rested and eat something. Do you have any questions related to the job before we go? I thought for a few seconds. It wasn't related to the job, but I wanted to ask this since he mentioned it. What kind of basic magic can you do? I asked Tuli. I couldn't picture him casting spells. He looked like a guy who trusted firearms, but I'd never seen him with one. With a complete stone face, he did something I never would have seen coming. Making eye contact, he did the sleight of hands that made it appear he was pulling off one thumb and putting it back on again. A very basic trick that would only fool a child. I held back a burst of laughter from him being so serious about it that Valak was on all fours, and he started to walk around the agent totally interested. How? How are you doing that? The wolf's innocent tone made me lose the giggles I held in. Any stress I had the previous few days and the idea of doing a dangerous job disappeared from that one gesture, at least for a little while. The rest of the day was getting ready for the night ahead. I was jittery over the idea of it all and found it hard to eat. I needed to have some strength, so I forced a big meal down. I wanted to get more sleep before we left and found that impossible. I didn't have any weapons, so I just grabbed my last backup flashlight and waited on the front porch for these two to come and get me. When they arrived before sunset, I could tell they yet again didn't find the wolves they had been searching for. I just needed to do one last thing before we left. My raccoon hybrid came out when I set down something for him to eat. Carefully, I started to pet his back, scared he might snap at me. His body felt strange, like a sack of warm fat wrapped in fabric. It was a little unpleasant, but I got over it pretty fast. If I don't come back in a day or so, you can eat everything in the house, okay? But then you need to go find a new place to live. If I don't come back soon, that means I'll never be back. I told the creature, not even sure if he fully understood what I meant. I help, he replied in his little voice. I shook my head. He started to get upset over my refusal. It's too dangerous tonight. Guard the cabin for when I come back. That's your job, okay? But if I don't, you know what to do. It was hard parting from him. So far, he was the only one I needed to tell I was leaving. The townsfolk won't miss me too much if I never came back. They would just assume I packed up with the money my grandfather left me. Tuli and Valak waited for me until I was done saying my goodbyes to my chunky little pet. I had faith in them completing this job, but not in myself. I was human after all. I didn't think I would be much help, if any, tonight. All I could do was try. 
Alec came over to me to give me a charm he said that would protect me from magic. It was a very small fabric bag hung from some rope. It felt important, and I was glad to have it. The woods looked extra threatening as we walked towards the trees. I gripped the new charm in my hand for good luck and felt a small, round object almost like a marble inside. Whatever happens, I would need to get out alive. My family may be glad to be rid of me, but I now have friends who wouldn't. I was going to return home for them. Any courage I had left me the moments we walked into the woods. I pointed my flashlight around, jumpy at any noise I heard. Alec noticed how tense I was and offered to let me hold his hand. I almost took him up on his offer. He walked behind me and Thule walked in front. There were two feral werewolves out somewhere in the woods. I was a tasty meal for them and my bodyguards were fine with me making noise to get their attention. We walked for a while, and I started to feel sick from stress. Shining my flashlight over into the bush, I thought I noticed a dark shape through the trees. There's something over there, I said in a low voice. I don't see or hear anything. Tully was dismissing my concerns, but I didn't even notice his words. The figure I noticed stood up. On all fours, it came charging towards our small group, knocking aside bushes and kicking up dirt. For some reason, Thule and Valak acted slowly. At the last moment, I felt a wrap around my wrist as Valak pulled me aside. Massive jaws came over Thule's arm as the beast tried to shake it off of him. I can't see or hear us. Adam, is this a wolf we're looking for? Valak placed himself between me and the creature. On all fours, he stood ready to protect me if the feral beast came in our direction. One of them, I answered back, my hand shaking from fear. I looked over to the creature that still had my friend caught in its sharp teeth. Instead of a hood, it had strips of torn fabric wrapped over its eyes. Countless scars covered the wolf's body, and it was missing an ear. The thing was practically foaming at the mouth as it thrashed my friend around like a rag doll. Charms around the wolf's neck glimmered in my weak flashlight. My hand flew to the necklace charm Valak gave me. He said it protected me from magic. Could those charms make it so Valak and Thule couldn't see the creature? Thule gained back the lead in the fight. He couldn't see what was biting him, but he didn't need to. He slammed a kick into the creature's stomach. The force was so intense, I felt a wind come from the impact, and the feral creature spat out his arm. His arm was now free, but it looked as if it was barely hanging on. Through the pain, he was focused on the beast before him. Blood poured from his wounds, soaking the dirt below him. Soaking his good hand, he splashed blood over the creature that was still trying to recover from the blow. See it? Valak ran out in front of me, and Thule jumped backwards to let the wolf take his spot. In one swift movement, Valak took a small flask from the pouch on his leg and took a swig of it. As the feral wolf charged, Valak spit the liquid forward that turned into a stream of fire when it hit the air. I raised my arms, trying to protect my face from the sudden burst of heat. I coughed, smelling the forest burning around us. The feral creature shook off the flames with a loud growl from deep within its chest. Judging from how poorly Valak avoided the next attack, he no longer could see the beast. He took a long cut along his side from the claws of the other wolf. For some reason, I was the only one who could see the wolf clearly. Valak could guess at where it was based on how he was attacked. His cuts healed quickly if they weren't very deep. He jumped around, trying to stay out of reach of invisible claws. The creature had no thoughts behind his actions. At least he could outsmart it. Reaching into his seemingly endless pouch, Valak pulled out slips of papers with symbols written on them. When the wolf attacked, he slapped the papers on the beast. They burned up, and I expected some sort of reaction besides that. Agent, switch with me. My magic is not working. Thule's arm still looked terrible, but he quickly switched places with Valak. My heart felt as if it was in my throat as I watched the wolf turn on the smaller agent. 
He landed another powerful kick that made the beast howl in pain, but then double down to attack in pure rage. Valley, the wolf is wearing necklaces, I said when my friend was close enough to hear. Uh, could that be? Those terrible jaws nearly closed over Thule's neck. He sensed the movements of the air around him and got out of the way at the last second, but he wasn't looking good. The front of his shirt was torn and bloody. He was holding his injured shoulder as it very slowly healed. I needed to do something, or else this fight would not end in our favor. If the second wolf showed up, one of us would be killed. While Valak's attention was drawn away from me, I reached into my pockets to pull out the wooden box that held the rolled-up ribbon. I didn't know how to use it besides the fact that creatures felt pain by touching it. I ran forward into the fight, and I heard a choked sound coming from Valak, knowing he didn't have time to stop me. I jumped onto the feral wolf's back with the ribbon in my hand. My plan was to wrap it around its jaws, hoping it would help. As I was being shaken off the beast's back, I knew I wouldn't get that far. So, I reached out, grabbing a hold of the necklaces just as the wolf reached a hand over its shoulder and grabbed me by my jacket. It tossed me aside, and I flew hard into a tree. I took the necklace with me. But the impact was so painful, I didn't remember much after I heard a cracking sound coming from my arm. The theory was correct. When the charms came off, Thule and Valak could see the beast. My head swam with pain as I was unable to sit up. From the ground, I watched Thule pummel the feral wolf with kick after a devastating kick. So many, I could barely keep up with his movements. Valak was off doing something else I couldn't see from my angle. Finally, I heard his voice. Oh, I'm ready. He shouted and tossed a glass vial over to Thule. I had to have heard Valak wrong. Did he say bomb? Why would he make one of those? Why did he know how to make one? Suddenly, my pain didn't matter when I saw Thule's arm disappear inside the feral beast's mouth. At first, I thought he ate it. Then, I realized Thule shoved it down its throat while holding whatever Valak tossed to him. When Thule pulled his arm free, something happened I didn't expect. I could handle caterpillar monsters and werewolves, but not seeing one of those monsters explode. The beast stopped for a half a second before it was just gone in an explosion of silver dust. Thule was knocked back and Valak covered his face, trying to keep the dust from getting into his lungs. Thule was coughing because he had been so close when the wolf turned into the dust and he breathed so much in. I stood for a moment before my battered body collapsed back to the ground. Valak was by my side, looking over how badly I was hurt. I felt terrible, and I knew my arm was broken, but I wasn't as bad as either of them. Valak's body was covered in deep gashes that looked to be healing. Thule was taking his time, sitting back up from being knocked off his feet from the silver explosion. How his arm was still attached was beyond me. That... it exploded, I stammered. Valak, kill Adam so I can kick his ass for jumping on a feral werewolf. Tully was still on the ground, coughing between his words. He almost sounded like he was joking. Almost. Carefully, Valak took my broken arm in one hand to see how bad it was. No bones through the skin, but it felt as if the entire thing had been ripped off. Nearly all my medicines are too powerful for humans. I could give you more of the powder from before, but you would be asleep for two days to heal this. Or... I did not like that last word. I would not like the second option, but it was the only choice if I wanted to stay helping these two find the second feral wolf. Tully sat up to come over to us, bloody and bruised, but his wounds were slowly closing up. It didn't even look as if he was in that much pain. My heart sank as I thought of how often he got this hurt in the line of work for him to be so adjusted to such ghastly injuries. I could barely keep it together from a broken arm. I have this. It can heal you in a few minutes, but it comes at a cost. And I only have enough for one dose. Malik held up another glass vial in his massive clawed hand. It made the vial look extra small. 
It was filled with a liquid that looked very much like blood. My choices were to pack it up and go home, or suffer through whatever the cure would be. I'll take it. Those words did come at a cost. Valak needed to set my arm so it would heal properly before I drank whatever was in the vial. He tore off strips of Tully's shirt, who looked offended over the action, to brace my arm with straight sticks he found. I was told I could scream as much as I wanted, but needed to remain as still as possible, and to bite down on a stick just so I wouldn't bite my tongue off. I was not at all happy with my choice to stay, but I did everything they told me. Drinking down the awful-tasting liquid, the stick was placed in my mouth, and both of them grabbed a hold of me to make sure I would stay still. It started with heat coming from the injured arm, then a pain that felt as if every nerve ending was on fire. I screamed with my teeth clamped down on the stick. Both of them were not human and stronger than me, but I still fought, trying to get out of their grasp. My body wanted to move. I wanted to get away from the pain and the heat that came with it. I thought I heard my bones snap and mend together, but knew that was impossible. The entire awful experience felt like hours. It was really only a few minutes. When the pain and heat died down, Valak let me sit against a tree, completely exhausted and starving. I've never been so hungry in my entire life. Valak knew this would happen and brought out a bag of dried berries mixed with small bits of jerky. The bag looked too big to fit inside his pouch, but at that moment I didn't much care about where it came from. I'm not finished healing yet, so take a break. We'll find the next werewolf once you're recovered more. Tully said. Valak had fixed his clothes, making them look new. But I could still see scratches and cuts over the Asian's face. At least I wasn't slowing them down that much. Both of them needed a bit of a break after the fight. Valak looked over the necklaces I'd pulled off the werewolf, trying to figure out what magic they held. They looked to be made of bone and other animal parts. It's kind of grossed me out that I touched them. What did you give me? To heal me, I mean? I asked, between shoving Valak's trail mix into my mouth, so hungry I wasn't tasting it. Vampire blocked, Tully explained, without a hint of sarcasm. He did admit they were real, but I thought he was joking back then. He noticed how interested I was, and went on. It essentially burns up your body fats, then muscle for energy to heal. It can't heal back missing limbs, however, but with enough fat to burn, you could heal a few broken bones. There is a risk if you don't have enough to use. The blood basically starves you to death, trying to make your body recover. I was very glad Valak thought I had enough to bring some snacks. Looking over my now healed arm, I noticed it did look a bit thinner. That terrible burning pain was my body fat being eaten up. In the past few months, I hadn't been eating as well as I should. It gave me enough fat to work with, and I was a little embarrassed both of them had looked me over to decide if I had enough fat on me to risk using the blood. Valak spoke up and distracted me from my thoughts. I am confused over these charms. I believe the one is to hide the wearer from supernatural creatures' senses. Adam is human, so he was able to see the wolf when we could not. The other is to protect the wearer from magic. The issue is, their tribe is not known to make these. The tribe of the moon makes weapons, not charms. Balak destroyed the necklace I'd stolen off the creature. It was worth the risk. The second wolf would be bound to have the same type of items. I'd eaten through the bag of snacks and started towards the ribbon I'd dropped. Neither of them could touch it, and I was too tired to get it until that moment. As I rolled it back up to place inside the box, I felt as if the thing was useless. I just wasn't strong enough to use it to bind a creature. When I turned back to them, a blurry figure behind Thule made me nearly drop the ribbon. I shouted out a warning, and he swiftly kicked whatever was behind him. I heard another crack of impact. I couldn't really see what was there aside from a vague human shape in the dark. The shape caught Thule's kick against one arm and raised the other with an envelope in a blurry hand. 
I have mail for him, Mr. Valak, came an uneven voice from the figure. Thule lowered his legs, no longer looking as if there was a threat. Valak took the envelope, and the agent came over to me to explain what I'd just seen. It's just a mailman. We did ask for information about those two feral wolves, and it's just getting back to us now. Normally, humans can't see them, but you've come across so many supernatural creatures, your eyes are adjusting. Uh, mail? Uh, don't you have spells for that sort of thing? Yes, but spells can be worked around. When you're using a spell to receive information, your body is like a computer. You risk someone hacking your connection right to your body, and it can get pretty ugly. Having information delivered is slower, but safer. As Tully explained the system to me, Valak spoke with the figure. He apologized for them suddenly attacking it, and thanked him for the mail. I thought I saw him slip the figure a small tip, because he felt guilty Tully nearly took the figure's head off. Valak wasted no time ripping open the envelope to read the note as the mailman left us behind. I didn't think there was time for this. We could be attacked at any second, but I was told information is power in their world. Whatever was in that letter could be important. I don't understand this. Tuli, help me. Valak admitted defeat in a few seconds. Is the information strange? Tuli walked over, and I joined them to look over their shoulders at the chicken scratch language on the paper. Maybe. My uncle has such bad handwriting I can't read this. How on earth did Valak's tribe survive for this long? He was friendly and a good person, but had his moments. Tuli looked at his freshly repaired jacket pocket to pull out a pair of reading glasses to replace his sunglasses. I felt a flutter of excitement in my stomach at the sight of them. I finally had something I could tease him with, but not in the middle of a job and when a feral werewolf could come at us at any second. They didn't want me to hear what the notes said because they started to exchange confused words in a language I didn't know. I was a little offended by it and spoke up. Knowing they wouldn't even have this information if I didn't suggest it, they let me in on what they found out. Apparently, those two wolves were last seen with the leader of the Beast of Many Tales tribe. Tuli started. Isn't that the tribe they threw that big feast all the wolves are in now? And the same tribe that makes those charms? I offered. Tuli and Valak looked at each other and nodded at my questions. What do you know about this tribe's leader? His name starts with a B, right? Didn't he lose an arm recently? Tuli asked, searching his memory for what he knew. Oh, yes. That was the old leader. He married a human. An animal doctor, I think. The new leader took over, but did something so terrible... His name has been removed from the world, but the tribe is unable to replace him right now. So, he is nameless, and yet still the leader. But I cannot think of why he would see, or even bring, two members of the Moon tribe over here. For what purpose are they here? Valak said, while looking at the notes, as if it could tell him all the answers he wanted. For a distraction, maybe. I spoke up. They both looked at me, waiting for an elaboration. Uh, well, uh, maybe he was angry at his tribe for removing his name, and knew what revenge he wanted to take would bring attention to tribes or agents. So he's, well, made you guys go in a wild goose chase, keeping your attention on two wolves instead of himself. Uh, oh, and there is something on the back of your note. Val quickly flips the paper over to see some more writing. They both read it over quickly, and their heads shot up in surprise over what they just saw. This time, they didn't try to hide it. The tribe leader bought a human girl. Alex said, confused over the fact. Uh, that doesn't sound good. Is there any, like, uh, curses here? Uh, I don't know, that needs virgin blood for? This idea sounded pretty mundane when it came to magic rituals. I wasn't expecting Tuli's face to go pale in the dark. Valak let out a gasp and took a step back as if he just witnessed a train wreck and yet couldn't believe the horrors of what he was seeing. 
They both clued into something terrible I didn't know about, and almost didn't want the answer. You don't think he would go so far as to commit a Harvest Moon ritual? And the Harvest Moon fever wolves were just being used? Alec asked in a low voice that sounded as if he was begging Thule to say he was wrong. It fits what we learned. The land here helps rituals and spells stick, so it makes sense why he would come here to do it, and why he would use two moon wolves as a distraction, Thule said, as he started to fold the note to put it away with his reading glasses. Valak, please go on ahead a little to see if you can find the other wolf. I'll tell Adam what our theory is. Valak looked as if he would be sick. Getting back down to all fours, he walked away. Tail and ears drooped. I felt bad over mentioning the sacrifice idea. Whatever theory we stumbled into, it greatly upset the both of them. Let's walk as I explain this. I followed close behind Thule, and we walked through the dark and silent woods. He didn't look as if he could face me as he spoke. His voice low as if he feared another person would hear what he was saying. For creatures of the night, like Valak's tribe, virgin flesh and blood is heavily sought after. It's more powerful than other flesh and blood. Don't ask me what it is. It's just how it works. The virgin blood sacrifice is popular because you can take blood without the risk of the human dying. Having them alive to give more blood a second time is easier than finding another virgin. Sometimes, the tribes that are friendly with humans offer to buy their blood. Buying their entire body is so very rare because it's seen as a crime to kill a virgin for a spell or ritual. And a Harvest Moon ritual is much worse than that. He stopped walking to look over his shoulder to ensure I was still following. Whatever this ritual was, it was so forbidden in his world that neither of them even dared to consider someone would go through with it until I brought up the train of thought. It's not even a ritual. It's a violent assault on a virgin on the night of a harvest moon. That's it. Something so simple that will make the one committing such a terrible act become a hundred times more powerful. And yet... Not even monsters will go through with this, due to how unforgivable taking away innocence in such a violent manner truly is. His tone was deadly serious with me. He was darting around using the one word that would describe this action, and I was alright with that. I already felt sick thinking about what that poor girl might go through tonight, that it may even be too late to save her. That's... I started but unable to find the words to describe how awful it really was. I can only hope our theory is wrong. It does fit what we learned so far. If we are right, and this is what the tribe leader has planned, we still have a chance to save her. Even if he finishes the ritual, the victim doesn't always die. Valak's mother was a victim of a Harvest Moon ritual. His biological father was torn to pieces by the tribe when they found out. His mother disappeared shortly after. Valak is shunned due to his start in life, aside from his adopted father, who is kind but stupid. I'm not saying that to be cruel. He's just too dim to understand why anyone would care about another's past. I understood why Valak was so nice to me. His tribe shunned him for something he couldn't control. Aside from one person in his life, he was used to others treating him poorly for just him being alive. The fact I brought him food and saw him as an equal was enough for us to be good friends. He looked so horrified at the idea of the ritual happening again because he feared another person would go through the trauma his mother did. Adam, if you didn't start questioning the reason why these two wolves are here... We never would have learned what we did. My job is to only track down the two wolves as requested. Information isn't free, so Valak would have never thought to ask. If we are able to save this girl, it's because you're here. I felt my face flush a little in the dark. I didn't feel as if I helped at all. 
Asking questions just felt natural, even if I was being a bit too nosy. I kept getting reminded that Valak and Thule weren't human. What felt like common sense was something they may never think of. I didn't have an answer for him, so I just shyly nodded, feeling embarrassed from receiving any sort of praise. Uh, well, uh, let's track down the last werewolf so we can focus on finding that girl, I replied. I started to walk forward, only to get off on the wrong foot. I tripped, and Thule caught my hand to keep me steady. As we walked, I followed behind him, his hand still in mine, in case I tripped again. Like asking all those nosy questions, it just felt natural. When we walked up to Valak, he and Thule spoke in hushed tones in the language they used before. It sounded as if he was just catching up with the wolf on his theory, but it sounded as if they had a brief argument over something I was unaware of. Thule seems to have won, but Valak got in some last words in English. The battle before us shall be a hard one. You should not hesitate in revealing your true face, or else you will die. It was the most bitter I've ever heard Valak speak before. For once, his tone matched his features. Thule remained as silent as the grave. Something happens between them, and neither were going to tell me. I already had so many questions answered that night I shouldn't get greedy. But it didn't feel right to have those two suddenly act so coldly to each other when in the last fights they worked so well together. Thule did not address the topic that made them act so tense. He shifted the conversation on to finding the last feral werewolf. Is there a spell you can use to bring it over here? He asked Valak to get down to business. No, but I can create one. Adam, I shall need a drop of your blood. Come over here. The next few minutes, Valak started to break down the process of how magic and spells worked. A lot of it was lost on me. I understood that supernatural creatures had an energy source within themselves they could use to create or use spells. They also drew on that source to automatically heal from certain injuries. Spells were simple. First, he drew a circle in the dirt. It held the power for the spell. Then, riding around the circle, told the magic what it should do. He cut my finger with a sharp claw, so a few drops of blood stained the dirt in the middle of the circle. Apparently, someone with magic could create any kind of spell as long as they held enough power and intention to do so. The one Valak just made amplified the smell of my blood, so if the feral werewolf was anywhere within a hundred miles of us, it would come looking for the source. Thankfully, Valak also made it so the ones present when the spell was made would not be affected by it, so we didn't suffer with the overpowering smell while trying to fight. How Valak could think of these things on the fly and yet be amazed by a simple thumb trick was beyond me. His spell worked. It was clear just how well it worked when a force of nature itself came tearing through the woods towards us. The thing was three times the size as Valak. My wolf friends took over protecting me as the other dark beast came barreling towards us. It let out a snarling howl and tore the trees in its way right out of the ground. This thing possessed far more raw power than the first one. Nothing covered its eyes, showing cloudy and yet still glowing rubies. They held some beauty, but were tainted from the rage that overtook the wolf. If I got in the middle of this fight, I was not coming out alive. Unless my friends had some sort of secret weapon up their sleeves, then they might not survive this either. Broken chains dangled from the beast's arms, explaining why it did not come for us sooner. In a blind rage, it slammed massive claws into the ground, hard enough to make Thule stumble, even though he dodged the blow. Thule and Valak could only move out of the way of the deadly claws. Valak had his hands full, trying to keep me safe, and was unable to hit the feral wolf with any magic or spells. If even a single one of those blows hit any of us, we were dead. Simple as that. Watching my friends struggle to stay alive, I knew this outcome was my fault. I should have left after the second fight and had no reason being there. Even after answering so many of my questions, Thule was still hiding something from me. He was asked to do this job because he had the power to finish it. He was not using that power because that meant fully revealing what he was to a human. 
I guessed that was what he and Valak had a little spat about. He was risking his life because he was afraid I wouldn't be able to handle his true face. Valak tossed me aside in time. The feral wolf caught him in his tail, and I saw my friend get tossed aside. Valak's body flew, slamming into a tree hard enough to lift it from the ground, the wood groaning and roots exposed. Here I was, only armed with a ribbon, while my two friends fought against such a fearsome creature. I watched in horror as glowing ruby eyes looked over to Tule. He gave me a worried look as if I was the one in the crossfire. I thought I saw the scars along his face move ever so slightly in the dark. The monster charged, and he raised his arms in a poor defense. I was helpless and could only watch my friends get torn to pieces. Just before those deadly jaws closed on Tuli's arms, I heard a noise behind me. It came up too fast to see what it was before it appeared. A shape I recognized and had been in my nightmares for months came tearing through the woods. Countless arms uprooted trees as it tossed them aside. Grabbing the feral wolf in some of its arms, it tossed the beast aside, leaving me and Tuli to look on in shock at our rescuer. Hans, I blurted out. The monster looked over at me, pale, white face being taken up by an amused smile. The wolf recovered and came straight for Hans, who was much larger than it. He took it by the scruff of the neck and started to slam it against the ground and trees so violently the sound of breaking bones nearly made me sick. The attack only lasted seconds. Hans easily killed the feral monster both Tuli and Valak had so much trouble with. Once the wolf stopped moving, Hans dropped the body to the ground, looking uninterested. He curled his long body and tucked him in his many arms, the fabric-like texture along his body shining in the dim moonlight. Hans, why would you save me? Tully asked, sounding as confused as I felt. For two simple and devastating facts, the creature answered. A smile so wide on his face, his eyes were barely open. You're my brother, and I love you. I looked between the two of them, again feeling it to be impossible that they were related at first. The more I looked, the more it seemed like Hans was an older brother, coming in to save his younger one from a bully. It was almost touching, aside from the fact Hans was a nightmare that ate humans to have that many arms. I cannot do more for you. Our debts are cleared. In the future, do not hesitate to reveal your true face, little brother. What does the human call you? Truly. Hans elongated my friend's name as if he found it amusing. Truly didn't look offended, but rather a little emotional that his new name was spoken by a member of his family. Have more pride in being a child of our lord, no matter how much you hate our parents. Now go on. You have a job to do. Do not disappoint me. Hans curled his body around Tuli as he spoke. After finishing giving advice, he started to come towards me and away from the scene he saved us from. Just as he was about to pass by me, he dropped his voice down to a whisper. I'm rooting for you, human. Hans said softly, with an honest-to-God wink. I didn't know what he meant by that. We watched as Hans left us all safe, but with some unanswered questions. Out of all the people to come and save us, I never would have guessed Hans would lend one of his many hands. He's right. We need to go, Tuli said, while looking for Valak. My wolf friend looked just as shocked over the outcome, but not as injured as I feared. He walked over on all fours, and Tuli lifted me onto the wolf's back, because I still couldn't jump up on my own. I don't want you to be a part of this, Tuli admitted. It's too dangerous. I think the tribe leader knows that we finished off the other two wolves. I couldn't tell where he was before, but now it's almost impossible not to sense his location. I fear he's already finished the ritual, and no longer needs to hide. All the more reason for you to go home. 
I would never forgive myself if I didn't try to help, I replied, honestly. I knew I was pretty much powerless and hindering them. I also knew there was a beast out in the woods that could be hurting an innocent person as we spoke. If my friends and that person died while I stayed safe at home, well, I didn't know how I would handle that. I was scared I would die that night, but felt it was worth it if I could make any kind of difference. Any sign of trouble you can't handle, and Valak will get you out of here, Tully told me, and I felt like that wasn't true. I had an understanding with the wolf. He may care for me, but he would respect my choices. I nodded in a lie, and Tully started off first. His run started out at a normal speed, but soon enough, not even Valak on all fours could keep up with him. I heard him in front of us, but didn't see him in the dark. I felt my stomach twist in stress as I gripped onto Valak's fur, holding on for dear life, trying not to be flung off. If it hurt him, he never complained. Suddenly, he slowed to a stop. I didn't see any creatures or danger and wondered why we weren't still moving. We shall catch up in a moment. This is serious, and I cannot risk truly overhearing what I am about to ask of you. Valak told me in the coldest tone I've ever heard from him. I swallowed my nervousness and listened. Please save Tuli's life. Valak said in a low voice. I didn't understand what he meant. I would do whatever I could to help without being asked. Because he did, I felt as if he had a good reason. Why do you think he's going to die? My voice was shaking when I spoke. This ritual the tribe leader is about to perform is vile. If he completes it, he shall no longer be a creature of the night, not a beast or human, something below even that. If Tuli fights him on equal terms, it would mean he's recognizing the tribal leader as a creature like himself. He refuses to give him that respect. The agent shall fight in his weaker human form. If he defeats the leader on those terms, there is no greater disrespect. That's an if? He's going after something that's doing a ritual to gain crazy power without using all of his own. Can't you talk him out of it? I begged, feeling a little dizzy at the thoughts of a friend going into a useless battle. He has requested that I do not help. Using magic would be the same as giving it respect. I can only fight after he passes away. I am honoring this, because he is my friend, and I care for him. I tightened my grip on Valak's dark fur, and he didn't react. My hands trembling, unable to steady them. That's stupid. If you care about him, you shouldn't be doing what he asked. My voice was full of tears that threatened to overtake me. It is because I respect him I am doing this. I am also carrying you on my back, after all. Valak replied, and his voice sounded as hoarse as my own. We'd only known each other for a short time, but he already considered me a friend. He was suffering by watching two people he cared about rushing into a dangerous situation. I was human, and so powerless, and yet I was in those woods with him. I couldn't be angry at Tuli, because I was doing the same thing. I'm sorry, I told the wolf, and meant it. Let us catch up. Perhaps our luck shall hold, and the ritual has not been completed. I wanted nothing else in the world more for that to be the case. Our luck did not hold. When Valak arrived into the clearing, we came into a dreadful sight. Tuli arrived first a snarl on his face towards the creature in the middle of the space. Large boulders have been placed and crudely carved into a throne of sorts. In the middle was a girl barely out of her teenhood. She was covered with a ragged blanket draped over top of her body. Face bloody and bruised. Blood stained the stones around her. It took all my willpower to keep my small dinner in my stomach. I knew what happened to her. Her eyes closed, 
and I couldn't tell if she was dead or not. The monster that stood in the clearing and turned to face us was massive. It towered over us and blocked out the moonlight. It looked a little like Valak when he stood on two legs, large body covered in jewelry and trinkets. Ten tails sprouted from behind him, and they moved as if underwater. Unlike Valak, he did not cover his eyes. For good reason. He turned blacker than the night. Deadly jaws curled up in a cruel smile as he looked at us. He already completed the ritual, and was looking at the three creatures that dwarfed him in every way. Valak, the girl is still alive. Get her out of here. Tully said in a harsh tone, but his anger wasn't directed towards us. On it. I slipped down from Valak's back and stumbled a little, my hand going for the ribbon box waiting to see what I could do to help. It felt like I couldn't do anything. The monster let Valak run on all fours to the girl and took her in his arms as he shifted forms. Just like that, they were gone. I tasted so many bitter emotions knowing we arrived too late, and the tribe leader only let Valak take the girl because he was finished with her. Oh, what an honor. An agent's come to take me down. A harvestman, no less. The beast sat in utter glee, every tooth in his mouth exposed as he spoke. I cannot wait to try out this new power on you. Reaching a clawed arm towards us, Thule took off running to get the monster's attention away from me. His form is a blur to my human eyes. I gasped as I watched him leap up and deliver such a powerful kick to the monster's arm, I felt a shockwave from where I was standing. Thule backed off to look over the damage he just inflicted. The force was enough to smash the trinkets and jewelry the tribe leader wore. The ruined arm snapped back into place as the monster chuckled at the efforts. You were gonna need to do better than that. Instead of being hurt in the slightest, the wolf sounded pleased, as if he loved the idea of fighting. I was new at watching two creatures duke it out, but I felt as if Thule really couldn't win this if he carried on the way he was. Deep down, I knew that kick was all the power his human body could manage. He would need to do what Hans told him. I didn't know what it meant by Thule showing his true face, but I wanted him to disregard his sense of honor and fight with everything he had in him. I couldn't even shout over to him to try and talk him out of this crazy nonsense before he charged at the monster again, delivering kicks that would be deadly to anything else. Some of the shock waves were so intense that they hurt my chest. The tribe leader's body recovered before Thule landed another attack, making it all seem so hopeless. The beast moved out of the way while laughing, even though he didn't appear to be taking any real damage, so didn't have a reason to dodge. Thule's long, black-clad leg came down on the stone throne that such a horrible act occurred on and cracked the main boulder in half. How could this monster stand after being hit from so many attacks that powerful? And what could I do to help, armed with a simple ribbon? Thule could not get out of the way in time as a massive hand wrapped around his chest in a vice. He thrashed in vain, trying to get free. Enough of your pitiful attempts. Reveal your face for me. Fight. Fight like the creature you are, Harvestman. The wolf bellowed down, raising Thule off the ground. I could do nothing but watch as it reached a pair of fingers towards my friend's face. Tully leaned back as far as possible, but couldn't stop what was coming. The razor-sharp claws dug into his left eye as he clamped his mouth shut in order not to scream. Those two long nails started to open inside his eye socket as if trying to stretch it. Red bloods poured down his face, only to be replaced by black, inky liquid. Show me your face. Let me see why agents are so feared. The tribe leader never lost the giddiness in his voice as he tried prying open Thule's face through his eye socket. Past the gore and the black blood, I saw something. A hint of a different face under the torn flesh. Something no words could describe properly. A part of a face as handsome as it was frightening. 
At this rate, Chuli would either die or have his entire human mask ripped off. I took a huge risk to save my friend. I was so beneath the wolf's notice that I could run over without him looking over at me. I was unaware of how the ribbon worked and hoped my crazy idea would pan out. I tossed it over the wrist of the arm still grabbing Chuli. Grabbing the ribbon by both ends, I pulled with all my might, hoping the ribbon touching the tribe leader's fur would have a negative reaction. Somehow, it worked. The beast let out a surprised yelp and dropped Tuli to the ground. I stumbled as the ribbon slipped off the beast's wrist and the powerful wolf took a few steps back from us. Tuli kept a hand over his bleeding eye and the rest of his ruined face healed rapidly so I could no longer see any hints of whatever was hidden away. You do not deserve any honor. Tuli snapped at the creature. He dropped his hand, his eye closed and flesh around it badly wounded. I met his gaze and we both knew exactly what to do to defeat a monster that was out of our league. Where the ribbon touched on the beast smoked and it looked as if such a small wound caused the wolf too much pain to move. Tuli dashed over to the end of the long ribbon and grabbed it with his bare hand that also started to smoke. He fought through the pain. Jumping and dodging the wolf's slowed movements, he looped the ribbon around the beast's neck as I held on to the other end. Claws came up to try and pry it off. Those nails could not cut him free. For the first time, the beast looked scared. Tuli came back beside me. I took the other end of the ribbon from his injured hand. Now, with both ends, I pulled. The dark, stained ribbon tightened on a thick-furred neck. It was too late for the beast to swat me away or kill me. It frantically clawed at its neck, trying to save itself. It started to take a few steps back to pull me off my feet, hoping I would let go of his noose. Tuli grabbed my wrists and planted his feet to the ground. Together, we pulled as hard as we could. The thick fabric looked as if it would snap at any moment. As the beast started to lose ground, it fought harder than before. It was trying to fight for his life, after all. My arms felt like they were about to break, and the ribbon dug into my hands deep enough to cut them. I'd wrapped it around them a few times, so I would not let go. Tuli couldn't keep us from sliding forwards. We both used all our strength, straining against such a powerful force. We are not going to lose any more ground. Tuli was behind me, and I felt his breath on my neck as we spoke. Knowing the end was near, the monster decided to attempt one last attack. Opening his mouth, I saw a faint light starting to appear from the closing throat. I knew whatever was going to happen was going to be bad. I was risking our lives to keep pulling before the attack came at us. I refused to stand down. Only a little bit more effort and we would win. Just another second, I backed, arms burning in pain. I bet on that one second before the attack came and lost. A blinding light came from the tribe leader's mouth directly towards us. Where it touched, fire sprouted. I felt the heat and thanked my luck that at least I would have a quick death, but regretted I couldn't save my friend. However, the burning light did not touch us. The small bag charm Valak had given me strained against the cord around my neck. The bag burned away, and inside was the most beautiful pearl I've ever seen. It trembled and cracked, burning up in seconds just as the light faded, leaving small fires around us and the ground smoldering. I'd seen that pearl before. Valak gave me his eye, and it protected us. I now understood his shame for having such precious-looking eyes. It hurt me so deeply, knowing something such as that was sacrificed for my life. Nothing with such beauty should be destroyed. The tribe leader looked spent. Smoke poured from where his noose touched, but we were also on the end of our ropes. Both of us gave everything our bodies could handle to win one step back. I felt sweat pour from my face, and I didn't know how long I would be able to stand the pain. Just as I thought we were about to give in, two large furred arms wrapped around both me and Tuli. We were crushed together, and the claws started to pull us back. Valak arrived to give us the last bit of strength needed. 
The wolf looked at us through the smoke with a hint of regret. I thought that the ribbon would cut off his air supply. I never expected we would cause such gruesome death to this creature. His arms dropped, and the ribbon tightened one last time. We all stumbled back into each other as the beast's head came clean off. The head rolled off to the ground, with the body following a few seconds after. All of us in a pile, we sat stunned at what we accomplished. The ribbon dug so tightly into my hands even after I let it go, it was struck in my palms. It took a long time before I turned around to face my two friends, all still on the ground, too exhausted to stand up. Val... Valak... Your eye, I said, not knowing what else to start off with. It was well worth it. I still felt a little ashamed. No matter how much they assured me, I would always feel guilty both of my friends lost an eye that night. Thule sat, facing me, his damaged one still closed and black blood covering half his face. What about the girl? Is she all right? I asked, praying for good news. No, but she's alive. Valak admitted. Tully looked as angry at himself as I felt. He cast his gaze downwards, trying to calm himself. I started to pull the ribbon from out of my hand with shaky fingers. It hurts like hell, but we all made it out, still breathing, and that was a small victory. Reaching out... Thule took my hands to look them over, injured palms facing up, the back of my hands in his. I felt some of the bitterness fade. I looked him over, knowing we both felt the same thing. Not being able to forgive ourselves for arriving too late, but also glad that each other was alive. For once, I didn't have anything to ask him. Sitting, facing each other, we didn't need any words at that moment. Movement from behind him caught my eye. Valak made claws and two fists and was bumping the side of his thumbs together. I couldn't decipher what he was trying to get at. Before I had any clue what he was miming, I heard a voice as someone walked into the smoldering clearing. I hope I'm not late. I'm here to pick up the ribbon I lent. The newcomer was tall, looking no older than twenty. White, wavy hair was cut just above his ears and yet his bangs nearly covered his red eyes. His smile looked so kind I almost didn't question who he was and why Valak and Thule looked so panicked when he arrived. He was cheerful at first, then his smile turned strained and he froze, seeing the headless body. Excuse me, he told us with a cheerful tone. He walked behind a tree and I heard retching sounds. Seeing a decapitated corpse was too much for such a kind soul such as himself. Um, who is that? I asked, looking from between where I heard the puking sounds and to my friends. He's... it's hard to explain in a simple way, but he's the most powerful creature. Pretty much our god. Tully explains, looking extremely nervous. What? It was hard to blame me for that reaction from what I just witnessed. The guy losing his dinner in the bushes was even more powerful than the monster we fought, and the frightening creature that was Thule's parent. When he came out from the bushes, eyes red with tears, Valak darted to him to fuss over the newcomer. I'll take the head back to the tribe. They shall want their leader back and decide to kill him, or if this state is what he deserves. Valak spoke, sounding stressed. I looked over at the body of the monster and the lifeless-looking head. I simply could not believe it was still alive after all of this. These creatures were tough. At least it didn't look to be in any state to harm anyone again. Valak started to draw a circle in the smoking ground around the fallen beast. The white-haired man started to roll up the ribbon, having no issue touching it. He followed it over to us, and it looked like he was on the verge of tears. He looked down on us. Tully froze in place from fear from just being looked at. Oh, you're human. You're so brave. The newcomer dropped down to his knees to take my hands into his own, and his voice sounded watery. You must be so scared. 
I'm sorry I couldn't step in and help. You followed all the rules, and... And that poor girl... I found myself wanting to comfort him, and then realized my hands were no longer in pain. When he let go of them to rub his eyes, I saw they were fully healed, aside from some new scars. Cautious. You can't just... How many times have we told you? You can't heal people like that. It's not your job. When Tully scolded him, his eyes started to water again. It felt like my friend was bullying this poor man. Suddenly, he slapped out a hand and hit Tully over his injured eye. I let out a snort when the agent angrily hissed and placed a hand over where he was just slapped. I just told you not to heal anyone. Tully snapped again. When he lowered his hand, his face was perfectly fine. Oops, uh, it was an accident. I slapped a bug. Came an innocent reply. You can't. I slapped a bug. My hand slipped and healed you, right? Right? I didn't display any favoritism and helped you out, right? The human was never harmed because the ribbon doesn't hurt humans, right? The man was getting closer and closer to Truly and he spoke until their noses were almost touching. He finally sounded a little bit threatening in his kind yet strained tone, giving massive hints to make Truly drop it. When the man backed off, I stood on uneven legs, and Truly looked just as unsteady. He needed to wrap an arm around my waist for both of us to stay on our feet. Do you have the box the ribbon came in? The taller man, I guessed his name was Cautious, asked and held out his hand. I reached into my ruined jacket pockets to find the small wooden box. Handing it over, the ribbon was placed inside until it was needed again. Now, this place is a mess. It would be hard to explain why the forest looks like this. It's like a meteor hit. Looking around, I agreed. It was far too strange to blame the damage on a simple forest fire. Valak had finished his circle. From where he stood, he gave us a wave as the tribe leader's body and head sank down into the ground, disappearing wherever the wolf sent it. He went in after them, and I wondered if I would ever see him again. A clap made me jump. The sound echoed, and I found myself no longer inside a burnt-up clearing, but surrounded by tall trees. Cautious, Tully started. Covering up supernatural events is part of my job. This is within my rules. I looked at the trees, and then at Tuli's healed face. If this man had this much power, then maybe he could save that girl when we couldn't. That girl the tribe leader attacked. Could you heal her? I asked, with the smallest amount of hope. Cautious had the small box between two fingers. He looked down at it as he spun it, his tone somber and not like how he spoke before. I may be the most powerful creature in this world, but that power is used to keep the balance between creatures of the night and humans. That creatures have rules, just as humans do. It may appear at first that what the things in the night do is unfair. It is simply because you cannot understand it. I have the power to heal that girl, but I cannot, because it would ruin the balance. You two cut the head off of the tribe leader because he harmed that girl. If she was not harmed and I made it as if nothing ever happened to her, it would no longer be balanced. The leader would have been harmed for no reason. Then I would need to heal his injuries, and it would keep spiraling from there. If I kept fixing the world because someone was unhappy about an outcome, it would never stop. And what's the point of anything happening if I was just going to change it after? So, for everyone's sake, I did not heal you. I did not help in the slightest, because that would be unfair. Don't you think? He stopped spinning the box as he finished speaking. His red eyes looked over at me from under bangs of white hair. I felt a chill and understood why Tuli and Valak were so frightened of him. I wasn't even this afraid of Tuli's parents when I faced them. The darker tone didn't last long. He soon lifted his head to give us a smile. You two look tired. You should get some rest. This time our surroundings changed around us without a clap. In a blink of an eye, I was staring at the cabin. I felt dizzy and would have fallen over if Tuli wasn't keeping me upright. You really can't be doing stuff like this, Tuli warned again, sounding pretty determined to try and have cautious to obey whatever rules he was bound by. 
I didn't do anything. You two just uh, walked back really fast, if anyone asks. Anyway, I need to go. And your human is going to faint from being overexposed from everything. He's that type. Cautious knew I was going to pass out before my body did. I heard half of Thule's answer before falling into a darkness to wake up in my bed hours later. My feet felt heavy. Not only did someone put me to bed with my dirty shoes on, but didn't lock the door, so the raccoon creature got inside to curl up on my legs. I looked at his plump, fat body and muttered out how much of a chunk monkey he was. I woke him up. He looked very displeased as he rolled off the bed, landing on the floor with a soft plop. I heard him comment on how Monkey was a good name before scurrying off. Little feet scurrying across the hardwood flooring, hoping that now I was awake, I would feed it. I regretted slipping up and calling him that. I wondered if it was too late to change his name to something else, or if Monkey was what he picked. My body felt stiff and my arms burned, but I was able to stand up. Looking outside, I could see Thule's rental car parked out front. I slowly made my way down the stairs, my muscles sore in protest of the movement. Opening the door, I saw Thule's back turn as he walked away from the porch. Again, he could not bring himself to knock on the door. Hey! I walked across the wooden porch to follow him. My voice made him stop, and he turned to look at me. I couldn't make it down the steps, so I leaned against the railing to look down on him instead. He was dressed in a suit again, looking like the agent I met months ago. Taking off his sunglasses to talk made him appear more like the friend I knew. Are you feeling all right? I asked, getting the first words in. I heal fast. He raised his scarred hand from where he grabbed the ribbon. Without thinking, I reached over to place our hands side by side so our scars showed. We match. I expected him to smile or even laugh. His eyes fell on the matching scars along our palms, and he looked sad, as if such a minor thing was a tragedy. Looking up, his eyes seemed more human than I'd ever seen them. He opened his mouth to speak, but found no words for me. At that moment, I couldn't help but wonder who he was looking at. Did he see who I was, or did he see my grandfather? His gaze was so intense, I pulled my hand back. I've been wondering, what did my grandfather wish for? Do you know? I think it was a lot of cash. The question was meant to brighten the mood. It did the opposite. His face turned pale and like stone. My friend changed from Thule back to 202. No, beyond that. Whatever happened in the past turned him into something inhuman, just thinking about it. I felt scared of him, and then ashamed I was afraid of a friend. Placing his sunglasses back on his face, he turned away from me. The wishes are between my lord and the landowner. I cannot discuss them. His voice was hard and cold. I moved as fast as my body would let me to catch up to him. I couldn't let him leave like this, not knowing when he would be back. Uh, wait. At least he paused and let me catch up. Holding out my hand again, I stopped in front of him. Give me your number. What? The sudden demands made him return to the man I knew. You have a card or something, right? Give me your cell number. I'll call you. Give me your phone. I'll put the number in for you. I don't have it on me. I didn't want it to be smashed while fighting werewolves, so I left it at home. And I haven't changed since. Letting out an annoyed sound, he went through his suit pockets. Finding a pen, he took my hand and wrote a 16-digit number ending in 202 on the back of it. I looked it over and stated the obvious. There's too many numbers. You believe in invisible, shy werewolves, but you won't believe a cell number can be extra digits. My response was stealing his side-kicking move. After a few light hits against his polished shoes, I showed him mercy. I'll send you so many memes. 
This was not the right thing to say. Licking his thumb, he grabbed my hand and started to smudge the last two numbers as I screamed at him. I was kidding until he stopped. I wasn't kidding, but he did not need to know that. Keeping the number at a safe distance from him, I gave him a warning before he gave me the usual one. Stay safe out there, alright? If you're in the area, send me a message and I'll come and help. Before he could reply, his phone rang and he turned away to answer it. The conversation was quick and he started to walk towards his car before it was even finished. I need to go. Things are on fire. You should take a break. Uh, can't Hans deal with it? I asked, watching him start to leave. He's the one who set everything on fire. I didn't know how he handled his job on top of having so many troublesome brothers. I wanted him to have a less hectic life, but when I spoke with his parents, I asked for his freedom. It was not my place to control his life or tell him what I thought was best. It was his choice to do whatever job he wanted, and it did sound as if he was the only sensible agent around. This time, he did not give me any warning to stay out of trouble or to leave the cabin. I was stuck with knowing about the paranormal, and when his family came by for another meeting next summer, I would be here. His only demand was I not blow up his work phone with stupid cat videos and other memes. I promised I wouldn't and waved as he drove off down the dirt road outside the cabin. Once out of sight, I immediately broke that promise. Last summer, my grandfather passed away, and I inherited his cabin along with a vast amount of land surrounding it. I planned on finding a job even though I could live comfortably without one for a while. Once winter rolled in, I found it impossible to drive out from the cabin through the snow most days, causing me to abandon the job search. I nearly succumbed to cabin fever in those cold months. The only thing keeping me sane were texting a friend and on the rare occasion meeting him. He was also something I felt like I inherited from my grandfather. He was a contractor that worked mostly for the government to hunt down supernatural creatures. Being a creature himself, he was well suited for the job. I didn't know much about what he was, or even his real age, but whenever I was bored, Thule would send me a few texts vaguely hinting at what kind of interesting job he was currently on. If he was able, we would meet for coffee a few towns over. He didn't want to show his face around the small town because people may clue in that they've seen the same man years ago without aging in the slightest. I surprised him with a Christmas present, however, by the time we could meet in person, it was well into spring. I bought him a sweater and a glove set, feeling it was a lame gift, but unable to think of anything else to buy for an agent. Every year, Thule's family met in the woods for, well, something I was still unsure about. The last time, I interrupted their meeting and nearly was killed because of it. I still had nightmares of his brother, Hans, chasing me through the woods on his hundreds of arms and a wide smile taking up that terrible, pale face. I felt a small amount of dread as the dates of their meeting started to get closer as the weather warmed up, but I knew it was the one time of the year I was guaranteed to see my friend. As long as I stayed out of the woods, I wouldn't get into any trouble. A month before the meeting, something changed my life beyond anything I could ever expect. It was such an important event, so I didn't feel right sending the news in a text. I wanted to share it with Thule, but only told him when we met next. I would have big news. Terrible luck befell me, and he found out about what I wanted to tell him in an unplanned way, and how he acted I should have predicted. I was in town by the diner, talking with Linda, the teenage cashier of the grocery store. She often stopped to speak with me, and with what I was carrying, she just couldn't resist taking the bundle from my arms just as I spotted a black SUV drive down the main street. It parked in front of the bait shop, and a few men in suits came out. Around this time of year, they bought out the bait, meat from the grocery store, and meals from the diner. When they parked, Derry, the store owner, came out to help load the SUV. 
I gave them all a wave, unsure if my friend was with the agents working to load up their cars. Aren't you late for soccer practice? I asked Linda, as I turned away from the SUV for a few seconds. It's too hot. I might skip it. Do you, like, know those guys? She asked, nodding towards the men in black. One of them, I told her. When I looked over, I saw they nearly had the trunk of the SUV full. They worked fast in pairs. I spotted Tooley who wanted to finish his job before waving back. It was odd that he came into town that day after avoiding it for so long. I gotta go either way. Tell me if you ever need help watching the little guy. I'm, like, really good at it. Almost raised my cousins. Linda smooched the head of who she was holding and handed him back to me. It was only then I realized this was not the way I wanted Tooley to find out about my news. I wanted to do this any other way but him watching someone hand me a newborn from across the street. With a duffel bag of baby things hanging from my shoulder, it was clear who the child belonged to. I looked over to my friends to catch him in a mid-wave, his hand hovering in the air and body looking as if he froze in mid-step. The other, younger-looking agent stared at him for a few seconds, then returned to the back seat of the car. It was only the two of us left on the street, silently looking at each other, trying to think of a way to approach each other. I started to walk towards him, feeling my heart sink when I saw his expression. A resigned smile came across his face, and he turned away. I couldn't find my voice or catch up as I watched my closest friend get into the black SUV and drive away leaving me unable to explain things. I couldn't just stand in the street, so I bought the formula I came into town for and went back to the cabin because Casper was getting fussy in the heat. The moment I had him down for a nap, I sent off rapid texts to my friend, praying he would answer at least one. As the day passed and my phone stayed silent, my stress got so bad I was unable to sleep or even eat for two days. At that point, I'd only had Casper for a month, but I already knew his routine. At first, I was terrified of taking care of a newborn when I had no experience with children, let alone babies. The townsfolk had helped out a lot, catching me up, and even my sister helped me in her own way. I still have yet to see my father or mother after a fight last autumn, but my sister came by to see Casper and was perfect with him. I thought she might be too weird to be trusted around him, and all those doubts faded the first few hours she came by, and I could take a much-needed nap. So much happened in the past month, I never thought about how Thule would have reacted to Casper. Casper woke up at 5am to be fed every day. I was on autopilot, making his formula. It was only when I sat down with him in my arms and the bottle in his mouth when I looked at my phone sitting on the table as if I expected a text at that moment. My chest ached over the fear my friend would never send me another message, that he decided it would be best to stay out of my life now that I had a child to raise. I could understand his train of thought. Any time I got too involved in his work, I nearly died. Now I needed to stay around because the child in my arms didn't have anyone else. His mother died shortly after he was born, and no one else could take him. When I stared at my phone, I could still feel the sensation on the back of my hand when Thule wrote his cell number on it in pen. It felt like such an accomplishment making friends with him, and I ruined it because I decided to go into town that day. I guess it's just you and me, buddy. I told Casper in a soft voice not to startle him while he ate. I felt guilty that the statement upset me. I loved Casper more than I thought possible in such a short amount of time. I was beyond thankful to have him, and yet I was sad because it was just going to be the two of us. I had a perfect and healthy child, and people who would help me with any bumps in the road, and yet the thought of raising him without being able to share the milestones of his life with my friend made my face twist into a sob. Casper never cried after eating, but he did then. I think he was frightened seeing me upset for the first time and didn't know how to handle it. It took me another hour of pacing the cabin with him in my arms and talking to him to calm him down. 
Instead of waiting for Thule to contact me again, I spent most of the day trying to figure out a plan. He would be in the area somewhere. I needed to find him so we could talk at least once. If he wanted to distance himself afterwards, I wouldn't stop him. The roadblocks were trying to find someone to watch Casper while I was off on my manhunt, and to not put myself in danger. I could not afford going inside the woods with the creatures that lurked in the trees that time of year. No one was available on short notice to watch Casper that day, so I stayed home and started to ask my pet questions about what was in the woods. The monkey was a fat creature with many legs along its chunky body. It had raccoon features such as a tail and ears, his face was human-like, and his smile was still creepy as all hell, even if I did love him. He could speak a few words, and only when he wanted. He was a type of creature that was in the woods, and a part of Thule's family, even though they were not alike in the slightest. As far as I could tell, there were human agents, along with the fat, sleeping bag-shaped creatures with nubby feet that would take on the features of animals they ate. I may be able to outrun them if I came across those monsters, but I was worried about Hans. He was massive and almost like a centipede, but with human arms and a pale human face. He could talk just fine and was the one who nearly ate me last year. If I bumped into him in the woods, I might not be able to escape. The monkey was being very unhelpful. He simply refused to answer what the meeting was for, what other kind of monsters I didn't know about. He only wanted to know when dinner was. I gave up and let him into a bag of dog food I found out that he greatly enjoyed, and it was cheaper than buying him fresh meat all the time. As he ate, I started to make myself a grilled cheese sandwich. Casper was taking a nap upstairs, and I had the baby monitor next to me at all times. I rarely was away from him, but I knew I needed to start distancing myself a little. I couldn't smother the poor child. I was stressed even going to the washroom on my own. Making myself dinner without him in the same room was nearly torture. I was about to rush upstairs to check on him when I heard a knock at the door. People rarely came by without sending a text first. I had no clue who it would be. Setting my dinner aside, I started towards the door, letting myself faintly hope it was my agent friend. When I opened the front door, I saw it was some agents, but not Thule. Three of them stood outside, the third mostly being blocked from sight by the other two. They looked like Thule, in a way. That black hair and similar features, which was to be expected because they were all brothers. They looked younger than him. One was missing his sunglasses, another didn't have his tie up correctly. I'd never spoken to any other agents besides Thule, and couldn't think of a reason why they would be here. Uh, oh, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, you're two, I, I mean, two or two's brothers, right? Is everything all right? I asked, suddenly feeling concerned. My stomach twisted over the thought something happens to my friend. They looked between each other then towards the road to see if we were alone. No, but it's gonna be. One commented, and they all started to move. I was helpless as a hand with a rag was forced over my mouth. They kept my nose free so I wouldn't suffocate, and the second man grabbed me around the waist to lift me to drag my body inside. They weren't human, and no matter how much I thrashed, I couldn't get free from their grip. The last agent made sure to close the door as I was dragged inside the kitchen. They threw me onto a wooden chair at the kitchen table with so much force I thought it would break. The rag still over my mouth, I tried to free myself, but no matter how much I pulled, I couldn't get him to move his hand away. The second one grabbed my left arm and pinned it onto the table. My heart was beating out of my chest. None of this made any sense. I was promised by my parents that the people in the area were safe unless they went into the woods. When the third placed a black box made of some sort of metal on the table next to my arm, I was too scared to even move. I'd seen one of those boxes spilled open before. They held so much gore and blood in such a small space. I didn't know their purpose, but I did not want to be near such a dreadful thing. You see, the one holding the rag over my mouth started to speak. I was with 202 yesterday. I don't know what you did to him, but... He hasn't been the same since he looked over to you. I can't forgive that. None of us can. 
He's the only brother that gives a damn about the young ones like us. My head was swimming in panic and fear. If they would just let me speak, I would explain this entire thing. The third agent looked around the kitchen until he found a large carving knife. He handed it to the one who was holding my arm on the table. I jumped when he slammed the blade into the wooden table and between my fingers. I didn't dare move further. I had one arm free, but didn't think it could help me at that moment. So, we figured it'd be best if he never looked at you again. Don't you think that's a good idea? We need more uh, ingredients for our box, so you'll be a huge help. He sounded a little excited as his brother started to push the box lid open. The lid was only open a little bit. I regretted the fact the rag was not over my nose. A rancid, foul smell came from the box, and I started to gag into the cloth. The problem is that it's such a small opening. To fit you all inside, we need to do a little at a time. Without giving me any time to mentally prepare myself, the blade came down, easily cutting off my left index finger. I sat in shock, and at first not even feeling the pain. Blood pooled and stained the wooden table. A table I knew was in the family for years. Something I thought my father grew up eating dinner at. I mourned the loss of it before my own finger. Reaching over, the agent that had stayed silent the entire time plucked the severed finger off the table and dropped it into the box. My free hand flew to the one that was covering my mouth, trying to remove it again. Tears came to my eyes, and to my horror, the knife was raised again to take another part of my body off. A sound coming from behind us made us all freeze. A crackling of the baby monitor as Casper cried a little in his sleep. They all turned their heads as they realized what that sound meant. Someone else was in the cabin. That one sound snapped me back to my senses. I was no longer trying to defend my own life but needed to fight these three for Casper. Snatching the pepper shaker off the table, I was thankful for the loose lid. Before the agent could step back, I threw the contents over my shoulder and into his face. He let go, the rag dropped into my lap, and he coughed and sputtered. The knife started to come down as I used my free hands to lift the table enough to cause the metal box to become unbalanced. It started to fall off the table, and he abandoned me to try and save it before it spilled onto the floor. I snatched up the knife, using my injured hands because it was closer to where it fell. Standing up, I was ready for the third to come at me, but he just stood with a blank expression on his face. When I swung my injured hands, blood droplets flew onto his cheek. I didn't keep my eyes on him, as the first agent recovered from the pepper attack. He grabbed me from behind and struggled for the knife. It only lasted a few moments. He paused, still holding me in a death grip, but his attention on the third man, frozen in position. The second recovered the box, placed it on the table, and also looked over at the other agent. They could see something wrong I couldn't, but I could hear it. A crackling sound coming from the agent, as if his bones were shifting under his skin, and I simply couldn't see. Hey, are you alright? You're looking kind of... The one who saved the box started to go over to his brother, hands raised as if he was approaching a wild animal. I... I don't think I can hold my face in, the third said in a soft voice full of fear. He raised a hand to his face to smear the blood droplets on his pale skin. Both of his brothers now froze as if they were unsure of what to do. You should run. The agent told his brothers, his final words sounding calm. Then, his hands flew to his face as if he was in pain. Soon, I could see why. His skin was cracking open as something else came through. It wasn't just his face. His entire body was cracking and shifting into something else. His shoes ripped to pieces as claws burst through. His fingers cracked and skin falling away to show segmented joints underneath. He was screaming in pain that soon turned into a chattering, clicking noise as his body shifted to something that could no longer form human speech. When he lowered his hands, his face looked almost insect-like, eyes massive and stretched, 
jaws that reached his ears, and skin glossy as if it was a shell. Hundreds of razor teeth wasted no time lunging forward to rip into the second agent's shoulder. I was let go, suddenly not important. All of them were shouting, one in pain and the other begging his brother to turn back into his human form. I could only guess my blood triggered this somehow. Acting on instinct, I ran over to the cupboard. Grabbing a massive box of table salt, I cut it open and threw it as hard as I could into the chaos. It bounced off the creature's face and somehow got his attention. Letting go of his brother, his hand brushed the salt from his face and tasted it. Soon, he was on the ground, chittering and lapping up what was coming from the box. Monkey loved salts, and I made a good guess that this creature would as well. It only bought us time. I needed to grab Casper and get the hell out of the cabin before the salt ran out. I ran out of the kitchen, knife still in hand. I heard the other two follow me, but they sounded frightened instead of a threat. I bolted upstairs into my room. I had the crib beside my bed and hoped Casper would forgive me waking him up. The men looked confused over what was going on or if we had a plan. I handed one of them the knife, knowing he would no longer use it on me. In a few seconds, I had Casper bundled up in blankets that my blood was staining, but I didn't care. Even in my panic, I was being as careful as possible with him. He let out a few small sounds from being picked up, but quieted down. I thought we had more time, but when I left the room, I stopped in front of the stairs. At the bottom was the monster looking up at us. It let out a screech as it lunged forward. I wasted no time rushing back to my room. The other two are following yet again. I slammed the door, locking it just as I felt the monster throw its entire body against the wooden door. It rattled, but stayed. However, the door would not last long. We needed to get out of this room, but our only way was blocked. At least for a few panicked seconds, I thought it was our only way out. With blood dripping from his injury, one of the agents started to drag a heavy wooden dresser across the door, hoping it would slow the creature down if it somehow got inside. I ran over to the window and lifted it open with some difficulty. My hand throbbed in pain, and Casper started to weakly cry from all the noise. When the uninjured agent saw what I was doing, he came over to get the window open the rest of the way. I was feeling dizzy, but forced myself to stay in the moment. If I didn't then Casper would be in danger. I need you to take Casper and jump, I told the man in a stern voice. He did a double take between me and the ground below. Without a doubt, he could jump from the second floor without any issue. It was being responsible for a child he wasn't able to handle. His face pale from fear and took a step back from me. I... I can't, he stuttered no longer looking like the same man who threatened to cut me into pieces. The banging from the door was terrible. Every time I felt like jumping at the sound. My nerves were on fire, and I was tempted to slap the man in front of me to get some sense into him. The injured one finished placing everything he could find in front of the door, the knife in his shaking hand. I'll stay behind. You two get out of here, he told us, but didn't sound brave enough to go through with it. You're both being stupid. We're all getting out of here. I snapped at them. They both looked startled at my harsh tone. Meekly, the other man came over to look out the window, as if trying to see how high up we were. It's not that high. We could all easily jump. Who's first? He asked, and I was fuming. I'm human. I'll break an ankle jumping from this high up. You two need to catch me and Casper. He looked over nervously over the plan. I didn't give him a chance to argue about it. Because he was already leaning out the window, I kicked his backside to send him out the rest of the way. I can't believe I was almost killed by these three morons. Before the other agent followed behind, I grabbed his tie and pulled him in, nearly choking the man. If Casper gets hurt, you'll wish you got eaten by your brother. Got it? A panel from the door was broken in, and a clawed hand reached between furniture, trying to reach us. I still didn't let go of the agent until he fully understood. I may be a human suffering from blood loss, but I could still make his life hell if needed. He gave a small nod, looking as scared as I should feel. Then, I let him go, to escape by the window. I didn't trust them catching me, based on how nervous and fidgety they were. 
Still, it was the only option. I took a deep breath and kissed Casper's head for luck before leaping from the window, knocking over both of the men tasked to cushion my fall. I scrambled, making sure my precious bundle was safe. Casper was laughing, fully enjoying the fall. No bumps or scrapes on him, but the rest of us weren't doing too hot. My hand still was bothering me. I felt sick and dizzy. If I didn't keep moving, I might not make it. The agent with the injured shoulder also looked as bad as me. His face was pale and barely able to stay standing. The other one had twisted his ankle when they poorly caught me and we all fell over. We looked pathetic, trying to get to their car as fast as possible. The bastards parked it so far away. Hobbling down the dirt road, we heard a sound coming from the cabin that made us all stop. I pressed Casper protectively in my chest, careful not to hurt him. The creature must have smelled or sensed his meal moving. It crashed through the front door and rolled down the front steps from the momentum. Both agents got in front of me as if they weren't trying to murder me a few minutes before. Neither looked to be in any state to fight off the monster. We have a problem, the one said, voice shaking. I was tempted to make a smart-ass remark, but I let him keep going, looking over his shoulder, his blue eyes full of distress. He has the car keys. My life was going to end because these three were idiots and didn't think of having a second set of car keys. The man with the torn shoulder could still run. At least if two of us stayed and fought, he could make a run for it with Casper. I was about to shove my child into his arms and order him to book it. When the monster started to run at us with frightening speed, we wouldn't have time to get away before the chattering thing reached us. My heart felt like it stopped beating, and my mind froze, unable to think of another plan. Then, a booming voice from behind us made all of us jump, even the pale monster skidding to a stop. What the hell are you three doing? I knew that voice, and I never knew he could ever be so angry. I turned, nearly blacking out from the quick movement. My friend came striding over, a rental car parked behind the other agent's car. Truly was so angry, he tossed his sunglasses from his face. He wasn't running, but he walked the distance between the car to the creature before it recovered enough to come after us again. When it returned to its feral state, it attacked Thule, but he was faster. In one swift movement, he got it in a headlock. The monster screeched at first. It snapped and tore at his clothes and clawed feet thrashing. Not only did the minor wounds it inflicted healed, Thule's suit was repairing itself as well. Even in that moment, I couldn't help but think how useful something like self-repairing clothing was. It felt like hours that Thule had the creature in a chokehold. When it finally stopped struggling, Thule let it drop from his arms. His steel eyes landed on the other agents. Both men let out a squeak of fear and darted behind me as their older brother started over towards us, looking as if he was going to kill them. If it wasn't for my involuntary actions, he might have. Unable to keep going, my body fell limp, and Thule ran over to catch me and Casper before I fell to the ground. When I woke up again, my head was still foggy. I sat up, my arms feeling empty. I didn't care about anything besides the fact I wasn't holding Casper. Where? Where's Casper? My voice was weak and somewhat slurred from sleep. I felt a pair of hands start trying to get me to calm down. I shook the cotton from my head to see where I was and what was going on. It looked as if I was in some sort of clinic or a very small hospital room. White curtains blocked my sights from most of it where I was. Thule was with me and the one trying to keep me from sitting. He's fine. The doctor has him. You should rest for a bit longer. He sounded so worried I at first thought something was wrong... Then I realized he was worried about me. He wasn't wearing his jacket, and he looked as if he didn't sleep that night. If I was passed out for a while, he most likely hadn't. I still didn't feel right not having Casper in the room, but I looked down to see how badly my hand was damaged. To my shock, I saw a full, pale finger that was not my own attached to where the other had been severed. 
Footsteps came from behind the curtain, and yet I still jumped when they were pulled aside. A man stood wearing a lab coat over a vest and dress shirt combo. His gold-rimmed glasses made him look like an old European doctor. Tully pulled back when the other man arrived, letting him take over. After some minor vitals were taken, the doctor spoke. I'm Dr. Philo. I look after supernatural creatures, but also take in humans from time to time. You should be fine. I was lucky to have some human blood on hand for a transfusion. He explained, and I thought he looked familiar, despite never meeting him before. My finger was cut off. I stated the obvious. I replaced it with an artificial one that's basically cosmetic. You won't be able to feel heat or cold or texture. Only pressure if it's touching something. It may also be hard to bend. He was satisfied over his once-over, finding no signs of further trauma. I felt a little sick from not eating and oversleeping, but otherwise felt lucky I was alive. Artificial? What's it made of? I asked, and Dr. Philo raised an eyebrow as if he was a little displeased over being asked. Don't ask questions you don't want the answers for. Anyway, I'll make you some tea. With that haunting statement, he left me and my friend alone. Tully looked ashamed over the fact that his brother nearly killed me and could not look in my direction. If I didn't start the conversation, one would not happen. At least I didn't think so, until he spoke up, still not looking in my direction. Did you lose a ring when the finger got cut off? I... I'm not sure what finger humans wear them on, but if you did... I'll replace it. It appeared as if his little brothers were not the only dumb ones in his family. He still hadn't checked his phone. If he did, he would have read all the texts I sent explaining everything about Casper. I opened my mouth to speak, but Dr. Philo came back inside, holding a tray of tea. He pulled over a small bedside table to pour us both a cup. Some small cakes and other treats were on the tray. I knew I needed to eat, but couldn't stomach anything yet. Is Casper here? Can I have him back? I asked the doctor, who gave me another raised eyebrow. You really should work on your anxiety whenever you're separated from him. You're the Anderson boy, correct? My cousin is Casper's doctor. He can deal with creatures just fine, but humans are harder for him. He was asking me for advice on how to deal with you. That was why he looked so familiar. Tully looked between us, confused about why Casper would have a doctor who wasn't human. I didn't want to explain it just yet. I knew Dr. Philo was right, that I should be able to deal with Casper being away from me for a few hours, but right then was not the time to tackle my faults. I swear I I'm working on it, but right now I'd feel better if I had him. Sighing. The doctor gave in to go get the most well-behaved baby in the world. The moment I had him back in my arms, I was able to get settled in to drink the tea that was handed to me and pick away at a piece of cake. Tully refused the cake and tea, but the doctor loomed over him, holding out a plate with a small square of lemon cake until the agent finally gave in and took it. I had a feeling the doctor was one of the rare people who could make Tully give in to his demands. My friend sipped on his tea, wincing at the sweetness. I didn't find it overpowering, but I didn't think Tully had any kind of fondness for sweet things. I already mustered the art of eating and drinking with a child in my arms. We were silent, so I just got something in my stomach before explaining myself. There isn't a ring, you know, I said, once Tully finally gave up trying to eat and put his half-finished cake aside. Oh, so, you. Yeah. I mean, that's fine. It happens. Are you friendly with her, at least? I mean, how does it work if humans aren't married? I really wanted to let him squirm and keep digging his own grave with embarrassing questions, but decided it was best if I just got everything out into the open. I put aside my own cup and sat Casper up on my leg. The boy giggled a little. He looked much older than a month. It felt as if he got bigger since I last held him, 
but it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Casper's mother is Heather Rosewell. I expected Thule to know this girl's name. We didn't know it when we first saw her, but both tried to find anything we could about the poor girl we arrived too late to save. He straightened up, hearing her name, and looked between me and Casper, almost not believing what he was hearing. Last October, I meddled in his job. We came across a beast of a wolf that tried to obtain power, but performed a ritual so taboo in this world that most creatures would not speak about it. The beast bought a human girl and forced himself on her. We couldn't stop him. We only got Casper's mother somewhere safe. For the monster's crime, his head was cut off, but somehow he was still alive, unable to cause any more harm. Casper looked human, but his father wasn't. Then, I don't think I've ever come across a half-breed before. I didn't think they would look so normal. And why do you have him? Was his mother unable to... Uh, well, his questions were understandable. The tribe of wolves that the beast belonged to took in Heather, but refused to release any information about her to anyone besides myself, aside from a name. Thule would know next to nothing. It felt a little strange being the one with answers when I was the one always asking him questions. It's... it's a little complicated. After what happened, she never woke up. The tribe took her in and kept her alive until Casper was born. Unless the baby is going to endanger the mother's life, they refused to terminate a pregnancy. But after he was born, they didn't know what to do with him. Half-breeds normally take after their mother when they're born. So now a tribe of wolves had this human child with a stained concept and without any idea of how to raise a human. Thankfully, there's a company run by two girls who place half-breeds and orphaned creatures into homes. Tully was listening carefully to what I was saying. He nodded when I mentioned the company that approached me and Casper. Kate Knight and Monty. I've dealt with them before. I used them to place some weaker brothers of mine somewhere else without my parents knowing. I was surprised at first, but thinking back to the three younger agents I met, I understood. Those guys would never become agents like Thule. If they tried, they would die quickly. I wondered just how many brothers Thule had saved placing them somewhere else. After all, my raccoon hybrid was also adopted from him. I was a little nervous when they asked. I mean, I've never spent any time alone with kids as an adult, and now I was being offered a baby. But I knew there really wasn't anyone else. His tribe could try raising him, uh, however, I don't want the fact that his mother was a Harvest Moon ritual victim to hover over his head for the rest of his life. Again, he nodded and leaned back into his chair, thinking. I paused to give Casper some kisses because, well, that's just what naturally happened every other hour. He giggled, clearly enjoying the attention. Will you be alright with him? Is he going to get any traits from his father? Tully asked as we both thought back to the beast that took everything we had to take down. I... Uh, no. I hope not. Because there aren't too many half-breeds, not much is known about what gets passed down. From what I've heard, their natures are more fluid because of their environment. Right now, Casper is fully human because I'm raising him. If the tribe took him in, he would slowly become a wolf over time to match his father, but he would be weaker and never up to the same strength as the rest of the tribe. I guess if he had mixed parents, he'd end up with different quirks, but mostly human-looking because of his mother. My nature was to ask questions, and I sure did grill the two who let me adopt Casper. They were glad of my interest, but started to look tired of me pestering them quickly. In the end, they wrote down everything they could think of and told me to contact them if I had more questions. It took a lot of willpower not to call them up every day to ask them if I was doing alright. Now that I finally told Thule everything about my adopted son, I decided I needed to confront him for nearly ghosting me. Listen, I understand if you don't want to stay in contact. And now that I'll be busy with Casper, most of what I'll talk to you about is going to be related to him. If that's not your thing, that's fine. But 
Just dropping me without a word isn't something I can deal with. Again, Tully looked a bit ashamed of himself. I knew why he wanted to duck out from being friends. He thought I'd move on. And if he was out of my life, that would protect me from supernatural threats his friendship brought. I couldn't be going after feral werewolves or dealing with his family with Casper around. If you sent me a message about this, we could have talked about it. I should have disconnected sooner before my three idiot brothers tried adding you to their box. He huffed, trying to defend himself. Oh, I'm terribly sorry for not wanting to drop a bomb like this over a text. And I did tell you I had something important to say. You were the one who saw me with a baby and assumed everything would be better without you around. I commented, getting a little heated at the end. You nearly died? He snapped back. Because your brothers care about you. They wanted to kill me because they thought I upset you somehow. If you just came over to talk to me instead of sulking away, those three wouldn't have bothered me. Clearly, Tuli was unaware of the reason why his brothers wanted to kill me. He sat, looking stunned for a while, before that guilty look fell over his face. It felt as if he was now always looking guilty for something around me. I relaxed, knowing shouting would only upset Casper. I really didn't blame him for what happened. There was no way he would have known how his brothers would act. Are we still friends? I asked in a softer tone as Tully rubbed the back of his neck, feeling uncomfortable over the idea that someone might kill for his honor. Yeah, I mean, if you can forgive me, he replied. I can see the reasoning behind why everything happened, so I can forgive all of you. I could have died, but I think those three learned their lesson. Plus, if I didn't, who would listen to how worried I am about Casper? He lifted his head, looking confused over what I just said. He looks fine, he replied, but didn't look like the type to really know much about human babies. He is, for now, but I'm raising him. Do you have any idea how stressful of an idea that is? I can't really ask advice from anyone I know about what I should do or handle things. If you just stopped talking to me, who am I going to send panicked 3 a.m. texts to, dreading the idea of Casper going into first grade? Do I even put him in school? Is there a school for half-breeds, or should we go with humans? What if he grows up human but later regrets it? He could have magic skills, and what if I raise that out of him? How do I address who his father is, if he ever asks? Do I lie? Do I tell him what happened? What age should we have the talk with? I'm literally going to explode if I don't have someone to unload these questions on, and my current coping mechanism isn't going to last forever. I was unable to keep my voice steady, and Tuli kept glancing towards the door, wondering if he should get the doctor again. What is your current coping mechanism? He asked cautiously. Taking a deep breath... I did what I have been for the past month when things got too overwhelming on my own. I made a ringing sound as if there was a phone nearby. Lifting Casper up, I took his foot and placed it near my ear as if it was the receiver. The moment his little pudgy leg was up, he started to laugh so hard it almost sounded like he was screaming he was so happy. Hello? Yeah, he's here. I'll tell him. I moved Casper around so I was speaking into his foot. Then I offered it to Tuli. In a dead serious voice, I went on. It's for you. I think it's the president. Casper kept squealing in delight. His favorite thing was me using his little foot as a pretend phone and carrying on ridiculous conversations in the most serious tone I could handle until I finally broke. This was not something Tuli was expecting. He stared at me, unable to react. Finally, a smile came to the corner of his mouth. When he didn't respond, I talked into Casper's foot again. I think he's busy. I can take a message. Tuli was cracking. He started to hunch over in his chair, his hands over his mouth trying to hide the fact he was laughing. I didn't hear anything coming from him, but I saw his shoulders tremble. I kept pressing on as revenge for him nearly ditching me. The president wants you to deal with an army of your nubby raccoon hybrid brothers. Uh, they're eating trash and not really causing that much trouble, but they're all really gassy. Still hunched over, averting his face, he lifted a hand and waved it in surrender. I don't think he's ever held in so much laughter before and was in pain from it. 
A combination of seeing him in such a state and Casper's giggling made me burst out in laughter as well. I really hoped I was the only one in this clinic from all the noise we were making. When Dr. Philo pulled back the curtain to see what was going on, it only made us laugh more. Uh, since you're feeling better, I'm sending you home. Uh, no sense wasting bed space. I was fine and made no arguments over being kicked out. Tully had to regain his composure. It was difficult with a laughing baby next to him. I shortly found out that Dr. Philo had a skill to create a doorway to anywhere he wanted. He could connect two joining doors together meaning the one in his clinic could open into my cabin if he wanted. Tully refused and offered us to use his rental car door opening. He was so jumpy about the cabin for some reason, he could barely bring himself to knock on the door. Going inside with me was out of the question. The rental car was fine. It was strange walking through one door only to be climbing out a lower car door at the same time. I was told that I'd been asleep for a full day. Being away from Casper for so long horrified me, but I got over it when I saw those three agents waiting for us. They were ordered to stay behind to clean up the mess they made of the cabin. The one was still in his insect-like creature form. He was in something that looked like a straitjacket, and his mouth was covered by a clear plastic muzzle. At least he was calm and not in the feral state of mind. They didn't notice us at first. They were outside, two of them petting Monkey, laying on his back, accepting the attention. I suddenly realized that Monkey was the reason why I was still alive. He was told to go get Thule if I was ever in trouble. I didn't see him the entire time those two were going to kill me. He must have seen the danger and raced off to get help. He earned those belly rubs and any food he stole while I was gone. Tully returns to his stern agent persona, and the three straightened up the moments they saw us walk over. Rushing over, their suits in a mess, the two started to talk over each other frantically to apologize for what happened. Their brother was chirping, but unable to speak in any language I could understand. It's all right. I, I forgive you, I told the three of them, and it was an honest answer. I understood the reaction. If someone made my sister upset, I would consider cutting off a finger or two. They all looked relieved, until Thule spoke, sounding just as angry when he first saw those three. It's not all right. Not only did you attack a resident of the town that is off-limits, you three had a disgrace of a box. Three of you were given an entire year to fill it out. Not only was it half full, you only put roadkill and cake inside. Those boxes are meant as the first meal for our siblings, and you want them to eat that. His arms were crossed, looking down on them. They all suddenly looked like scared children. Even the monstrous creature huddled closer for protection. I'm going to need to kill you before our parents learn of any of this. Truly sounded so cold, I couldn't believe he was the same person who was laughing over Casper's foot phone a little while beforehand. I looked at him trying to think of anything to talk him out of what he was about to do. My arms were full holding Casper, so I couldn't stop him before he grabbed one of the younger agents. The man let out a small and scared sob, but accepted his fate. His insect brother chirped, sounding stressed. I was about to step in, but the one held me back. It's all right. We deserve this, he said, but couldn't bring himself to look at what Thule was going to do. I wanted to stop this. It didn't seem right in the slightest. So what if they made a few mistakes? Killing them wasn't the answer. Within a second of getting the shorter man in another headlock, Tully pulled a small switchblade from his pocket. It looked like he was going to cut the man's ear off, but he only dug the blade around for a second and then pulled out a small, bloody coin-shaped object from under the agent's skin. Pushing him aside, he took the other that stopped me and did the same to him. When he took another small, round metal object from the agent creature, all three of them clung to each other, as if waiting for death. There. You three are dead. Tully sat, as he flashed the coins in his hand before crushing them. All three let out a yelp of fear and shut their eyes, waiting for something that never came. My own heart was beating so fast I thought I was about to pass out. Finally... One risked opening their eyes to confirm they were all still alive. 
We're not. We should be dead. You pulled our numbers out. One of them said in a small voice. The numbered ships are a lie I made up. How stupid would it be if we put a massive weak point like that in every agent's head? Something that would kill you if destroyed. But our parents believe it. If I want to fake a death for any of my brothers, all I need to do is remove the chip and show it to our lord. I swear, I'm the only one using my brain in this family. I wanted to kick him. If he was going to fake their deaths, he should have at least told me. You... we thought... that's just cruel. One of the three shouted, almost unable to speak clearly. Cruel like cutting off someone's finger and threatening their child. That shut them up. Tuli's anger faded, and now he looked exhausted from dealing with them. Now, I need to figure out where to put you. I don't know what kind of job you three would be suited for. I can't really separate you either. Mailman, the middle one said, and then his face flushed from how excited he sounded. I mean, the mailmen are always hiring. Tuli didn't look very impressed. It was as if he was rewarding their bad behavior with an escape from the family and with a dream job. I looked at the four of them, wondering just how many times this had happened. How many agents were out there wishing they were doing anything else but were trapped. Without Tuli, none of them would have gained their freedom. When I met his parents, I was able to ask for anything I wanted. And I asked for Tuli's freedom, only to have him still doing the same job as the rest of them. I now wondered if I asked for something selfish back then. In the car. We'll talk about it later. He hissed, and they scrambled out of his sight. At that point, Casper was getting fussy. He had gone out of his routine, and no amount of foot phone would help that. Thule noticed and started to walk away. We never confirmed if we're going to see each other or not. I told Thule to make him stop. We are still friends, aren't we? He replied over his shoulder. That didn't exactly tell me if he would still come by. We could still be friends, and yet he might only send a message once in a while. I knew I was asking a lot of him. He had a job, and his entire family to deal with, and I wanted to add my concerns on top of that. Just the thought of how close I'd come to never seeing my closest friend again made me feel more emotional than almost dying. I was really scared, you know. Judging by the look on his face, he knew what kind of emotional stress he put me under. I could forgive my finger being cut off, but not another person cutting themselves out of my life. Clearing my throat, I tried to ignore how upset I just sounded. I come by tomorrow, I told him. I felt as if I didn't use a demanding tone, he would go off, and I wouldn't see him again for six months. If I have time... Make time. Casper's been around for a month. You've missed a lot. I'll be going over to your parents and tell them to give you a day off if I have to. I threatened, and he believed me. He was going to protest, but the three now ex-agents were getting into trouble. Their brother was also getting fussy, and he got out of their grasp to start chasing a squirrel. They ran behind, unable to catch up. All right. I'll be there by tomorrow. With that, he went over to the chaos and easily solved the problem, scooping the creature under one arm and went over to his rental car and tossed it in the trunk. The other two were shoved in the back seat, and I waited outside long enough to watch them leave. Even though I slept for a day, I was exhausted, and Casper needed to be fed. I sent a text to my friend, reminding him to drop by the next day, and caught a quick nap before Casper needed to be changed. I was only dealing with one baby. I didn't know how Tuli was dealing with hundreds of troublesome brothers. I was starting to worry that Tuli wouldn't be by. Derry came over to fish. He owned the bait shop in town and liked to use my dock. He also knew my grandfather and would often tell me stories about him because I never knew him that well. I set up a blanket on the small, shady shore so me and Casper could hang out as Derry fished. When Thule did come by, it was later in the day. He came around to the lake after I told him where to meet us. He was dressed in a suit, looking like a government goon again. He looked over at Derry, a bit wary of the other man seeing him. 
As he arrived, Derry started to wade out of the lake. He walked in earlier to cool off his feet while he finished. As he came to shore, he stopped to pet Monkey, who was swimming around in circles. This made Thule freeze mid-step. Derry should not know about anything supernatural, and yet he just acknowledged a creature happily paddling around. Is that your agent friend? Derry asked, and Thule looked almost panicked. I, yeah, this is Thule. I think you met him when you were younger, I replied. I reluctantly let Derry take Casper from me. Thule did not look like he enjoyed the conversation. He gave me a, are you kidding me, look. If we weren't friends, he might have killed me. I trusted Derry to babysit Casper. If I was going to have him over, he was going to see Monkey at some point. And Casper may start displaying some supernatural traits. It was best to be honest with my future babysitter. Oh, that's right. He knew your grandfather, I think. Derry said, recalling vague memories. Thule was really going to kill me for this. But then again, did it really matter if Derry knew he wasn't human? What's he going to do? Tell the media who wouldn't believe a word of it? Adam, you can't just... I shushed my agent friend and made a spot for him on the blanket. I'd stopped drinking since getting Casper, but had some juice and snacks. Thule was hesitant, but he sat next to me, looking out into the lake, wondering why I called him over that day. Derry talked to Casper, and they both went over to a fold-out chair by the start of the lake. I trusted him and knew Derry wanted to get Casper into fishing. I needed to practice letting someone else holding him for a while. They weren't even that far away, but my arms ache wanting to take the child back. Having Thule beside me helped a little. Did you call me just to hang out? Thule asked after a while. Yeah. He looked over almost not believing my boldness. For all I knew, I could be pulling him from an important part of his job just to sit by the lake for a while. And honestly, I didn't care. He owed me, and that was enough to get him to sit down. All right, I may have wanted you to give me advice about Casper. I admitted to my other motives. I don't think I can really help with that. He tucked his sunglasses away as we spoke. A year ago, we sat by the lake before I knew anything about him. Back then, his eyes looked dead. They still looked a little dull, but now they had a hint of a shine to them. It was hard to tell if I was just acquainting to his strange eyes, or since knowing him, they became more alive. I think you're the only one who I can ask about this. Uh, Casper isn't human. He looks human, though, and it's the same for you. You're the only one in his life that can share the same perspective of looking like you belong in one world, but you really are a part of both. I wondered if parents who adopted children from different cultures had my same anxieties, but instead of trying to decide if my child should learn a second language and celebrate different holidays, I had to deal with magic and werewolves. I was so afraid that I did something wrong while raising him. That Casper would become an adult, resenting me for my choice of trying to keep elements of his father's traits with him, despite the horrible act the beast committed that resulted in Casper being born. If I thought about all the choices too long, my hands would shake, and I would get in a loop of overthinking. You think I belong in the human side of things? Tully asked, staring forward, watching Monkey climb into the shady shore. The creature shook the lake water from itself and started to dig a nice hole to sit inside. I never considered how distant Thule must feel at times. He looked completely adjusted to human culture. He could order coffee and drive a car. He used phones and knew current memes and media references, some of which thanks to myself. Valak, our mutual werewolf friend, spoke English but didn't have a clue about any of that. I wouldn't have thought that Thule felt just as much as an outsider as Valak. Of course you belong. You're here, aren't you? I nudged him with my shoulder as punishment for thinking otherwise. We both stayed silent for a long time, just watching the lake. We both had a lot of worries about the future, but could put them aside to have a quiet moment. I hadn't slowed down since I first picked up Casper, and I doubted Thule ever slowed down a single time in his entire life. Are you going to stay in the cabin? Thule asked, finally breaking the silence. 
Yeah. I can't imagine Casper in this city. I think the cabin would be good for him. We can stay away from the woods when your family comes by, but overall, the forest is a great spot for someone like him. Even though what happened to his mother was around here, I think the land is good. I had considered moving, but every time the thought came across my mind, it didn't feel right. In such a short amount of time, the cabin by the lake felt like home. I didn't want to unload so much of my worries on him at once. So, I started to ask questions about his work. Normally, he couldn't tell me much, but with the sheer amount of work he did, even vague answers filled up the time. Having someone to spend time with and talk about nothing too important finally got me to relax. I didn't notice how tense I felt until my shoulders finally released the tension. After a while, and to my horror, I nodded off to sleep. I think I leaned against his shoulder and passed out, but when I woke up, I was on the blanket with his suit jacket over me. The sun was starting to set, and some panic started to sink in when I didn't see Derry or Casper, just Thule standing by the lake with his shoes off. How long was I out? Where's... About an hour. They're inside the house. Casper's sleeping. Derry is cooking some fish he caught. Tully explains before I freaked out too much. Placing aside his jacket, I walked over to him and stood in the damp sand. Across the lake and in the woods, I saw some flickering of lights, signaling his family was setting up for their yearly meeting again. I still didn't know exactly what went on this time of year, and no matter how much I pressed, he refused to answer. But somehow, I felt as if I asked now, he might tell me something. What happens this time of year? I can understand you all meeting, but what's with those creatures like monkeys being in the forest? I asked, carefully wondering if I would get an answer. I think part of what goes on in these woods is similar to a kadoku. It's my understanding that it's a practice of placing venomous insects inside a jar until they all kill each other besides one. The final products can be used as a curse or medicine. Those creatures like monkeys, are unleashed into the forest for six days before our meeting. They kill each other and anything they can find. Humans are ingrained in their minds to be off-limits, but sometimes accidents happen. It's my job to gather up the survivors so our parents can decide what to do with them. Some get placed inside deceased human bodies to become agents. Others are sold as weapons. Truly answered and I looked from him to the woods beyond. It made my skin crawl a little, knowing as we spoke there was an unknown number of those creatures out there fighting to survive. Hearing this, I felt like I understood him a little bit better. He always acted as if he was trying to redeem himself in some way, as if he felt guilty for living. Tuli's start in life was killing his siblings, there was a chance that was his motivation, trying to save as many as he could now. You know, it's hard to imagine Monkey being one of those remaining creatures from last year. We both looked over to the fat raccoon creature that had buried itself inside the sands to nap. He made a wheezing, snorting sound. His face looked creepy as all hell, but harmless. When I first started to feed him, he could barely win in a fight with a raccoon, and yet he lived for six days in the woods with so many other bigger, bloodthirsty brothers. Well, we haven't always used the woods, because there are so many places to hide and some stay alive by pure luck. That explained it. I didn't press on more answers, feeling as if he was done talking about his family. My hands started to get the empty feeling from being away from Casper for so long. I needed to distract myself. I found a somewhat flat stone to attempt to skip across the lake. It did a pitiful two skips and sank. I swear Derry could skip a rock all the way across the lake and his method was lost on me. Thule copied me. Finding a decent sized stone, he flicked his wrist and it skipped past the dock. He wasn't showing off, but rather looked like he was testing to see if he could skip a stone. You're not human. That doesn't count. Uh, let me try again. 
I stayed to look at my feet, trying to find the right stone to at least break my record of two skips. It's not because I have superhuman strength. It's just in the wrist. Here, I'll teach you. I accepted his help. For the next ten minutes, he showed me the proper way of skipping rocks. I was starting to get it as he stood behind me to help guide my hand through the motions. With minimal practice, I was able to get three consistent skips. Getting seven was a proud moment. You don't seem like the type to practice this. Did you need to learn for a job, or did someone teach you? I teased, not expecting the answer I received. My sister taught me. I stood at a loss for words. It was the combination of his hushed tone and the fact he never mentioned having a sister before. The way he spoke made me assume his sister was no longer around. It felt like a topic so far off limits not even my nosy self would ask more about. I was rescued from the sullen air when my phone in my pocket started to ring. It was a number I didn't recognize, but I answered it anyway. I never would have expected someone on the other side asking for Chuli, but they referred to him by his codename. It must be one of his brothers, but I didn't have a clue on why they would have my number. It's for you, I told him, while placing a hand over the receiver. I'm not available, he answered back coldly. While he was looking for more pebbles to skip, I tried telling the agent on the other end that Tuli was busy. I overheard voices begging Hans to settle down and a faint cackling laugh in the background. I looked in the trees where I'd seen the light from before, just as the line went dead. I think you're available, I told Tuli as I watched a blast of fire shoot hundreds of feet in the air beyond the lake and over the trees. He looked up, spotting the stream of flames turning from orange to purple against the sun. Face pale, he leapt into action, struggling to get his shoes and socks back on as fast as possible. He was so fast, bolting towards the trail that led to the other end of the lake, I barely had time to call him back because he forgot his suit jacket. Turning on his heels and kicking up dirt, he raced back towards me. I'd picked it up to offer it to him, and in his haste, he didn't stop in time. We collided, and I nearly fell backwards. Derry came back from the cabin to see what we were up to, just in time to see Thule holding me in a dip and his hair a mess from running. We both were aware of how it looked, and when Thule brought me in closer so I was no longer in mid-fall, it made it appear even worse. To his credit, Derry didn't comment on what he just walked into. Did you see a fireball coming from the woods? Derry asked the most pressing question. I'll go deal with that. Grabbing his jacket, Thule ran off, looking a little embarrassed, although not over his brother nearly setting the forest on fire, but for the awkward moments before I gave a warning, looking at Derry, almost daring him to say something. He knew better. If he wanted to see Casper again, he would keep his mouth shut. I made dinner for you. Extra because I assumed your uh, friend would be joining, he said, while emphasizing the word friend. I gave him a playful punch to the arm as I gathered up the blankets and leftover drinks. Monkey already ate the snacks for me, so I had less stuff to clean up. I honestly didn't know what I would do without all of them. Derry liked to come over to cook dinner for me on occasion. His son, the sheriff, found out about Casper and showed up with a load of baby items. They spent the afternoon building a crib I had trouble with. If my sister wasn't busy, she'd offered to watch Casper, and Thule was going to stick around to help listen to my worries. Aside from my sister, my family still wasn't speaking with me. It hurts a little, but I found that I could handle it now that I had people I cared about supporting me. That night, I found it hard to sleep. Casper normally was out like a light for a few hours. I should have put him in his room, but I decided to let him sleep in mine in the second crib. I'd bought one, and then my sister got another, not knowing about the first. I should have donated it, but it was nice having the two, so I could decide which room for him to sleep in without me needing to drag cribs between them. The usual worries settled in my mind as I stared at the dark ceiling. The meeting in the woods should be over by now. 
Julia would be packing up the remaining creatures tonight or tomorrow. If it was safe, I wanted to take Casper out for a hike the next day if I wasn't too tired. Anything to keep me out of the cabin and to keep moving to keep the stress at bay. Just as I was falling asleep, I heard a tapping sound. At first, I assumed it was nothing or I was dreaming. When it got louder, I sat up in bed, looking towards the window and the source. My heart stopped and my blood froze when a pure white face with a twisted smile was looking back at me. I raced over to pick up Casper, causing him to cry a little from suddenly being woken up. I was backing up, facing the window, as multiple hands started to lift it open. This face was a part of my nightmares for months. I never wanted to see it again, let alone have it right outside my bedroom, and those terrible hands prying to get inside. Oh, what are you doing here? I hissed over Casper's weak cries. I sounded equally angry as I was scared. What a lovely thing you have there. So pudgy and ugly, but in an endearing way. No wonder why my brother was lurking around here today. Hans replied when he managed to get the window open. He tried sticking his face through the open window, but found it impossible to fit. The monster was huge. Standing upright, he could easily reach the second floor. His long body lined with human arms from people he devoured. This thing was Tuli's brother, but had no reason to be here. He reached an arm through, trying to grab us, and I backed up even further. You need to leave, I threatened, but had no way to force him. Hans almost looked hurt. His constant smile dropped slightly. When he spoke again, it sounded almost human instead of his twisted, darker tone. Human, I'm tossing aside my pride to ask something of you. It appears that your kind does things for free if you're asked nicely. It is not in my nature to be so straightforward in my requests, so I came here to ask one thing of you, and possibly sniff the child for a while. His arm struggled to reach us again, and took a few more steps back. You're not sniffing Casper, but I'll listen to what you want. He stopped, looking almost disappointed in my answer. He paused, thinking over his words carefully. After all, he came from a world where words and requests could be twisted. Please speak to my lord Harvest about 202's freedom. I feel as if your wish has not been fully honored, and that is disgraceful to our family's name. Hans said, simply. I never would have expected the same creature that gleefully snapped his deadly jaws around his younger brother to also display any kind of care for him. I thought back to the single time I met their parents and how terrified I was, but I would do what he wanted for my friend. Your parents' name is Harvest? It wasn't something I should be concerned about, but found it strange that word had been thrown around a lot regarding Thule. Oh, yes. Due to that, the stronger agents are called Harvestmen. The Harvest Moon and Times of Harvest is very important to creatures of the night. It comes up often. But due to my brothers having such a title whenever a job relating to a harvest comes up, they're the first ones to ask. It keeps them busy and is troublesome. I never can see my little brothers. Always off doing something else. I picked humans to eat because I would gain their arms, you know. Perfect for embracing your family. He gave me another smile that took up his entire face and showed off his countless teeth. You nearly ate Tuli, and you want me to believe you love all your siblings and just want to hold them? I was bouncing Casper slightly to get him quieted down. I was glad babies didn't retain memories because I never wanted him to see Hans. Siblings play rough sometimes. It is not my fault he was not strong enough to fight back. Anyway, I have remained for far too long. Humans are so troublesome to speak with. They go on and on. If you are not going to honor what I am requesting, I'll eat you and take the child. This time, he reached a few of his many arms through the window. Those pale hands were not able to touch us, but I still started to shake at the sight of them. 
I brought Casper in closer, not knowing if the monster was joking or not. I'll do whatever I can for Chuli. You don't need to freak me out. I snapped at him, not knowing where my bravery was coming from. Hans let out a chuckle and brought his hands back outside. Befriending Thule meant getting mixed up in all sorts of nightmare-inducing things, but I thought it was worth it. At least this request didn't sound dangerous. I would need to speak to a creature that even Hans respected, but I did it once before. We shall be at the mushroom clearing tomorrow after the high sun. I believe you humans call it one in the afternoon. Are you aware of where this is? I nodded. The mushroom clearing was called that because it was shaped like a cut mushroom. At one point, edible ones grew in mass in the clearing, but people kept taking them until they stopped growing in the area. On occasion, you could be lucky and find some. I'd done some hiking before adopting Casper and knew the area surrounding the cabin fairly well at that point. I still got lost in the woods if I was in them at night, though. Hans was glad I knew and didn't need to guide me to the area. He started to turn away from the window. At least humans are good for something besides food on occasion. He let out a chuckle, and I thought he was gone when he lowered his head. The window was empty for a few seconds, but he peeked back up, staring at me. His eyes squinted. You promise? He asked in a soft voice, sounding almost worried. It was so out of character for him, I nearly forgot how scared I was. A pinky promise, I replied on reflex. When I was growing up, if I didn't pinky promise my sister, then it meant nothing. A pinky promise was serious, and it meant I would do whatever I could to uphold it. That satisfied the creature who left peacefully, but not before raising a pale hand with a bent pinky as if confirming our deal. Not in a million years I would ever consider Hans being an alright guy. I still took Casper downstairs so we could both sleep there. I just couldn't fall back asleep with the mental image of his face in my window. I needed someone to watch Casper when I went out. I wasn't going to bring him to confront a creature of vast power. Derry was busy with the shop and Linda had other plans... I took a chance and called my sister, who was over within the hour, as if she had been waiting for the call. She collected him and listened to my instructions she heard a hundred times before. She already had plans to take him to an aquarium we both knew he would enjoy. I fully trusted her, but still felt the same worry when they went towards the door. While he was still in her arms, I kissed his hat and ruffled his soft brown hair. If it wasn't for his blue eyes, we would look alike. No wonder Thule mistook him for my biological son. I loved him as if he was, more than anything I'd ever cared about in my life. I almost couldn't deal with them leaving the house, but I needed to face a monster for my friend, and that was what I was going to do. When I walked into the forest on a hot summer day, I wasn't aware of the danger that awaited me. I was a little afraid of what the day would hold, but somehow... Hans's soft tone asking me to confirm the promise kept me walking. We both cared about Thule, and I was the only one in a position to help him. I was sweating, but not nearly as much as I expected. Finding the clearing took a while, but I arrived in one piece. At first, I thought I misheard the location. As I walked through the trees, the clearing before me looked empty. It was only when I walked into it that three figures became visible. Hans was in the middle of speaking to his parents about something when I arrived. Their parents sat on a tree stump, and my heart started to beat so hard I thought they could hear it. Lord Harvest didn't look as frightening as Hans. However, my body reacted as if I was staring death in the face when my eyes fell on the pale form. Instead of being under the fabric tent... They wore thin, layered veils over their face, keeping it hidden. Segmented hands looking as if they belonged to a ball-jointed doll were folded in their lap. Legs with the same joints and clawed feet were crossed over each other. If Lord Harvest had a gender, it was impossible to confirm from their flat chest a dress of shimmering white fabric clung to. Thule had his back to me, 
with a black metal box tucked under his arm. When I walk into the clearing, he turns to face me, and his expression turned into such pure terror I've never seen from him before. He was a few feet away. Dropping the box, he made a motion to come towards me, only to have Hans shoot forward to grab him. I let out a sound of shock when the monster took my friend into one of his many hands and slammed Tully's face so hard into the ground I thought I heard bones breaking. I cried out, begging for him to end the assault, confused why he would do such a thing. With a few more violent slams into the ground, Hans raised his brother back up, his bloody face covered by the hand holding him off the ground and feet dangling limp. Hans looked as if he enjoyed beating his brother into submission, and it just didn't make sense. He was the one coming to me for help to save his brother. Why harm him so greatly? Hans, that is enough. Lord Harvest's voice was enough to make us both freeze to the spot. My body felt cold, and my muscles locked up. Dropping Tuli, the monster directed his attention towards me. Oh, silly little human. You dare violate our precious time with our parents. That is a grave offense. No matter. I've been hungry for your flesh since last year. I think your arm will do nicely on my body. Don't you think? Hans took careful, slow steps in my direction, and everything made sense. He lied to me. I felt foolish for falling for his words that night. He didn't want me to save his brother. He just wanted a reason to eat me, and I just gave it to him. I took a step back, trying to think of a way to get out of the situation I walked into, when suddenly, my body was jolted into the air. Countless white threads, similar to spider webs, wrapped around me and lifted me off the ground. I dangled with Hans, watching the thread wrapping around me as I struggled to get free. I was able to get a cry of fear out before the threads covered my mouth. I could still feel and see, but could no longer speak. As Hans stated, this is indeed a grave offense. This land does not belong to you. It is a space that belongs to all creatures, and not humans. You dare sully this place in our time. Harvest commented, sounding calm, almost as if expecting this. I thrashed, trying to get free, hoping if I could just explain myself, I might get out of this. Tuli was stirring, so Hans went back to him. He lifted the agent to his knees with a hand under his chin. My friend was struggling back awake. I looked down on him, with tears starting to sting my eyes. We were both facing creatures with power far beyond our own. I should have seen this betrayal. Hans was a monster, after all. After meeting so many supernatural creatures I cared for, I saw them just as kind as humans. Aside from Casper's father and Lord Harvest, all the monsters were my friends. Even those three agents that nearly killed me and cut off my finger. I was going to die and leave Casper alone because of that mistake. Thinking of Casper gave me a burst of strength. I was able to fight through the threats and snap them from my mouth. I would never forgive those creatures if they harmed Casper in any way. That included making him go without an adopted father. The threads started to wrap back around, but I now knew I could break them. Hans, you bastard! You told me to confront Harvest over not honoring my wish. If anyone should be punished, it should be you! I snapped with as much vile as I could muster. The thread covered my face again, keeping me silent. Their parents turned their heads slightly to look over towards Hans, who simply shrugged. Tuli was awake, and he looked furious. He started to struggle, trying to get from his brother's grasp, but the monster was far too strong. If that is the case, I shall lessen your punishment. Instead of letting Hans take your arm, I have decided to make you one of us. 202 can cease with his foolish interactions with humans. He shall be able to still care for you without the shame that comes from interacting with your kind. Lord Harvest was still speaking in a calm voice, but I was nearly sick with fear. The threads kept wrapping and moving about. They felt my exposed skin as if looking for something. Deep down, I knew that if I let them fully wrap around me, I would no longer be myself. Tully looked as sick as I felt. The wounds on his face were nearly healed, and he regained his strength enough to nearly get out of the hands holding him back. 
He snapped, looking at his parents with pure hatred on his face. You find it shameful that I interact with one human, and yet you turn your eyes away whenever Hans takes one to bed. I'm sick and tired of how our kind twist words and statements in order to suit their interests. You see humans as below us, but at least they have some honor in their words. I'm certain that whatever wish you promised to Adam, you have done everything you could to not fulfill it. From the way Julie's voice was shaking, it was clear this was the first time he'd ever talked back to his parents. What he said made me stop struggling for a moment. A block of ice settled in my stomach as it started to spread through my body. For the entire year, I'd assumed Truly knew what my wish had been. And yet, he didn't know. I never brought it up, feeling as if I said anything, it would sound as if I was holding something over his head. I didn't want our friendship being based on some sort of obligation. I simply wanted him to be able to choose what he did in life. The wish of Julie's freedom had been broken from the start because I was too stupid to just talk to him about it. It was silly of a human to waste a wish on you, little brother. Hans said, sneering down. Tully stopped moving, looking up, confused at what he meant. Lord Harvest almost looked nervous for a moment. That small interaction proved Tully was the only one unaware of what I'd asked for a year ago. He was nearly dead in Hans's mouth while the monster was awake to watch. Soon, Tully started to confront his parents, demanding to know what Hans was talking about. The threads had nearly taken over my face. I pushed my head forward, shaking it to snap the thin white threads to get my mouth free for a few seconds to speak. I wish for your freedom, and for you to be able to choose. My voice was muffled, but enough of the truth was set. Tully looked over to me, face pale, not believing anyone would do such a thing for him. It did not make sense that a human who barely knew him at that point wasted such an important request on a man that was only a number. He shook his head, and Hans was laughing over his reaction. I was never told, Tully said, while looking over to his parents. The terrible creature that gave him life simply raised a hand under the veil, as if it was covering its mouth. From that sheer fabric came a very small oops. Then the creature threw back its head and laughed. The veil parted enough for me to see a mouth of pointed teeth. How amusing you all are. Going on about the wish being unfulfilled, but I honored it. I may have not told you what that human asked, but I did not give you any jobs this year. I asked nothing of you, and let you choose whatever you wanted to do. And my little son, you stayed by my side as it should be. Nothing that humans can do shall change that. The pale creature sounded amused over how it thought of a simple way to trick us. If I just brought it up at any time this year, none of this would have happened. I was going to lose my friend and my son because I trusted the wrong creature. Tuli looked as if he was blaming himself just as much. He could have gone away at any point, but wasn't aware of that fact. Hans and Harvest both found our expressions so amusing, they both let out another round of laughter. I could barely stand the sound. I find it so pleasing that little Adam over there even bothered thinking of you after you betrayed his grandfather and stole that wish for yourself. This human is very forgiving. I would have assumed that his family would want revenge on you for that act, my little brother. Hans spoke down to Truly, who looked as if he lost any fight with him. I hated to see him so resigned. When his brother spoke about my grandfather, any life in his eyes completely drained away, making him appear to be a corpse. My grandfather was another topic I never brought up with Tuli. I knew it was too raw for him to speak about, and never pressed him. I felt a hot rage boil in my stomach. I didn't want to believe my friend would have stolen a wish. Oh, it appears I'm not the only one who failed to mention an important detail. Lord Harvest commented. That mouth of horrible teeth curling in a smile. Tully couldn't. Only the one who owns the land can make a wish. I was finding it a bit easier to tear through the threats, but sweat was starting to pool on my forehead. I knew I would lose all my energy before my bindings. 
I heard a horrible, cackling laugh once more, and Tuli couldn't even look in my direction. Hans was practically keeping him on his feet, as what shamed the agent the most was spoken out loud. He can use the wish in place of your grandfather if they were married. Harvest's voice felt like a sledgehammer to my chest. I knew they cared for each other, but I never would have assumed it ever got that far. Deep down, I wondered if Tuli was using me as a replacement for the man he left. We started to share the same name before my grandfather started to go by his middle one. We even looked alike when he was my age. I shook my head, trying to clear it of those doubts. Our friendship may have started because of his guilt over the past, but I knew it continued because he saw me as my own person. I was furious that my son married a human. At first it appeared he cared for the thing, but it soon became clear of how cruel he truly could be. That human was infatuated with my top agent. Instead of killing him and being done with it, he lured the human to marriage. Then he used the wish to ensure that humans would never see him again. Oh, it was wonderful. He went so far as to ask me to remove the human sense of supernatural creatures entirely. I gladly did so. The grandfather of yours lived the rest of his life unable to interact with our kind. We could no longer even touch him. 202 could be right by his side, and that human would be completely unaware. Killing him would have been kinder. That laugh that came next turned my nerves to fire. For some reason, Hans did not join in. He was still smiling, but it almost looked fake. I thought I saw a hand of his reach around to take his brothers, but from where I was suspended, I couldn't really see. Tuli had his back to me, but I knew what his expression was. Sven had once told me Tuli would always go for the kindest option, no matter how cruel it made him seem. He faked the death of his own brothers to give them a better life, and he ensured my grandfather would never be harmed by a supernatural creature again and let him start a family. I was only there because of that decision. I knew he was forgiven long ago for what he'd done, but I still shouldered the burden. The spider threads were creeping in again. I kept moving my head to snap them, but found myself tiring. I might not be able to fight for much longer. I somehow needed to convince Harvest to let me go, because Thule looked as if he had nothing left in him. Harvest found the entire scene so hilarious, the creature was laughing so hard they nearly fell off the stump. When they finally calmed down, they opened their arms expectantly. Oh, my little son. You are almost not a failure. You may not be a female as I desired, but I've done well enough to amuse me this greatly. I shall give you an embrace for your treatment of those humans. The one that interrupted our meeting is soon going to be a part of our family. Now, come over here and receive some of my love. Lord Harvest stood up, but those clawed feet hovered slightly over the ground. They were a creature that would not dirty their feet from walking like the rest of us. I felt sick again, my entire body feeling scrambled. I needed to think of a way out of this, but my brain refused to form any thoughts. Hans let go of his brother, but leaned over to speak with him. Go over to our parents. I think you can still save your human if you argue a little. Perhaps this is time to show that true face of yours. Hans sat in a low voice and pushed Tuli forward with one hand. If Harvest heard what he said, it didn't react. They only remained with arms out for their son. Tuli looked over, a horrible realization coming over his face. Those two had a plan I couldn't even begin to be aware of. That one look gave me a small sliver of hope. The threads started to overtake half my face, but I could watch what was happening. Tuli started to walk towards his parents, and each step away from me felt like a blow. I knew he wasn't going to leave me, but it didn't feel right that he was just accepting his parents' embrace after everything. I almost felt abandoned at that moment. Someone came for me, and it was not the one I ever expected. Hans glided his body over and practically slid up the tree to where I was trapped. 
those awful hands of his wrapped around me, and I started to struggle again, trying to escape him. I didn't trust him in the slightest. A pair of hands kept over my mouth, and my skin crawled. Expecting him to smother me, he did something else. Keeping one hand over the other, he tore at the threads over my mouth. I felt the other hands quickly and carefully pulling at the other threads as he stared forward, hoping no attention was on what he was doing. Hans? I asked in a small way, and he shushed me. The monster didn't look at me as he worked away, trying to free me and not making it obvious. My gaze went back over to Thule, just as he stopped in front of his parents. What happened next was finished in a blink of an eye, and my brain couldn't register the movement. Thule's back was to me, but I still could see his face changed. It was as white as harvest. I thought I saw glimmering eyes and a set of jaws far too large to fit on a human face. He snapped forward with his true face exposed, and suddenly half of his parents' face was gone. It took me a moment to realize that Truly had bitten it off. Harvest took even longer to notice they were now missing the left side of their face above their cheekbone. The veils fluttered down, giving me a first look of what their parents looked like. And I was shocked to see a beautiful and yet almost childlike face under the fabric that was drifting towards the ground. No blood came from the wound, and not even their smile faltered as the creature's body started to fall back with arms still outstretched and expecting. The body didn't even hit the ground as Hans doubled his efforts, swearing, trying to tear away the threats. I soon knew why he was so frantic. Monkey became a half-raccoon hybrid because he'd eaten a rabid raccoon. I'd seen another creature turn into something deer-like from devouring a deer, so I knew their family gained traits from what they ate. But I wasn't aware that fact applied to the human-shaped agents. Thule hunched over, handing over his now human mouth, looking as if he was going to be sick. He did just eat part of his parents, after all. The flesh on his hands started to flake away, exposing what looked to be segmented joints underneath. The black started to fade from his hair. The scars along his face start to move along the edges as if there was something under the skin trying to break free. I felt the last of the threads get torn by my body just before Hans curled himself around me. A blinding flash of white overtook my vision and I couldn't sense anything. I could only see a burning white and a slight ringing in my ears before a darkness, thankfully, overtook me. When I woke up, I was confused about what just happened. Slowly, I came out of the darkness to my entire body throbbing in pain. My feet dangled, and I was hanging by my shirts that had been caught on a branch, slowly ripping. The sound and the descent was what woke me. I was too groggy and sore to do anything but let my body drop. Hands caught me and guided me down to the ground. I couldn't even keep my eyes open until I was safely on the grass. My ribs felt as if a few were broken. Breathing was painful, but the ache in my head was clearing up. Forcing myself to sit up, I looked around to see myself in a world of overturned trees of pure white. It looked as if a bomb went over and bleached all the colors from around me, and the fading colors were slowly creeping along deeper into the forest. Hans was curled up at the foot of the tree I'd dropped from. Not only did he protect me at the cost of nearly half his arms, he used his broken and injured ones to get me safely out of the tree. I didn't understand his actions. He was the one who tricked me into nearly getting killed in the first place. When I sat, looking at his torn and injured body, it all clicked. Hans was being completely honest with me that night. He knew the risk of my life when he asked me to confront their parents. While we were in the clearing, 
He guided the conversation along so everything would be revealed without any of us being aware of it. All because he watched his younger brother suffer for so long. He couldn't stand watching Tuli be under their parents' thumb any longer and forced a confirmation. I didn't think he cared too much if I died or not, only that things finally got resolved. He opened his eyes to look over at me, but was too weak to sit up. His body was torn, and I found myself getting choked up over this monster. He could only lift one hand to place on my head in a kind gesture I didn't think this creature would ever give a human. Please, go save my brother. His hand dropped, and eyes closed. It didn't appear as if he was breathing, but I'd seen a wolf get his head cut off and still live. I needed to believe that Hans would be alright. My chest burned from standing up, and I nearly fell back over. After everything Hans sacrificed, the least I could do was walk forward. I clenched my ribs, taking it one step at a time. I needed to walk around to go slowly over fallen trees. Everything was so white, I wondered what happened. I considered the idea that Tuli's body couldn't handle the change from eating a part of his parent and did all this damage. But what did that mean for him? Was he still alive? Was he alright? Was he still the same person? I couldn't keep these thoughts and worries from my mind. Another set of worries came to me as I walked further to where I thought my friend was. The white trees grew more and more brittle. They crumbled if I brushed against them. Whatever did this was spreading. If I didn't stop at the source, I didn't know if it would. What would happen to the town nearby? The sound of fabric flapping in the wind made me know I was on the right track. I needed to take breaks because of the pain in my ribs, but I still pressed on, feeling as if tears would cease my progress at any moment. When I finally found the clearing again, I didn't recognize the flattened white ground or my friend in the middle. Lord Harvest reminds them where they fell, half their face still missing. Tully was standing with a wind swirling around him, flapping his still black suit jacket. His suit was the only dark shade in the area. Over his face were sheer layers of fabric being blown up into the sky from the never-ending wind. It clung to his face, making the curves of it be visible, but it just didn't look like him. He looked as monstrous as his parents. I stood, hand wrapped around my sore ribs, not being able to get any closer because of the wind. I didn't know what to do. I was only human, after all. Tuli had taken a part of his parents who I assumed was a monster far beyond anything I could ever understand. Something godly and I felt so far beneath them. What could I even do? If I didn't think of something in this world, we would be in danger. I thought of Casper and took a step forward into the wind that nearly forced me back. I was slammed with emotions that weren't my own, the guilt of being alive and wanting everything to end. I thought I heard Casper's voice and the sound of other names I knew. These were faint hints of Tuli's thoughts through the sound of the fabric in the wind. The power he gained pressed on him, trying to ruin the world and use his own negative emotions against him. He was fighting back, thinking about what was still good in his world. I found my voice and called out to him, one hand raised, trying to block out the wind. I thought I would need to fight on to reach him. This was almost the end of the world, after all. But somehow... His name reached his ears. The wind started to die down as he turned his fabric-covered face in my direction. Reaching up with strangely jointed hands, he grabbed the sheer shimmering fabric, pulling it away and gasping for air. As he did, it disintegrated, leaving no trace behind. His body is now void of color. Hair pure white along with his eyes. His pupils black, but even his lips looked pale white. At first, he didn't notice me. He looked at his own hands, confused over the change. When he looked up and saw me a few feet away from him, 
he forgot everything else. Running over, he slipped his jacket off and wrapped it over my shoulders the moment he stopped. His hands flew, trying to brush away any remaining threads and to check for injuries. He looked too panicked to even speak. Placing both hands on my cheeks, he lifted my head, gently moving it from side to side, seeing if I was all in one piece. I thought I killed you. I admired his voice, full of tears. When he leaned down too quickly, gave me a thankful kiss that I was still alive, neither of us even realized what he just did, because it felt like a natural reaction at the time. My face was still in his hands for a few seconds after he pulled his face away. My painful ribs were forgotten for a moment as my face flushed. Did you just... I was unable to speak. He looked confused again. When his actions finally sunk in, he dropped his hands and took a few steps back in sheer horror over what he just did. It looked as if he had just killed me instead of finally showing how he truly felt. His hands flew over his mouth, expecting me to be angry. Instead, I took a painful step towards him, tears in my eyes. After everything, I couldn't stand him being so far away, even if it was only a step away. Thankfully, he understood and wrapped his arms around me. It hurt being held so tightly, but I didn't care, because it was a comfortable pain. Tuli rested his head on top of mine, repeating how sorry he was. I wondered if those apologies were from me or from my grandfather. I was glad to inherit them, because the man was no longer around to hear his words. It stayed like that for a while, as I reflected on how dense I'd been. Somehow, even a slow wolf like Valak knew my own feelings before I was aware of them. If I just was honest with myself about how I cared about Tuli... We might not have gone through any of this. Movements made me lift my head, and Tully reluctantly followed my gaze. Harvest twitched and slowly started to sit up with jittering motions. They couldn't stand standing and kept falling back to their knees. The massive head wound slowly started to close up by the flesh squirming around the edges to reform that childish face. A smile was hovering on their lips as the creature noticed us. My little one, I never expected this. How good of you. I think I can come to love you the same way I did your sister. Now come over here. I'll even let you keep your human if you like. Any power that voice held was gone. It looked and sounded pitiful. Unable to stand, but still weakly outstretched their arms, expecting Tuli to come to them. As much as I hated that creature for what it's done, I felt myself having a wave of sympathy for it. Harvest was unable to grasp the painful idea of their child abandoning them. I don't know how I would handle it if Casper grew up and left me in the same way. I felt myself feeling sorry for the creature because their arms were empty and mine weren't. Tuli made no motion to go over to his parents, but the expression on his face was one of agony over how his parents still cared for him. After everything, they were still deeply connected, and I wasn't upset over that. I'm leaving, Julie told the creature. You cannot. You still love me, after all. So come here. Beckoning him again, Orvis' face slowly started to fall as Tuli gave him a small shake of his hat. I do. You're my parents, after all. But I'm still leaving. Those two facts did not make any sense to the creature before us. Neither could be true at the same time. Horror slowly started to creep over them as Harvest tried to stand again, only to fall. No, I don't. You cannot. I can accept my child dying, but I cannot accept being abandoned. It's not natural. Please, don't leave me. I'm not like your sister. The voice and pleadings came out hoarse. I gripped Tuli tighter, not knowing how he could deal with such a sight. He needed to look away, unable to see his parents in such a dreadful state, and knowing he was responsible. 
A thankful distraction in the form of Hans interrupted the scene. A few arms were missing, so his movements weren't as fluid as before. The injured parts of his body were flaking off, revealing a pristine, hard body underneath. The blackness reflected countless colors in the sunlight. I thought the jerk was dead, but he was just molting away the harm done. The creature gave us a short look with a real smile on his face. He continued to go over to Harvest, trying to comfort the creature, telling her that Tuli was in fact leaving, and that wasn't the end of the world. The remaining arms wrapped around the monster I'd feared before, but now looked so small. I still thought Hans was a bastard, but used that word as affectionately as possible. Tuli supported me as we started to turn away from his family. Lord Harvest let out a sob of dismay. We walked towards the cabin and in the direction of home. Those faint sobs seemed to follow behind us for a long while. As we walked, the whiteness started to fade into a scorching blackness. I looked as if a forest fire tore through the area, not leaving a tree standing. We hobbled along, looking as if we could barely stay upright. Slowly, we made our way out of the destroyed area into the normal forest. The sky is orange with the setting sun and hot wind blowing through the trees. It appeared as if it was just a summer evening. To the both of us, everything was different. We started to walk up the dirt road, leading to the cabin, still needing to hold on to each other. Monkey spotted us. He looked worried and started to circle around our feet, crying out that we were hurt. Julie helped me up the stairs and paused at the front door. I help, Monkey said in his little voice. He easily found the key I'd hidden under a fake rock. Standing on his back feet, he reached up and unlocked the front door for us. I gave his head a pet, which he looked like he enjoyed, and thanked the small creature. This time, I was the one who helped Tuli through the threshold. I nearly dragged him forwards as Monkey raced to the kitchen, knowing he now could eat anything he wanted without punishment for his good deed. Tuli set me on the couch so we could look over how hurt I'd got him. Considering how we clung to each other on the walk through the woods, him lifting my shirt to run his hand over my chest to test to see if anything was broken might have been an imminent action if we weren't so exhausted to think about it. My ribs were only bruised and not broken. It didn't make me feel better in the slightest knowing the damage wasn't as bad as it could have been. It hurt like hell, but manageable. He went into the kitchen to find an ice pack and some aspirins because it was the only thing on hand. When I was settled at an ice pack pressed on my sore chest, he finally paused to look at where he was standing. It appeared as if he was finally seeing the place for the first time after avoiding it for longer than I'd been alive. He placed a hand on a wooden side table looking at the marks on the surface. My grandfather raised a family in this cabin. My father moved to the city when he was able, but there was still such a large amount of history within those walls. So, you and my grandfather, huh? I said, finally snapping him from his trance. His pure white face flushed slightly, and he turned around. Yes, something like that, he admitted, looking embarrassed. I may tell you the entire story someday. But the short answer is, he cared for me. I did as well, but in a different way. And I humored his feelings. I did not see him in the same way I care about you. We both needed to pause and look at anything but each other. We looked like a pair of teenagers going on their first prom. Faces red, unable to make eye contact. Clearing my throat, I spoke, trying to stay on topic. I... I didn't think men could get married back then. It was not a human marriage. My parents created a binding set of vows because Hans asked. He had a bad habit of picking up humans to use. He feels as if it means a little bit more if he marries them before eating them. 
romantic in his eyes. Putting aside the horror that came with the thought of anyone agreeing to marry Hans, I desperately wanted to know what kind of vows Lord Harvest thought of. After all, they came up with some very creative names, such as Hans, because of his many hands, and 202. Seeing my expression, Tully raised an eyebrow. You want to know what marriage entails, don't you? He asked, and I nodded my head. With a sigh, he went on. It's simple. You both repeat these words, and you're married. I believe it goes. There are no favors or debts between the two of us. Until we both die, everything I am belongs to you. So, it wasn't as uncreative as I thought. An understandable set of statements from a creature that comes from a world that based their currency in favors. I still wanted to mock them, though. I... I can understand the uh, there are no doubts or favors between the two of us idea. I mean, even your names are free in your world. But don't you think the until we both die, everything I am belongs to you is too, well, thoughtful for your parents to think of? I asked, shifting the ice pack and wincing a little in pain. I think Hans made up that part. He reads a lot of trashy romance books. I held back a laugh, knowing that would just hurt more. Everything I learned about his older brother was something I never expected to hear. Suddenly, Tully came over to me. He was standing while I sat on the couch, so he held out his hand for me to take. Are you going to stay here? He asked, softly. After everything, the best idea was to move. I shook my head. Am I in danger if I stay? I wondered if his parents would take revenge for stealing away their son. No, I doubt it. When I took a part of my parents' power, I almost took something else. Every creature has a true name that is born with them. It is never spoken out loud unless to someone who they trust beyond anything else. If you know a creature's true name, you can order them to do anything. It is a binding thing. I know only a part of my parents' name, but that is enough. If Harvest does anything to you, they know I'll reveal that to their enemies. It is enough to ruin them. My parents no longer hold any power over me. I was relieved to hear that. Not only was I no longer in danger, but Tully truly was free. I gave his hand a squeeze to gather up my courage to ask him an important question. Do you want to stay here with me? I felt my face get hot, but kept going, knowing if I stopped, I wouldn't start again. I think it would be good for you. I know you still care about your brothers and want to watch over them. If you stay here, you can, and, well, you love your parents. You don't need to do what they say, but seeing them once a year wouldn't be too bad, right? I think... I think it might be too painful if you just cut your entire family out of your life. He looked ashamed over the truth. After everything his family put him through, he still would regret never seeing them again. I understood that. I still loved my father and wanted him to reconnect after he made it clear that money was more important than his son. Tully looked as if he was debating his answer when a noise at the front door made us jump. It was a loud knock, then the doorbell ringing in something that was almost a song. Oh, that's my sister with Casper. Help me up. I asked, until he needed to keep an arm around my waist so he could start walking towards the door. I warn you, she's a bit weird. He nearly rolled his eyes. My sister is human, and after everything he's dealt with on a daily basis, he didn't think a normal person would phase him in the slightest. He was proven wrong moments after we opened the door. My sister had a terrible fashion sense. Her outfits cobbled together from different eras and clashing colors. Countless bracelets on her arm clacking together when she tossed Casper's baby bag into my arms. She then handed Casper to Tuli, who would have refused if she didn't literally dump the boy into his arms. I knew she would never drop Casper if Tuli didn't take him, but he didn't know that. He held the boy 
stunned over suddenly holding a baby. Darlings, so good to see you. Casper was a perfect little munchkin. I really need to find myself one of those. Her voice was a little grating to anyone who didn't grow up with her. She picked up a mixture of accents on her day out, and I honestly gave up trying to figure out why she spoke so strangely. Uh, Angela, where's his binky? I was digging through the bag trying to find Casper's blue pacifier because I could tell from the look on his face he was a few minutes from a meltdown. It's in there. She paused to brush some of the white threads from my clothing, which I didn't have an explanation for. She didn't dwell on them or how odd we both looked. Anywho, my flight is in four hours. I got a jet. I'm going to see the meow meow riddle cat thing. Thule gave me a raised eyebrow, not understanding what she was talking about. It's called a Sphinx. Don't give it a weird name. How much junk did you buy today? It looked like she bought every tacky keyring at the gift shop. All had names, but neither of us knew anyone with them. Knowing her, she bought the keyrings because she liked the fish on them, then forgot she even got them. Again, Thule gave me a look, unable to believe my sister turned out so weird and I was relatively normal when there was only a year's age difference between us. Considering all the things she'd done in the past, calling the Sphinx a Meow Meow Riddle Cat was almost normal for her. You kids have fun. She grabbed my face to kiss my cheek. I tried to ignore it to keep looking through the back. She'd long since stopped kissing family on the mouth, but I'd forgotten that she kissed strangers without a second thought. She grabbed Tuli's face to kiss him and needed to stand on her tiptoes. To his credits, he didn't look offended, just confused. Casper got one final kiss, and my old sister was off to do whatever it was she did. In the short interaction, the agent beside me looked more flustered by a single person than my feral werewolves. We stayed in the doorway. Tully debating all the choices in his life leading up to that moment, and I was still looking through the back. Could you take him? Tully asked a few minutes after my sister left. I didn't even look up at him. I'd started to dump junk out of the bag and onto the floor. I was frustrated because I told her the blue binky always went into the front pocket because it was Casper's favorite. He used it the most, and it should never be buried under her impulse purchases. One second, I told him not aware of his strained tone at first. Please, he asked again, and this time I looked up because of how distraught he sounded. He was holding Casper awkwardly as if he didn't want the boy in his arms. He couldn't even look down at the child, wiggling around in his hands trying to grab a hold of him. By some miracle, I found the blue pacifier and gave it to Casper, but didn't take him from Thule. He's just a baby. I don't know why you're so freaked out, I told him wondering why he was having such an emotional response. I don't deserve to hold him. I didn't save his mother. He admitted, sounding bitter over how we all arrived too late to save Casper's mother. His reaction made sense to me. If he didn't agree to let me help on the Harvest Moon fever job, then he would have not asked the question that led us to become aware there was a victim in the woods. But if we didn't get there when we did, she would have died and Casper would have never been born. No, but you saved him, I corrected. He looked down at me, as if he had never considered that line of thought. Letting himself look down at Casper, he shifted the boy in his arms, so he was holding him more like a baby and not like a burden. Casper was reaching out, trying to grab something. His little hands fell on Thule's tie that somehow made it through our entire ordeal. He tugged at it, and the agent looked down at the child as if he was seeing him for the first time. I could offer to take Casper, but knew that Thule now didn't want to give him up just yet. I don't want to force you into anything if you're not ready, but you can stay here with us if you want. It's all up to you. For the first time in his life, there were choices for his future. He could finally do anything he wanted and wasn't sure how to deal with such a thing. He looked overwhelmed over the thought. I reached over to let Casper take my hand as he kept tugging at the tie with his other pudgy little fingers. Hi. Tully started, not finding any words for me. No pressure or anything, but I would prefer it if you stayed. I don't want Casper going through with his parents divorcing when he's so young. 
Thule looked over at me, choking and sputtering. His arms dipped a little in shock, but he recovered, lifting Casper back up. The boy thought it was funny and giggled through his pacifier. A divorce. His voice was barely a croak. Were it not, we discussed. Finally, he cued in. I let myself give him a mischievous smile. After spending so much time with supernatural creatures, their talent of twisting words to trick each other was rubbing off on me. In his family, marriage was only needed to repeat those vows back to each other, and I sneakily did that without him noticing. He didn't need to honor the little trick, but I still found it funny. You sneaky little... He sounded angry with his first word, but soon his voice became thick with tears. Unable to stay standing, he started to hunch over, with Casper still in his arms. I went down with them, hand on his back and supporting my child in the other. He raised a hand over his eyes, trying to hide how wet they got. When he couldn't blink them away, he started to try and rub the tears from his eyes. I can really stay here, he asked, and it sounded as if that question was for himself. A day ago, he never would have thought being able to choose his own life would ever be an option. Now he had a family of his own, ready and waiting. I stayed beside him, letting him take all the time he needed. It was such a huge change, it may take a few days for everything to fully sink in. You know, I took your advice in the end, I said, not being able to stop myself. You have never once listened to anything I've said, he argued, or with a hint of a playful tone behind his tears. You told me to go off and get married, and that's exactly what I did. If he wasn't holding Casper and in a better state, he would have kicked me. I started to laugh at the expression he shot in my direction. Casper started laughing because he heard my voice, and soon Thule couldn't help himself. Still trying to rub his eyes, all three of us sat at the front door, laughing like idiots about how things just fell into place. I didn't know if my grandfather planned for any of this when he asked me to look over the cabin for him. His only goal may have just been me befriending the odd agent in the woods. I honestly never expected that accepting the cabin would lead to getting tossed in the middle of a completely different world full of monsters and nightmares. I chose to remain in that world, and gained a family because of it. No matter what other supernatural threat, or whatever life path Thule ended up choosing, I knew we would be together to face it.